So let's start giving the welcome to our first speaker, Dr. Andrew Davis from UKEA. And uh, the talk is titled High Performance Multiphysic Driven Design for Fusion Systems. So please uh, go ahead, Dr. Andrew Davis. And I will do. On Thank my you side, much. let's go. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about. Uh, high performance multiphysics driven design for fusion systems, which we'll probably talk a little bit about fusion first and why it's so important. So, one of the things I'm here to talk to you about today is fusion. So, the reactors that we have and how important they are. But actually, we should probably take a moment to think about the only real working fusion device we have, and that's really the sun, um, which is present in our, in our daily lives. Not here, unfortunately, this morning in England, uh, where it's rather cold and frosty. Um, uh, but hopefully we'll make your friends later on. So no talk happens without collaborators and colleagues. So I'd like to thank my um, group, the people who I work with. Um, I conducted this talk largely aren't mine. Um, without their efforts, I have nothing to talk about. So my thanks to you all. Um, hopefully scrolling away you can see the list of people who have contributed away uh, into this talk in some uh, in some way I will I have limited time but I will let this play out it took me a long time to make this so you can uh, you can enjoy that so what is the challenge that we have so fusion is a is a low TRL low readiness technology in terms of where we look at from power plant so in the uk we have a program called step to try and put a spherical tokamak um, on the electricity grid by 2040 um, and where we stand today is sort of down here the st is very much lower down the technology scale than say a conventional aspect ratio tokamak so we've got this bit in the middle to climb this engineering S-curve to deliver this reactor by 2040. And the challenge we have is, you know, we have 14 years, more or less, 14, uh, 23, sorry, 17 years in total um, to design and build this reactor before 2040 when it's meant to come online. And where we sit in advanced computing is we do an awful lot of... Um, R&D and HPC and simulation and AI and numerical techniques. Um, and that will allow us to climb this S-curve. Um, but we have this bit in the middle, um, the so-called valley of death, where technologies succeed and fail, that we have to climb in order to get to the top. And recently within UK, yeah, I'm not sure for those of you, some of you who would have been to JET and, and see what goes on there. We now have a new division where we've brought together advanced computing and, and CODAS and IT into one new uh, large division called Computing Division, which covers this whole range of things. But the, the main point of today is this technology that we I'm going to talk to you about hopefully leads us into this valley of death region where we start talking about doing... Uh, design, understanding how the system works. So, realistically speaking, if we are on a time limited mission to the fusion, then um, we cannot rely upon the historical way we've done things, which is to build a tokamak and, and see what works, and then do that, and then do it again, and figure out what broke and what didn't work, and do it again, and do it again. That's done us, that's served us really, really well for the past, you know, 50 years or so, right? 70 years, in fact. Um, we've been on this really wonderful mission. Um, I mean, this dotted line here, by the way, is like new is low, but for uh, plasma confinement. Um, we see we're just getting better and better and better over time. Uh, and you can see all the shots from Jet and Eta. Here's, here's one of NIF's uh, shots, one of the earlier ones, not one of the new ones, actually. That would be better. And obviously, Eta is aiming for a Q, a Q of 10. Now, the closer we get to Q1, the more expensive the device becomes uh, and the less you can tolerate failure. Um, investors simply won't, investors, funders, um, 
can't really tolerate a device that costs billions of, of um, dollars to fail. If you look at some relative costs, I mean, eat, fusion is a bit like fission in the sense that it's very capital intensive. A fission plant is, is cheap in comparison to eat, I say. Um, and an SMR is even cheaper. Um, but a lot of the cost actually um, in, in fission is actually in the cost of insurance and concrete. Um, in, in fusion, the magnets are very expensive. They're a large capital cost item. Um, and given that the cost does scale as the square of the field and the cube of the radius, um, it becomes very, very expensive to have these large devices. And we know with fusion, uh, a lot of the time, bigger is better. And we can't really create a, a, a really good test environment. We can't really create a high temperature, high radiation, high magnetic field, uh, vacuum environment um, and test large components. Of course, we have if we've done is coming on um, shortly um, and that will be a test small coupons. But when you want to test um, the dynamic dynamic behavior of larger systems, um, that's going to have to wait until we get to a, to experimentally do it. It's going to have to wait till we turn the device on. And that makes us uh, a little bit nervous. So our challenge uh, in terms of simulation is is multi-physics, right? It's simulating everything, everything, everywhere, all at once. The, the radiation field uh, in the tokamak uh, implicitly couples all components to other components. The neutrons that are born in the plasma scatter off um, first wall material and they scatter back to the inboard and they scatter off to the diverter. And there's implicitly a, 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 a linkage between them. Similarly, electromagnetism um, being a field also um, impacts how these structures are coupled together. Of course, we have gravity, uh, the structural forces, say, from thermal expansion. We have to worry about where heat's going. Uh, in the longer term, um, chemical transport, whether that's about um, tritium diffusion, whether that's about um, the, the development of um corrosion products and crud and cooling pipes impacting heat transfer and all of that of course is a strong function of time uh, implicitly um, not only is it a function of time because of the buildup of the, the transmutation products in the reactor but the whole while um, as Sergey mentioned yesterday radiation damage is accruing in these different materials and structures and the materials very quickly don't look like what it was when they went in um, there are a whole bunch of other dynamic in, uh, effects. So, for example, tribology, like where, like, you know, two components rubbing against one another, um, frictional contact, um, fatigue. Um, historically, fatigue's been a, a major problem on um, devices like mast and jet, where devices turn on and off a lot. Um, it should be less of a problem um, for things like ITER um, and uh, a power plant, which should be on more or less continually. Um, but I guess we'll have to see how that um, pans out. So it's quite a lot of simulation challenges. And the other thing to mention is that it's actually a global problem. To get some of these fields correct, you do have to simulate the entire device. You can't just get away with symmetry. So experiments aren't going to come right in on a horse to the rescue. Um, traditionally, we've, we've taken an approach that's just too expensive and we aren't going to get enough of the right experiments. And normally, uh, a regulator, a safety regulator, likes to see safety demonstrated through margin uh, and design codes, both of which are accrued through experiment uh, or operations. And that's not going to be a, something we can rely upon for the first set of devices. So our position is that the only way to really deliver a, a tokamak that's been de-risked relative to where it is today is to basically replicate all the physics we can uh, in silico and use that um, with a set of experimental validation underneath it where, where possible, um, but use that to be our main interface with safety. So this will require a lot of efforts um, to advance state-of-the-art simulation um, to the point where we can simulate the entire device, not just the plasma. So um, many programs, like in the US, like the whole device modeling program, for example, stop at the plasma. It stops at the first wall. So this is a key note. So I've got a sprinkle of pretentious quotes throughout this. Um, so there's a nice one from Isaac Asimov, which is, I do not fear computers, I fear the lack of them. 
this is a slight interlude, um, but I hope it makes sense. So um, for those of you who are in BSc, you've obviously spent a lot of time in this wonderful um, church of computing. Um, and I think this particular system was set, was set up in about 2015. This is where it sits now relative to its uh, relative to the, uh, the LIMPAC scores. And obviously the big thing that's happened recently is um, the US DOE exascale objective in terms of um, Frontier being there and Aurora kind of making a, an attempt um this is the machine i'm talking to you from now this is my home desktop and it's just to give you a sense of where we are today in terms of how, how many flops um we we as computer scientists and, and engineers and computing practitioners i have access to so on a regular basis people in the uk for example can get access to archer 2 uh, and get a significant chunk of that so you know, in terms of limpack scores, it wouldn't be unreasonable to, for people to maybe get, you know, ten to the fifteen flops. Um, that would be, you know, it would be a fairly large run, but it would be, you know, not unreasonable. And if we look at this kind of software that engineers are using to design things today, it sits kind of down here. I mean, those tools are not rapidly accelerated; they're not high performance. Um, they just need to. Um, up, up there again, we'd be able to deliver more capacity, more performance to do things. Uh, however, I think actually there are two exascales. So the first is the exascale that Frontier achieved, um, getting um, just over one point, well, nearly one point two exaflops at a possible R peak of one point six nine, one point six seven nine, um, which is you know, well, well done, Oak Ridge, very good. Um, this is great for non-memory bound problems. So that'll do things well for Monte Carlo, you know, large language models and AIs can have a great time on there. The second one, and the one that um I worry about a lot more, is the HPCG result, is the, the, the conjugate gradient version of Limpac. And that result was only 0.014 exaflops. Uh, and for that system on Frontier, that means that one not a link pack, one Limpac flop is less than one HPCG flop. So in terms of solving like a, a large scale uh, engineering problem, um, which is memory bound, um, this would indicate that, you know, we're not going to get, we're not going to be able to use as much of the machine as you would think um, to solve that problem. And this is a, a thing that I think, you know, we need to start getting to grips with is actually HPCG is a better reflection for us um, in solving engineering problems, science problems. Um, that this is how our problems really behave. And current trends seem to suggest about one HPCG GPU flop is about three, um, is equivalent to three HPCG CPU flops. So that same machine is a CPU machine, you get three times as many um, CPU flops over for HBM2 memory. HBM3 is going to change that. Um, we might get closer to six and possibly even eight. Um, and what does that mean for us? Um, you know, in, in a in a GPU dominated world, things things um, these CPU codes just scale better on CPU. One of the things I have anxiety around. So I went to SC twenty three uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, and I've got a little bit of anxiety around the AI trend. I know, you know, I'm not worried that I'm going to lose my job. Uh, I'm not worried that I'm not particularly conservative. You know, I do, I, I embrace change. Uh, I'm not a Luddite, I don't think. Um, but some of the noises I was hearing at SC uh, made, me, made me worry because one of the reasons that GPUs kept a prominence in HPC wasn't actually because of HPC. It was the end use in the home gaming market, graphics cards for computers. And then somebody managed to write CUDA uh, and that allowed those to be used. So that was the, the basis of where the modern HPC GPU came from you can trace its lineage back to the home gaming market. And I'm a little bit worried that we, that we might have the same thing if vendors, through, for cost reasons, end up tailoring cards for AI. And it's those cards that get inserted into large HPC machines. We're going to end up with less than 32-bit precision numbers. We're going to end up with 16 and 8-bit um pipelines for some of the AI work. 
uh, and that makes me a little bit nervous. We're not being able to use those GPUs for doing any real, you know, any straightforward science. And if that happens, then where do we where do we run codes? Um, I get a little bit worried about that. Instead, I asked um, Microsoft's um, link to Dali three to uh, produce a picture of somebody who was worried about AI, and this is what it uh, this is what it came up with. So as a brief diversion, if we actually um, sort the top 500 by the top 500 HPCG, then actually Fugaku uh, rises right back to the top again. So it was number two before the more recent changes, but now it's in HPCG terms, it's number one. Um, Frontier uh, and um, Frontier swaps. Lumi uh, becomes number three. And then, you know, Aurora and Eagle, uh, they fall right off the off the list. Which got me thinking about actually the most efficient systems, most efficient cards. So if we look at the ratio of HPCG and Limpack, um, then this would tell us which machines are using the the as much of their R max, their peak um, delivered Limpack performance in terms of HPCG. And what was really interesting, or at least this is for me, you can tell me it's interesting later, is actually they weren't the things I expected. So the top five positions in this, in what I'll call the most efficient compute systems for engineering problems, um, are these, these NEC vector engines, NEC vector engine type 30 year 16 core, uh, which nearly uses 10% of the machine, uh, which compared to 1% for the GPU machines is incredible. Um, I had never heard of the NEC vector engine. I'm not sure about you, but I had never heard of it. In the middle, we have this one random NVIDIA Tesla V100, admittedly with a special um, HPM2 memory. Um, it comes in at, at you know, uh, virtually 4%. And then the next, um, I think the next six or seven positions are all AMD ARM64 um, FX chips, as in Fugaku. Um, getting around about f between virtually four percent and, and three percent. Um, so just you know, let us sink in for a minute that you know we talk about building these huge HPC machines, but most people, if they were to run an exascale size problem, it would really only be using one percent of the machine, which is criminal, really. Um. I was surprised to see no A100s or no H100s on this list. I really was, given that they have HBM3, some of them. Um, I just thought this was an interesting interlude. Um, it's not particularly important to the talk. It was just, as it happened, I thought I'd uh, I'd report this. And now being said um, that the NEC vector engine is the top of this efficiency list, um, I then found an article suggesting that NEC aren't going to make them anymore. Um, then there were some worries about maybe, well, you know, is this the name of the coffin? The MI, the AMD MI three three hundred would have already buried them because of the the high memory bandwidth. Incidentally, those NEC vector engines have about three terabytes a second of memory bandwidth. The MI three three hundred would, would possibly would have buried them, but we've not seen any of those numbers yet, nor have we seen numbers yet from H one hundred with Grace. So that'll be interesting when they come out. However, NEC apparently are still making them. So. If you really want to buy a really efficient card um, that you can't program on, then maybe you should uh, talk to NEC. So after that brief interlude, uh, we'll talk about something completely different. Back to the main topic of the talk, which is how we're going to use these large systems to solve um, tokamak modeling problems to pick up speed. Um, so we have a map of a tokamak. We know those in fusion, we have a bridge of coils. They get hot, we're going to cool them down. Neutrons are born in the plasma, they come out, they deposit heat, they cause damage. All that thermal all that heat causes thermal expansion if it's not managed well. Um, and we worry about what those uh, mechanical stresses are. Traditionally, an engineer, when modeling these things, um, rely upon a lot of sub-modeling and, and, and approximation. Uh, and often it involves making these, these assumptions about symmetry, which sometimes aren't true. Um, it means a lot of manual, tedious work. As an example, if someone was going to model that one coil, this is the model they may have produced um, using, you know, some, I don't know, 16th or 30 second symmetry um, to make things simple. Um, 
it often uses commercial tools which don't really scale well. They're difficult to deploy in HPC systems, and in reality, a lot of engineers are their thinking is constrained to the desktop. Whereas in reality, I mean, the Sergey didn't talk about this, but I don't want to to prime him too much. But these are the kind of calculations we think about now. Actually, we can produce models which represent the whole system. We can solve these engineering scale problems on the whole system. I hope Sergey will talk about this uh, next year. So if we do want to simulate the whole reactor, the whole complete fusion system, then there's a lot of physics we've got to cover. We've got to cover solid mechanics and computational chemistry. Uh, we've got to cover electromagnetics, fluids, radiation transport, heat transfer, potentially microstructure, um, tritium diffusion. Um, because of the size of the problem we're looking at, it's got to be targeted to at least running on hundreds of thousands of CPUs. And we should have a pathway to think about how it's going to gaze at the exascale. And that that exascale may look different than other people's exascale, for example. It may be the case that, that this particular cause exascale might be doing a thousand runs for UQ or something. So in terms of how we do that, we necessarily take, because we're interested in all of the physics, all at once, all at the same time, we take a more holistic view of how we stick things together. So, for example, um, if you looked, if you had two different codes, say a CFD code and a neutron transport code, um, those two partitionings to get maximum performance from either one um, look different. So there's a lot more overhead in terms of communication and um, data transfer than if you accept a performance penalty on the runtime and have a much simpler data transfer. Um, it may well be the case that you take the best and fastest physics package and stick them together. It doesn't lead to the most scalable solution. Uh, and for massively decomposed problems, we we'll have to think about having that because we need to have these problems potentially running on tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of cores. So we've based a lot of our work on a package called Moose. Um, it's got a set of built-in physics, uh, which we can assemble uh, into a variety of problems. And that leads to what we call NQA1, uh, Nuclear Quality Assurance Level 1, validate applications for use. That's important. Here's a list of some of the codes we've developed. Um, Aurora um, for uh, neutronics, uh, Atlas for tritium transport, Proteus for uh, fluid flow, Apollo for electromagnetism, Hephaestus links to Apollo, uh, and a, a working code we have called Hippo, which couples in open form. Um, and the reason is the if we assemble these codes together, we'll get a um, uh, uh, an interoperable uh, multi-physics suite of tools. Um, but why do we choose Moose? Um, you can always talk to Alex afterwards. He did a, a big study. Um, Alex Dubas. But basically, uh, it's open, it's scalable, it's extensible, there's a large community of users. Uh, it's, you can be quite productive in it. It's got a lot of plug and play physics. For example, here, there's a, an example I generated last night of topology optimization on something like a diverter, um, where it's trying to remove material um, to keep weight down, but also make sure the heat's transported. Um, it's very capable, it's very scalable. Um, community twice apparently so important uh, and uh, quality assurance um there's a whole bunch of reasons why i can't go into, into into more of them but basically it's uh it's open it's available and you can use it in fact you can use it today why is being open so important so any of you who have had the joy of being involved with uh, export control codes will know that makes your life very complicated so um many nuclear codes are subject at least produced in the US, are subject to export control, ITAR, or other kind of export control limitations. It often means software needs background checks and has single site, single user licenses. For example, any of you with uh, MCMP licenses out there, no more corny for you. You know, you need to have a license for you to run that code off site. Uh, and often those HPC systems don't want to have to maintain a bunch of MCMP licenses that they don't need. It costs money. Um, open means easy collaboration. It means we all work on pro projects together without complex legal agreements. Um, that means everyone gets the benefit of software with no barriers. That means often means a high quality of code. It sometimes doesn't. Um, it means more users for the code. If there's no barriers to use, people will just use it. Um, for publicly funded works, it's the right thing to do. Uh, you can deploy it anywhere. Um, we can take advantage of compute anywhere without any limitations. Um, public development also means few repetitions. I mean, there are now, I think, at the last count, 39 openly available 
finite element packages with largely overlapping capabilities. Um, why? We don't really need 39, do we? Uh, and also, you can share development costs very easily. And what are we going to do with it? Well, there are a range of problems, right? So if we look at this, um, let's call it MPI axis, the high-performance computing axis, and the high-throughput axis, then if I was going to deploy um, 100,000 CPUs or 10,000 CPUs on one large job, that's kind of a hero run, right? That's just like a big... I'm going to do a big chunk of calculation on a big thing. Um, I may choose to do optimization, uh, which is I may be looking at optimizing components. Uh, it could be one small component. It could be large components. But that'll probably involve multiple HPC runs, probably not at the scale of a hero run, but still relatively large, potentially, for fusion components. And then there's UQ. So I want to really understand my model, and I really want to get there and, and understand um, the range of applicability to my results. Um, to do that, I need to have UQ, which means deploying you know, that same calculation, probably stochastically driven through some Bayesian process uh, on thousands of, uh, thousands of instances of that calculation to sample, depending upon how complicated the problem is. And some of these problems would be large, right? You know, hundreds of millions of elements, you know, wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a surprise um, at all. So where we're moving towards is this, this idea of a, a whole plant digital twin um, where we can couple in uh, the multi-scale effects uh, as necessary, um, like Sergey was talking about yesterday. Um, we'll talk about how we do about the, how we do with the plasma. And necessarily we have plasma and materials joined together, we get this plasma wall interaction. So how do we deal with the plasma wall simulator? Um, we necessarily want to have a bunch of AI and, and Gaussian processes in the part to build Jarkinetic emulators because Jarkinex is slow. Um, we want to be able to have our engineering plant side of things. So an example here is Chimera, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, how we couple in neutronics to um, CPFE, for example, and, and different scales to build in this plant lifetime aspect, how we estimate um, how materials degrade. And also how we build this multi-physics platform for doing um, engineering stuff. So based on Moose and MFEM, which I talked a little bit earlier on. And kind of the intersection of all those things together give us our whole plant digital twin, our whole plant digital replica. I'm going to talk to you briefly about Chimera. Um, Chimera is a facility at UK year, um, which tries to replicate some fusion relevant load cases. Um, but it's based on this, or the name comes from this uh, Greek myth. So Chimera sits in the middle between our component and small scale facilities. So I'm not sure if those of you have come across Hive, but these are kind of our subsystem proxies where it allows us to build up complexity before solving the, the entire integrated plant design. And I'm going to talk to you about Chimera more now. Um, so Chimera is a facility, it's based in the, the north of England, um, it's a blanket-sized system uh, with a large, um, up to five hundred meg, uh, sorry, up to a gigawatt um, heat load on the front surface. There are two permanent four Tesla magnets, and there are two superconducting pulsed magnets um, which sit either side of it, um, and that and those magnets ramp up and ramp down to drive um, cyclic loading. There are also a, cool, a set of standardized entries for cooling channels. So the idea is a cool in, a cool out, and users can come along and test their blanket under these um, under these conditions. I'm going to talk to you about the Chimera thermal problem, the thermal example. Um, in this case, we combine a whole bunch of loads into one. So this is a, a, di a directly coupled thermal mechanical simulation. So we have. Uh, fixed displacement on these um, circular points indicate um, that the, 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 the rest of the domain can't move. Uh, we have 500 kilowatts uh, impinging on the front surface. We have gravity pulling down. We also have these line heaters, these two kilowatt heaters, um, is to, to drive a, a te stronger temperature gradient. And in terms of the fluid problem, we have um, 420 Kelvin water coming in. Five megapascals flowing at thirty-three point five meters a second. Um, this simulation runs. Um, we take five-second um, time steps until the simulation is done. 
this problem only needs about 2,240 uh, 2, cores to run on. Um, it's strongly memory bound, so in fact, you don't really use all those all those cores. Um, but what we've done over the years, we, we have a machines based at the um, Cambridge Centre for Computational Science, CSD3, um, and with the installation of new machines, we've recently got delivery of some Intel Sapphire Rapids nodes. Um, that combined with some optimizations to the code have given us uh, a factor of six improvement of throughput. So the previous simulations of this system, which are identical to the ones I'm showing you here, used to take us 12 hours to do um, five minutes of operations. It now only takes um, uh, 1.8 hours. Sorry, not. Not five minutes of operations, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it takes 12 hours to do the whole simulation and now it gets it down to less than two hours. And that brings us to a factor of four real time. So it takes us one second of real time, takes four seconds to simulate. Um, so we're approaching uh, a real time barrier um, where maybe if we switch out the solve to a GPU, maybe if we have enough GPUs to fit the, to, to fit the problem on, um, we might get a further two times speed up. We might get, you know, within two seconds of real time, which is compelling, you know, for have for have a finite element calculation of this scale to be almost as fast as real real time. That's um, that'd be interesting. Um, and similarly, we, we we need to do more, right? So this system um is an approximation, just a kind of demonstration of capability. In reality, it sits in a large cryostat. There'll be thermal radiation exchange between these surfaces and the cryostat um, and the magnets. Um, there's a complex interplay in here of how the thermal radiation will be um, emitted and transferred inside of here. We haven't yet really worried too much about the fluids. So here's an example of a thermal hydraulic calculation done by um, STFC uh, in the UK. Um, we need to do more here to couple in uh the the temperature of the fluid to the temperature of the solid i mean right now it's it's a it's a heat transfer coefficient and really what we want to do is as we move this this dotted line essentially we want to drag that dotted line further and further away from the system so you get more and more fidelity um more physical detail but also fewer fewer assumptions and approximations ideally we'd like to have as few boundary conditions as possible uh, and let the the emergent behavior of the system arise through entirely through physics. We want to see what happens when you let all of the physics drive the system. Does it give, will it give equivalent results to reality when Chimera turns on sometime um, next next year? When Chimera... oh, sorry, Andrew, you have five minutes. No problem, thank you. Thank you. Um, Chimera serves as a useful surrogate you know, it, it, it kind of looks and smells like a blanket. Um, they aren't exactly equivalent conditions to um, a fusion reactor, but, you know, it, it's it's the component complexity gets close. There's common physics between them. Um, there's no radiation. There's no ionizing radiation, so we're not going to see that same level of thermal gradient as you would in a real system. Um, ultimately, we'll be able to test MHD on Chimera, um, but it's a useful test. The same quote again. <laughs> I do not fear computers. I, like the, I, I fear the lack of them. Um, I'm actually quite confident that we can solve a whole bunch of problems um, through brute force parallelization and adaptive mesh refinement. So here's an example of a mesh of um, the whole ETA diverter. Um, this uh, we produced on a, a tool called with a tool called SimLab, Altair SimLab, uh, and it, it was able to produce this this mesh very very effectively. It's a large mesh, but that's not a problem. We can we can scale. The real problem is is the time this takes. So as the geometry complexity grows, um, something like n squared maybe, and um, the pre the pre processing time grows. So we need more and more automation. The problem with automation is the CAD is error prone uh, and is often inconsistent with reality. Uh, it's often inconsistent with physics, you know, with components clashing. Um, how we automate that process, I, I, I don't know. Um, and of course, you can't just say, well, just get rid of all the gaps because those gaps are sometimes needed for mechanical contact. So how we deal with 
some gaps and not others, you know, that difficult problem. There are a whole bunch of options for just fire and forget meshing, things like boxer mesh and P sculpt. These meshes, whilst often can automatically produce a mesh, um, they're often non conformal and have a whole bunch of um directional gradients in them which aren't great. So I'd like to, you know, I, I'm I'm hoping we could we can just internationally get together and put some resources into um HPC relevant CAE stuff, some new meshes maybe um to solve some of these problems because you know the, the simulation is one thing but actually you know it takes much longer to produce these geometries to do stuff with than it does to run the simulations um one of the things you have to do is drive change um and socrates wonderfully said the secret of change is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the old but on building upon the new so how can we get engineers using hpc if we want to really deliver this step program by 2040, we're going to have to literally deploy tens of thousands of engineers doing simulations. Um, wonderfully, I found this cartoon and added my own. Uh, for Christmas, I want a dragon. Be realistic. Well, I want a highly scalable, open source, multi physics driven framework. Well, what color dragon do you want? Um, oh, sorry, I should say that engineers use. Um, the problem is, is that. Um, one, uh, the, the fusion engineering calculations are strongly coupled multi-scale, multi-physics problems. Commercial software doesn't deliver all of the problem, all of the physics needed to simulate it. Um, it's some, not all. Um, commercial software model, cost model doesn't scale. So if I want to take a problem that runs on 32 cores and take that to tens of thousands of cores, I have to buy you know lots and lots of licenses, millions of pounds worth of licenses in some cases. Um, the software is a black box. In some cases, we literally have no idea how some of the solvers work. Uh, and much of the commercial software doesn't scale. But if we want to change how the engineers do things, we need to have them scaling off, off desktops and, and using scalable software. Um, some of the issues we can solve, right? Multiphysics, we, we can do that, tick. Use a software and couple an average PDEs, tick. Free open, tick. Open source, tick. Use software that can scale, tick. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of other problems, right? Is it validated? Does it have a GUI? Because engineers love a GUI. Um, UQ is often met with blank stares. Um, UQ is massively important. Um, how do we train people on these tools? Um, there's a whole bunch of, of upskilling for people who've not used terminals and Linux before. I also asked um, Dali3 to generate me an image of a, an engineer running away from uh, an HPC system. Uh, and that's what it produced, which is wonderful. All right, in conclusion, uh, then I'll wrap up there. Um, with insufficient timelines to rely upon an experimentally driven approach to solve fusion, we're going to have to use simulation as the third mode of discovery. We can only do that if we can solve problems in an actual way, i.e. they actually replicate real life, um, and that requires validation, uh, verification, and certain quantification. Um, the simulation tools that we use, I believe, must be open. Anyone who's suffered export control I will understand that pain. And we've got to deploy that software to tens of thousands of engineers, potentially. So it needs to be usable, freely available, and it has to be validated. Um, if we can get industry using these scalable tools, I think actually that will pay dividends in itself um, as they will use it to solve their own problems, which will drive innovation and solve other societal problems, you know, building better bridges and so on. Uh, and thus far, we've run, we've demonstrated real complicated problems running on relatively small amounts of hardware, but never challenge to scale it up to hundreds of thousands of cores, hopefully with a vision to running whole simulations of whole reactor simulations. And I will stop there for questions, if that's okay. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Davis. Very, very interesting talk. So now is a question for, now time for question. I can, I would like to start and then open the question for the chat and for raising hand. Uh, I would like to know your opinion um, in how to deal with the intrinsic uh, uh, uncertainties that uh, we have in simulation, for example, due to material uncertainties or cross-section, how it will be propagated uh, when we use uh, a multi-physics approach. And so as an expert in simulation, how much we can rely in uh, simulation and how much we can rely in experiments 
because they also have an, an intrinsic uncertainties and um, how much the simulation are influenced by the parameter that we introduce as initial condition. So if you, if I can. Uh, uh, sure, um, that was that was three yeah. questions. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, okay, I'll go through them in a fairly random order as I remember them. So um, in terms of the neutronics uncertainty, so, so there's two uncertainties that we worry about. One of those will be the... Um, the underlying nuclear data uncertainty. Um, so there's a whole bunch of issues there with the nuclear data and that some of the nuclear data hasn't got covariance data. So we can't really sample from that in a stochastic way. Um, right now, um, the most success we've had in deploying this is on is stochastically. It's basically we generate uh, cross-section sets, essentially using the same mechanism as total MC, um, but on real models. So we basically say we'll generate I don't know, six, 600 or 700 samples of each nucleide. Um, we will build those together into sets of cross-section data and just run calculations with them. And that will give you the bounds, um, the, 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 the bounds in terms of the nuclear data uncertainty. There's a second one to think about, which is um, as, we operate, as we think about large power plants, maybe second generation fusion reactors running at thousands of degrees, we really have to worry more about the thermal correction too. So historically in fusion, we've not worried too much about temperature, um, but that the temperature has two impacts, right? One of them is um, if you model the system as you receive it from your CAD person, for example, then your model is implicitly wrong because that's the room temperature model. That's not the operating temperature model. In reality, what you should be doing is thermally expanding that geometry, that model, to the operational temperature, let's say 600 Kelvin, and also then using the appropriate temperature cross-sections um, because as we go higher and higher in temperature, that, that matters more and more and more. Um, but the big one probably is the geometric one in the sense that um, implicitly we do these models of, of room temperature systems, but actually the system isn't at room temperature. It's at you know 600 Kelvin or whatever. So, that, so that's one of them. Uh, and the cross-section one, yeah, solvable with um, stochastic methods. Um, I think the first question that I think was to do with the with um, uncertainties and experiments um, for for the multi physics case, it's tricky. We have sets different sets of experiments we can rely upon from history. So, luckily, there's a lot of there are there were thousands of fission experiments done, so we can rely upon some of those. And the validation case or the experimental validation case we have is across multiple slices through those data, right? So for example, um, we may have a validation case for uh, mechanical stress and temperature, for example, that you want to replicate. Orthogonal to that, you might have a one which is temperature and radiation. And orthogonal again, you might have one which is radiation and um, uh, radiation and uh, electromagnetic, right? So you have these kind of planar slices through some really complex n-dimensional manifold and i've yet to convince myself how we actually deal with all that variation um the way that we are trying to do it uh is is, is bayesian is statistically is by sampling enough from the distributions that we know to be variable um to see how it changes the tricky bit is when we get to um no experimental validation is when you get to the point where I have this theory and it's all we can rely upon. Um, well, then we have to be clever. Um, you know, for example, we can we can always bound reality by the known laws of physics. So maybe it'll be enough to say, you know, we know the answer can be as high as, you know, C squared and as low as C, and that's kind of uncertainty. It's just a linear distribution in, in that, for example. Does that help? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so there we have some questions for from the chat. Uh, one is from from Alexander Dubas. Uh, thank you for the talk. You raised some interesting point regarding performance of engineering applications on current ar architectures. Do you think the answer is to get more appropriate hardware for the problems we are solving? Should we be trying to make our problems look more like Limpack, or is there another solution? 
That's a good question. Um, I tend to think we should make the machines more like the problems that we're trying to solve. Um, I tend to think that um, certainly as the UK looks at this exascale roadmap, I think we already know different problems run well on different systems. So I kind of think maybe we need multiple different systems. One for one, which is really good at say, I don't know, Monte Carlo, um, a GPU based system, for example, one, which is really good for, um, conjugate rating problems. I don't know, maybe grace, grace or something. Um, and I think that would probably be easier than trying to make all the problems look alike personally. Okay, then another question by Fernando Rocorgori. Thank you for the interesting talk. When you say that Chimera is blanket sites, I imagine that you are considering a modular blanket design. Can you specify further the sites of the facility? Does your magnetic field cover the complete blanket module? Uh, yes, it does. Um, this is going beyond my wheelhouse, I'm afraid. Um, but I'll quickly go back to those slides. Um, it is literally about the same size as a as, as a as a demo blanket module. Um, that's sort of the size we see in this video here. Um, the 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 magnetic field, as you can see, yes, does cover the whole um, blanket module. And there are obviously peaks to it, and um, there's variation to it. But yeah, it covers the whole thing. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yes. So if the magnetic field covered the complete module, so yes, no. And I also uh, I would like to know, it is coupled with the lead lithium uh, loop or water loop or mm -hmm. loop, do you know? Currently it's, it's water. water. Currently it's water, mm -hmm. um, but there are plans for an extension uh, eventually to include a liquid metal loop. Okay. <laughs> and another a question, excellent talk by Roberto Iglesias. How do you envision how to train next generation engineers and scientists to become proficient in using these HPC tools? Regular degree and master program is at university, micro credentials, lifelong learning, probably a mixture, right? Thanks. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, that, that, that keeps me up at night, uh, that question. Um, so I think, um, Probably we have to meet somewhere in the middle, right? If we try and drive HPC to the level of, um, I mean, it'd be great if we could take HPC tools and HPC systems to the level of usability of the commercial tools, that would be fantastic because that'll make everyone's life easier. Um, however, I, th I think probably um, some meeting somewhere in the middle is probably better. Um, making... Um, training engineers to think more like software engineers and tackling problems, I think will make their, make them more effective, you know, thinking about how I can script a problem and how I can deploy that on thousands of processes will, you know, be beneficial to them. I think that's got to come probably from the universities. And that's tricky because the universities um, like, the commercial tools because it makes it easy to teach that means you can work on actually solving the engineering rather than worrying about python and versions and gcc compilers and all the rest of it so yeah i think there'll be sets of training hopefully given internationally uh, which will start by taking those people who are ready for change and i hope that kind of those people who are ready for change go back to their home organizations and kind of spread the message and that snowballs to a to a place where we can yeah deliver a lot of training to a lot of people who can solve these kind of problems in a different way. I mean, we aren't the only ones, for example, right? In the UK, there's a similar project called Asimov, which is working to digitally twin um, a jet turbine, um, a Rolls-Royce Trent something engine. Um, and they've got similar problems. They're trying to change the way that they do their engineering internally to to um, more scalable, um, in their case, in-house tools um, and drive away their engineers away from using the commercial tools. But it's difficult. Yeah, it's an uphill battle. 
Thank you very much. And a last uh, small question, uh, if you can go faster, uh, by uh, Vijay Singh. Uh, congrats and thank you for the nice talk. I'm working in Tanzanian University. Is it possible to collaborate, motivate and train the students in Africa? Are there some specific projects for Africa in this field? Specific projects for Africa? Um, yeah. I don't see why not. I mean, the tools that we... that that. So the tool itself, Moose, is developed by Idaho National Lab. We uh, we 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 collaborate with them and we make improvements and, and and contribute back. But the tool itself is a general tool. You can use it to solve a whole range of problems. So there's no reason why you couldn't use it to design, I don't know, solar projects. You can couple the thermal hydraulics module to model the flow of molten salt in a solar panel you know there's a whole range of projects that you could apply these tools to absolutely okay thank you very much so let's thank again professor davis for a very interesting talk and we can switch to the second speaker so hello can you hear hello. me good morning yes good morning well. if you can put yeah. your slides so we can hello. check that is that it works and view in presentation mode. Okay, uh, fine. There we go. Does it look okay? Yes, that's okay. So thank you very much. And let's welcome to Helen Brooks by UKEA. And the talk is named uh, GPU Acceleration of Open MC Neutronics for Fusion Application. So go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so firstly, thank you to the organizers for a very nice workshop so far. Um, and before I dive in, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators. So John Tram and Paul Romano from Argonne National Laboratory. Um, John, well, Paul Romano is the principal investigator for OpenMC. Uh, John Tram and his team have been spending the last seven years or so as part of the Exascale computing project uh, funded by the Department of Energy in the USA to do this uh, GPU porting of OpenMC. Um, and so they are the developers uh, and their collaborators are the developers on this. In terms of this story, I'm very much coming in as a user. Um, and uh, so I really can't take credit for any of the development work. So later on, when I present to you some of the uh, algorithmic details, if you have further questions, I might end up directing you to them. Um, and then last but not least, Alex Valentine, he's a, a radiation analyst at UKAEA who was able to give us a sort of meaningful model to start with. So without further ado, here is a, an overview for the talk. So I will start by motivating why GPU acceleration of neutronics is a good spend of time, given that you just heard from my colleague that we really have quite a lot of work to be getting on with. Um, and so while it sounds nice and shiny, is this actually what we want to be doing? Then with the introduction out of the way, I'll move into the algorithmic details of what, uh, what was needed to accelerate it for fusion applications specifically, because the work previously done by John Tram et al was targeted at fission applications. So there were some additional changes that were necessary. Then I'll move on to the results, which is probably the bit that you'll be interest most interested in and then conclude. So, I don't really need to tell this audience that in the next two decades, it's been projected that we'll be seeing the emergence of first of a kind fusion power plants. Uh, for the UKAA, our flagship project is the STEP program, which is aiming to deliver a prototype spherical tokamak by 2040. But if you listen to the previous talk, then you'll know that that is an incredibly ambitious thing to try and do. In terms of designing it, uh, we, simulation plays an important role because we are going outside of the data that we have. And so multi-physics simulation plays an important role in bridging the gap and allowing us to uh, design in silico. Of course, if we're going to leverage multi-physics simulation, we also need it to be trustworthy. And so there is an important role for uh, verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification to allow us to make the most of the data that we do have. Of course, multi-physics simulation requires a huge amount of computational resource. 
doing lots of uncertainty quantification requires doing lots of runs of multi-physics models. So it should be quite apparent that you need high performance computing in order to actually make that viable. And even then, uh, it may be the case that you're doing multi-scale modeling and you it's not even feasible to do a single run of your multi-physics software. And therefore you need to, uh, with a sort of single, uh, in a single uh, coupled way, hence there's the role for surrogate modeling. And so with all of those pieces together, you can endeavor to have fast actionable emulation. And the word actionable, meaning that you can act on it i.e. it's trustworthy, but also that you can run it in a viable amount of time. So only with all of those components in place can you aspire to be doing things like automation, intelligent design and optimization, and hence accelerating the delivery of fusion power plants. So with that program of work, why would you focus on Neutronics in particular, if you are limited in terms of human resource? Neutronics very much sits at the heart of the picture. So in this very diverse coupled multi-physics picture, the Neutronics is providing a heat source for thermodynamics. It's causing damage in materials. So you can imagine that your cause, if you listen to Sergei's talk, you'll know that uh, the neutrons are displacing atoms from their lattices and causing uh, dislocations. Those dislocations can move around, they can coalesce, they can form dislocation lines, and this uh, yields some really extraordinary phenomena. Um, and those dislocations can cause changes at the macroscopic level in terms of the mechanical properties of your structures. Um, and that, in turn, can lead to deformations. In addition, assuming that you've got this heat source as well, you may be getting thermal expansion. So you've got multiple effects at play, even just with these first three. And so uh, with the deformations, the actual geometry upon which the neutrons are interacting, that may be changing. Um, in terms of the uh, how much heat is actually being deposited, that is going to be coupled to how much heat is being taken away, so fluids but the fluids themselves may be becoming activated and that may change their properties. We are also very much interested in producing tritium um, and understanding where does the tritium go. Uh, the levels of tritium is going to be, uh, and the, the way in which it's diffusing through the materials is also going to be dependent on the temperature and the fluids that are advecting it away. And so you can see, and I probably haven't covered all of the uh, connections, the connectivity in, in this graph, or this is probably not a comprehensive picture, but it just goes to show that all of these effects are happening all at once. And so with Neutronics at the heart, it's a good place to start. Um, so ideally, you would not want your Neutronics to be a bottleneck. However, anybody who's done uh, a Monte Carlo calculation for neutronics on a realistic tokamak type geometry will know that it, it, it requires considerable computational resource. There are multiple methodologies for using, for, for computing uh, neutron transport. Uh, deterministic codes are ten, uh, tend to be considered as faster. However, in terms of getting a good description on complex geometries, It's it tends to be uh, considered that Monte Carlo is the gold standard. But converging your quantities of interest, your scores in HUD to reach regions, this can be very computationally challenging. And it can indeed be a bottleneck, particularly if you are intending to use it in the context, context of this picture where you're coupling it to many other different domains. So we need to remove that bottleneck. So hopefully I've at this point motivated that we want it to be as fast as humanly possible, but I have not yet motivated why we should be wanting to accelerate it on GPU in particular. So in many of the keynote talks already, you've heard this statement, but I think it's important. So I won't, I don't mind repeating it, which is that at the current point in time, GPU accelerated supercomputers are dominating the global performance share. 
So you can go, you can make this graph yourself. You can go onto the top 500 and they have this nice statistics page uh, and you can download these pie charts. Um, and the um, legend of this pie chart is not so important other than the fact that if you read it, it says NVIDIA, 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 AMD, and these are all accelerators. Um, and others is just this tiny slice. So obviously this is, using the assumption of, I think, probably the uh, LIMPAC definition of performance. But nevertheless, the point is that the act whatever your philosophy on what is the desired hardware to run your problem on, GPU uh, accelerated supercomputers are what are currently available at the top end. Therefore, if you have a way to leverage them, then you probably should. And Monte Carlo Neutronics is a good case for accelerating because it should be embarrassingly parallel over particle histories because each particle is independent of all of the others. So naively, one should go into this thinking that this is a good candidate. So uh, I'll do a mini review now. So the code that we are talking about in this talk is OpenMC. So this is uh, the code of choice for myself and my group uh, for numerous reasons. It's open source. Uh, Andy already told you that we really care about open source, but I'm going to tell you again, because again, it's a really important point. This project probably would not have happened if OpenMC had not been open source. And I will explain why. About a year ago, uh, no, a bit over a year ago, I heard a talk at a conference about how OpenMC had been accelerated on GPU, wanted to get my hands on the code. And a few months later, they open sourced it. I was able to get really like early access as a sort of uh, early adopter of this new GPU accelerated version of their code. And I was able to give it a go, try it out, learn how to use it because I hadn't actually used GPU codes before. And then once I felt confident using it, we came up with a model that we thought was suitable, but the uh, what they already had was not suitable for running a fusion application. And so they were, we were able to share our model with them. They were able to make some adaptations and we were able to get some really good results, which I'm going to show you later. But none of that would have happened if the code had been closed. So I think that's a nice case study for the broader picture of why we like to advocate for open source for this reason of it accelerates progress because it can enable collaborations to occur in a reasonably organic way. So aside from that, it being open source, it does have significant documentation, training material, user support, um, and it's already been integrated into our suite of Moose applications via Aurora, but also uh, we have collaborators who have done it in Cardinal, which has the benefit of uh, of fluid, a GPU accelerated fluids code called NECRS. And this is a picture of a HCLL blanket model that we were modeling uh, using, using these codes. And then the, here are the GitHub URLs for all of these codes. So there've been in the past more than one approach to accelerating OpenMC. The first and earliest was back in 2017, a couple of folks at Bristol. They were using the uh, NVIDIA uh, optics library, which is the uh, built-in ray tracing library. So it's a sensible idea when you think about it, because ray tracing operations are what you're performing when you're trying to figure out the next surface of interaction of a particle. Um, however, this approach, while that's a, a seemingly sensible approach, they only were able to uh, look at fairly uh, simplistic geometries, and it didn't go much further than that. Then there is a CUDA, a native CUDA approach. This is done by uh, Gavin Ridley and Ben Forge at MIT. Um, Gavin was a PhD student at the time. Um, and this, uh, uh, I haven't had a chance to play with it, but the one that we are going to be using and talking about in this talk used OpenMP target offload. So the reason for selecting this is that of all of these, it was the most mature. But more importantly, or at least for me, more importantly, it has the benefit of performance portability. Um, and as stated, it's open source. So it's a fork of the original OpenMC and you can find it at this, um, at this GitHub URL. So why is performance portability something that I care about? 
So if you look at the top three supercomputers today, Frontier, Aurora, and Eagle, uh, with Frontier exceeding the um, exascale mark, if you look at the GPUs that they're using, Frontier is using AMD, Aurora is using Intel, Eagle is using uh, NVIDIA. We have three different vendors here for the GPUs that are being used, and they're all getting good performance. So in terms of being strategic at planning what um, hardware you might be buying and planning to be able to leverage on any of those, because I can't be, I can't predict what hardware we are going to buy and invest in in coming years. I need to be prepared to run my code on any of these. Hence, I need my code to be portable. So I need portable performance. And of these three options, OpenMP is the only one of those that is performance portable. So it seemed to be the right one to back. So now I've given you a little bit of background, I'll dive in to uh, the algorithmic considerations. So before I can tell you what was changed for the Fusion uh, applications, I first need to tell you what was already done previously. So until this contribution, as I've stated, the uh, results that were looked at were based on Fission applications. So it's important to have a visual picture of what that might look like in your head. So these are um, these are slices of uh, geometry uh, colored by material. Um, and it's looking at a small modular reactor type geometry. So you've got here a single pin, you've got some uranium fuel full of, uh, and it's depleted, so it's full of other actinides and things like that. You've got some cladding and you've got some water. And then these pins are, are arranged in an assembly and your assembly is arranged in, um, in a reactor core like this. So you've got this nested geometry. And so although there are quite a lot of surfaces here and there are a lot of cells, in terms of representing that in memory, it's actually quite efficient because you can represent it in this recursive way. So it doesn't actually take up a lot of memory. And that's an important thing to keep in mind for later. Um, so with that picture in mind, of that's the type of application that was looked at. Um, I will tell you that a critical step previously was to introduce something called event-based transport. So this is an important plot, so let me take you through it. So on the X, sorry, on the Y axis, we've got performance in terms of particles per second. Um, so this is our measure of performance. And on the uh, X axis, we've got particles per iteration. So before we look at the sort of the trends, I just want to tell you what these lines are. So in green, we've got GPU and in blue, we've got CPU. So if we just look at this so-called history based transport, which is the dotted lines for the two respectively, we've got here we have the uh, CPU version on history based transport and the GPU version with history based transport is actually worse consistently. Uh, that's not great. As soon as you go to uh, event-based transport, the GPU one jumped right up. And I'm going to explain to you why that is in a moment's time, but it's it's really notable. Um, and so, whereas the history base gets worse. So when we later on talk about speed ups, we're comparing, um, we're comparing best of class for um, for both CPU and GPU. So we're comparing history based for CPU and event based for GPU. So the next point in terms of the x-axis is the increase in performance with particles per iteration. So what this is telling you is that you need to saturate the device memory in order to get good performance, whereas you don't really see that same trend when you're looking at the CPU. And that's because you're less bound by memory in terms of the, the CPU than the GPU. So these were the this was the key takeaway from the previous work. So let's now look closely at what event-based transport actually is. So traditional history-based transport is where each thread has a particle and it just runs with that particle from life to death. And when you're parallelizing over uh, over the history-based, each thread has a particle and they're all just running concurrently. However, because with a GPU, you are limited by the memory that's on the device, the memory that a given particle might need to access to do a certain thing 
might not be currently on the device if you're doing history-based transport. And so what you end up with is a bunch of threads that are just sitting around doing nothing because they're waiting to get memory back onto the device. And that is the thing that is slow. So what you want to enable is to have all of your threads doing the same kind of operation at the same time. And in order to do that, you do this thing called event-based transport, which is where you queue your events by the type of thing that you want them to do. So examples of that to make it more concrete. You could be initializing your particles. You could be computing a cross section. You could be choosing to advance your particle. You could be crossing a surface. You could be scattering. You could be colliding. You could be reaching a graveyard and deciding that particle is going to die now. Um, so when you are doing any of these operations, particularly let's say looking up a cross section or looking up a surface, those are memory accesses. And so you want them to all be doing the same thing. And so what happens in practice is you launch all your particles. They all end up in these little queues. The algorithm looks at which, uh, which uh, event type has the biggest queue and then says, right, that's the next type of event we're gonna do. And then parallelizes all of, over all of yeah. those particles doing that event. And then they'll all scatter, do, uh, reach their next queues and then the algorithm picks another buffer which has a big queue and handles that so this improves the locality of the memory access but it's so sensitive that even within these it's important to sort your particles by uh by the quantity of interest that you're currently doing so in the case of calculating cross sections you need to sort your particles by the material they're in and the energy they have and when it comes to crossing surfaces, you need to sort your particles by the cell they're in and what is the surface that they're crossing. Um, and these uh, these imp give uh, nice improvements, as you'll see on the next slide. So looking Alan, then at... You have five minutes. Okay, please. thank you. So in terms of the vision, um, this is without any sorting. We've got speed up on the y-axis. For cross-section sorting, when you have materials, um, there are... Um, fission calculations have lots of uh, more um, uh, <laughs> sorry um, so the, fusion, the fission applications see a huge speed up from doing this cross section sorting the fusion has a speed up that is slightly less because it is less depend there are fewer cross sections that it needs to look up because we don't have this problem about lots of actinides Fission, however, because the geometry was simpler, doesn't have the same kind of speed up. So fission in blue here. Fusion um, sees a massive speed up because the geometry was important. And so um, fusion gets a speed up of about three from doing both of these operations, whereas fission applications only needed the cross-section sorting. Um, so this is really getting into the weeds. This is uh, really just saying that for evaluating the point containment uh, in a given location actually depends on the way that you even express the order of the uh, of the Boolean operations. So this is, you've probably seen uh, infix and prefix, sorry, postfix and prefix operations before if you've ever done a for loop. So whether that's I++ plus plus or plus plus I, that's your postfix and prefix. And it's really just a question of do you evaluate first um, and then apply the operation or do you apply the operation then evaluate? So this is really just getting into the weeds of do I evaluate uh, a, the order in which I apply these Boolean operations? And you, it ha it's quite sensitive on this to do with the locality of the memory. But I won't go into this in too much detail. So now results. So this is the bit that you actually care about. So... Uh, here is the geometry that we're looking at. It's this sort of simplified tokamak geometry. It's a sort of medium-sized problem, let's say. It's not eta elite, but neither is it a sphere, uh, just a single sphere with a source. So we've got about 168 cells here. We are computing tallies uh, to make it sort of at least somewhat representative of a realistic problem. So we're computing the flux on a regular mesh with 3 million bins. Um, this is something that's important. So we're keeping the problem size fixed in terms of the total number of particles. So that's fixed at 10 billion. Um, however, 
we are going to be changing the number of particles per batch per GPU. Um, so, sorry, we're going to be keeping fixed the number of particles per batch per GPU, but then that scales with the number of GPU. So just to give an example, if I have one GPU, I will have 10 million particles per batch. But if I have 100 GPU, I would have 100 million um, particles per batch because I'm scaling the number um, of particles per batch with the number of GPU. And this is what allows us to, enable, to ensure that we actually saturate uh, the GPU memory. Um, but the total problem size is also fixed. And so if you've got lots of GPU, you simply have fewer batches. OK, so just really quickly on the hardware. So the CPU baseline was done on Intel Xeon Platinums. This is for consistency with previous work. But the strong scaling results that I'm going to show you were done on our Cambridge CSD3 supercomputer um, and the Ampere partition. So each Ampere node has uh, two AMD EPIC 64, proce uh, 64 core processors, and, the N and it has four NVIDIA A100s with 80 gigabytes of memory. And this picture on the right just shows the sort of the connectivity of the GPU with each other and with the CPU, although this image has the 40 gigabyte type. OK, so let's start with CPU. Uh, let's start with speed up results. So this is just looking at um, comparing uh, the, the baseline CPU, the Intel that I showed you on here, uh, with a single NVIDIA A100. And what this is showing you on the y-axis is performance in terms of particles per second um, for our benchmark problems, the Hugenboom problem for the fission and this simple tokamak for the fusion. And we're getting good speed up for both types of application, 4.4 for fission and 3.8 for fusion. So about four for both. Um, and so we get good speed up for both. So finally, this is the uh, penultimate slide. We're seeing really nice strong scaling um, out to 16 nodes. So that's 64 GPU. And this is 95% strong scaling efficiency. Um, of, this is the total time in seconds here um, uh, for the total problem time. So this 5% of non-parallel, you know, uh, lack of efficiency is really just coming from initialization. Uh, the transport itself, which is dominating the problem, is scaling pretty much ideally. And I was pretty amazed when I saw this, but it took quite a lot of work to get this. The really important part was to saturate the GPU memory. OK, so let's just summarize what I said. So what I have shown you today is the first demonstration uh, of OpenMC accelerated on GPU using the OpenMP target offload method applied to a fusion relevant model. So this simplified tokamak that I showed you. We see 3.8 times speed up comparing a single NVIDIA A100 GPU to a dual socket Intel Xeon Platinum CPU having 56 cores. We see a 95% strong scaling efficiency um, where we're going out to 64 NVIDIA A100 GPU. And before you ask me, the reason we stopped there is that was my user limit. Um, and this was enabled by fixing the total number of particles and fixing the particles per batch per GPU. So what we're going to look at next is we're going to try and push out to um, other fusion relevant devices having higher complexity. I've I stated the importance of performance portability. This has been demonstrated previously for fission problems, but not here. So we'll look to look at other types of GPU from other vendors. And then we need to hook it back into um, the rest of our multi-physics suite. So we need to assess how we might go about doing that. So thank you for listening. Um, and that's the end of the talk. And I'll happily take some questions. OK, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brooks. Very, very nice presentation. Uh, that's time just for one question because we have a little bit late. So there is a question in the chat by Javier Saitz. That is, is the sorting of particles done on GPU or CPU, is the domain geometry distributed among the nodes or it is, is it copied on each node? In other words, all the particles are distributed among GPUs? Right. So. The, I can answer the first, I'll answer it in reverse order. So uh, yeah, every node, uh, every GPU will have a, com uh, have a copy of that geometry because it's quite small. Um, then the first question was, where is the sorting done? Is that done on CPU or GPU? Um, 
that is an excellent question. Um, I'm afraid I don't know the answer. Um, this is where I uh, will have to defer you to the um, the authors of the code, uh, John Tram. So I'm happy to uh, to to give you an email address for that if you if you want to message me separately. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, there is a small question by Jonathan Swimmel. I would like to to tell you. So, uh, great talk, Ellen. Many many thanks for this work. It looks super useful. If you are looking for other model, we have some ECF model over the first light fusion. So just a comment. Thank you, brilliant. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And thanks again, the speaker. And we switch to the next talk by Dr. Serikov. Uh, that is here, so you can put your slides. Which presentation is called Monte Carlo Radiation Transport Parallel Computations on Marconi Fusion HEC for the IFMIF Dones Radiation Shielding Tasks. So please go ahead, Dr. Serikov. Oh, morning, everyone. Can you see my presentation? Yes, please. Okay, I can start. So, good morning. Uh, this is about the Monte Carlo radiation transfer parallel computations on uh, a new cluster we are using Marconi HPC for IFMIF Donuts application. This work is done for uh, Eurofusion project in collaboration with our Polish colleagues. And uh, at the beginning, um, we uh, see the um, history of uh, our project. Uh, for Monte Carlo calculations, which has started in 2012, uh, conceived as a uh, radiation transport support for ITER project, uh, which uh, we run on uh, high performance computational resources of FOE broader approach on uh, international fusion uh, um, research uh, uh, supercomputer uh, Helios. And um, this project was finished in 2016 and continued on uh, uh, premises of uh, uh, Marconi Fusion computer shared by Eurofusion. And um, uh, first motivation of uh, this calculation is um, the principle of uh, Monte Carlo transport, which is actually based on on uh, uh, three uh, major pillars, I would say. This um, geometry, because uh, uh, tokamak fusion systems are very complicated in toroidal geometry. Then we using continuous energy representation of cross-section data. And the uh, third pillar is the calculation accuracy, which is uh, dependent only on number of particle samples and the uh, statistic associated with uh, mean values we estimated with Monte Carlo method. In Monte Carlo method, each particle runs on each uh, core or slave uh, CPU, and this uh, uh, runs done uh, independently from birth to death or history-based, as uh, our previous speaker told us. And um, <clears throat> In principle, we uh, follow this uh, approach uh, very long time. And uh, this is realized with uh, MPI or open MP parallelization. Uh, we use uh, for such type of uh, parallel, massively parallel, I would say, computations in uh, a long history of uh, computations uh, in Europe and uh, uh, previous cycle was in uh, Helios, Japan supercomputer. Now we are running uh, on supercomputer Marconi Fusion in, installed in uh, Seneca uh, in Italy. And um, in order to find the optimal number of uh, CPUs for this type of calculations, we did the estimations uh, of speed up, which is shown on this graph on the left side. This is a graph for uh, Helio supercomputer, which uh, specification provided here, number of uh, CPUs, 
so it was uh, two by eight um, uh, sandy bridge processors and on the right side uh, in comparison we see uh, speed up evaluation for uh, currently running Marconi fusion supercomputer which is based on two by 24 cores Intel Xeon Sky Lake and the uh, number of uh, um, uh, RAM random access memory per node is uh, enough and it allows us to uh, fill this um, uh, memory with our geometry. So this is the point why we are using CPU in a history-based approach. And unfortunately, MCNP, the code we are using for this transport calculations does not allow to use GPU. And they are looking for uh, OpenMC maybe or some other software, how to, how to use, um, how to change algorithm and to use event-based as was presented by previous excellent speaker. And the uh, MCNP code has a very long history of development. As you know, it started uh, in the uh, 1940s, 1960s from Manhattan Project and uh, these famous names well known for us like uh, if Meyer, Fermi, Metropolis, von Neyman, Ulam, so these famous people uh, initiated the uh, Monte Carlo radiation transport project and realization, finally realization in MCNP code, taking advantage of high energy transport um, codes, Lahed, and um, previous version of MCNP. So, Currently, uh, we count 70 years of Monte Carlo de MCNP development, and um, I would stress your attention to the final point of uh, version MCNP 6.3. Uh, and uh, I have used uh, previous 6.2 in my calculations. And um, we uh, took into account whole spectrum of uh, advancement in uh, 70 years history and uh, uh, among these uh, authors of MCNP 6, I would uh, stress some names like uh, Thomas Booth um, and uh, Jeremy Sweezy, he's the uh, leader of the group. And uh, I believe this uh, also will be as well known as uh, people who initiate this uh, Monte Carlo method development. Okay, so a few words, exa examples, uh, MCNP 6.2. Now we have a uh, huge number of uh, uh, applications and uh, uh, we focus our attention on uh, neutronics and nuclear reactor design and the fusion neutronics applications. Uh, it actually, <laughs> possible to run uh, 36 uh, different particles <laughs> with MCNP 6.2. But uh, for us, I would say important is the uh, first three particles, neutron, photon, electrons. And uh, in uh, if we have done this application, for us uh, is important also neutrons, neutron particle. So I would say four particles among this uh, huge list of <laughs> different particles compatible with MCNP 6.2, like uh, neutrino, baryon, and so on. <laughs> we don't need such uh, exotic particles for fusion neutronics applications, but to, good to know about this huge number of uh, uh, particles compatible with MCNP 6.2. About um, the um, code development um, at KIT, uh, we have developed um, on the fly global variance reduction technique, which is actually based on uh, common use of uh, weight window mesh, which uh, is defined in MCNP in order to improve uh, statistics of uh, particle which are tiling by detector. So we need to uh, 
populate uh, pulse the space of our geometry uh, with enough uh, number of particles and the um, accuracy of uh, MCNP uh, tally depends on number of uh, sampled particles. And uh, uh, as the uh, number of particles limited by uh, um, uh, sampling uh, technique, uh, we introduce uh, the uh, weight of each particle and um, the need to estimate the weight uh, distribution in our geometry. And this sort of um, assignment with weight per each uh, transported particle could be done in different way. For example, at uh, Oak Ridge, uh, we use um, uh, a discrete ordinate code de novo, and uh, we uh, assign particles with MCNP coupled to de novo by transport uh, in reverse problem. So we change uh, location of uh, source and tally. And we use um, this uh, uh, reverse problem with green function to arrange the uh, weight window mesh for particles in whole geometry and Im important issue to assign these weights in distance between source and tally. In our case at KIT, we decided to introduce the definition of particle weight as a ratio between current value of uh, neutron flux and maximum value of neutron flux. Idea is very simple on first way. And um, the problem is to get the current uh, value of uh, flux. So uh, we need to update the weight window mesh during the computation of fluxes. And it was realized by using um, dumping of uh, fluxes in a printing and dumping card of MCNP, per DMP card. So we update uh, uh, definition of uh, vent window mesh every step in uh, uh, per DMP cycle. So, um, and also uh, we- Sorry, Arkady, you have five minutes. Okay. Yes. So we did this uh, for um, whole geometry, and um, this is geometry of um, FME Donis, which is a rather sophisticated task in relation to uh, thickness of uh, shielding arrangement. And um, the thickness of concrete walls around the um, target of the deuterium lithium reaction is uh, six uh, meters. So we need to propagate uh, neutron flux along this um, uh, six meter of uh, concrete. And these are different uh, slides uh, of our geometry. The heart of the problem is the test cell and particular reaction of uh, Deuteron lithium in um, the center of the cell on lithium target. So this uh, geometry uh, superimposed with mesh tally used for uh, getting the nuclear heating results presenting on these slides. We have uh, neutron heat density, photon heat density, and uh, accumulated uh, total um, heat density. So we see some difference in contribution in different materials we use for this geometry. And uh, uh, we um, uh, calculated um, heating also in uh, lithium jet. So could you imagine the neutron beam impinging on uh, liquid lithium flowing in this uh, 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 blue part of uh, geometry? And by heating uh, with lithium, uh, we got a break peak of heat at certain distance, 1.86 centimeter. And uh, the thickness of lithium is only 2.5 centimeter. That means we have only 
uh, 0.6 centimeter distance to the back plate made of steel. So that means if we uh, reach the back plate of a lithium jet, then all structure could be melted because um, neutron beam has a very huge uh, power, uh, five megawatt uh, realized in around a quarter of uh, lithium. And lithium uh, remove all this heat very efficiently by flowing with high speed, 15 meter per second. And if it falls to uh, Donuts high flux test model, then we, we have a problem. So in order to be very precise in location of um, peak in the lithium jet, we estimated distribution of uh, nuclear heat energy deposition in lithium. And uh, we found uh, this curved surface of break peak. And um, we did everything possible to be safe in this process. And the uh, next task was the shielding calculations. So we arranged uh, mesh tally in uh, rooms around the uh, uh, test cell, uh, in particular in the uh, target interface room and uh, radiation isolation room. So this is important to understand. So we have uh, two uh, beam ducts uh, with openings, and uh, this opening is a source of streaming, and we can see the impact of the streaming to radiation isolation room, which is kind of bump of uh, a biological dose, um, looks like this. And uh, we decided to introduce a shielding box in order to protect the radiation uh, isolation room behind this concrete. And uh, this was a task to arrange a shielding box and we calculated nuclear heating in all materials. And we found that uh, with shielding box arranged in this uh, uh, neutron uh, beam duct, uh, we can reduce um, uh, those rate from one to zero ones. Then times possible to reduce uh, those uh, rate by using shielding box. Then was the task to estimate uh, uh, fluxes in the next uh, room on the right side here, complementary experiments room, so which is located uh, here and connected to the test cell by the neutron beam channel. So uh, we did these calculations and we found uh, some uh, streaming effects and uh, we work how to arrange different levels of neutron fluxes in the complementary experiments room. And um, also we did calculations of uh, dose rate in order to provide access in the complementary experiments room located here on the right side. And we found uh, if we close the shutter along this uh, uh, neutron beam, then uh, it is possible to get uh, limited regulated access to complementary experiments room. And I want to stress your attention that uh, with uh, our developments at KIT, it's possible to calculate uh, uh, neutron flux attenuation with eight, 15, 15 orders of magnitude attenuation started from the test cell here in the center to tritium room on the lateral side. So this is a rather good advancement. And uh, in conclusion, I just uh, list um, all um, our achievements um, uh, started from uh, beginning of this project in uh, 2012 on uh, Helios and uh, it continues on Marconi supercomputer <clears throat> and uh, we did uh, a lot of methodology improvement and um, among them I already um, presented um, on the fly variance reduction technique so and it allows us as I mentioned to calculate uh, very high attenuation uh, profiles like 15, or, uh, 15 orders of magnitude you saw for dose rate and 18 orders of magnitude in uh, flux. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Arkady, for your very nice talk. We are a little bit late, so we have time for just one short question. 
if I don't see nothing, but I have a curiosity regarding the shielding material that you use in your concrete. shielding blocks. Concrete. In the blocks. Oh, okay, yeah. so concrete. Normal so concrete, just, ordinary uh, concrete. Okay. It was a combination of um, two sort of um, blocks. So for these blocks, we use uh, heavy concrete with additional shielding plates and uh, cooling channels. It calls a uh, removable biological shield blocks, RBSB, located here. And after that, uh, it is permanent uh, concrete blocks, like a concrete wall okay. made of and, ordinary concrete. And they will be located on rails or in which uh, kind of removable uh, system? Removable, they uh, removed from the top. So if okay, you look, from the top. Uh, yeah, if you look on um, uh, geometry of... Uh, if we have done this, it removes from here. You see this crane? And the yeah. crane removes the blocks from the access cell, from the roof. And the uh, important uh, message to you maybe that uh, this project already started and construction began in 2022. Commission is planned to 2029. And the uh, first results expected in 2035. So that means we are uh, very close to the ITER schedule. So I would say the history of IFMIF and ITER are very similar. So they can save that uh, nearly the same time in the uh, uh, 80s of last century, like uh, 1985 year, last century. And uh, yes. I believe uh, we uh, start to commissioning and uh, first results uh, <laughs> produced uh, by the same time, 2025. Yes. So it's yeah, a very yes, promising yeah. project. Very promising. Yes, we know. We know it's right. Thank you very much, Arkady. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, Shinpei Futatani from the uh, University of Polytechnic de Catalonia. I'll do the, the session, the chair of the session. Uh, plasma MHD. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Federico Cipolletta from BSC. Uh, <clears throat> now, Federico, are you there? Did you yes, good morning. Ready? Yeah, good morning. Yeah, then now you have uh, our attention. Okay, let me share my screen, put it in the slideshow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So good morning, everyone. I'm Federico Cipolletta, and I will talk about um, the code optimization, optimization that we are performing in the BSC ACH for the JORAC code to, in order to implement some matrix, com matrix compression techniques. Uh, I am Federico Cipolletta, and uh, this is a, a work that is in collaboration between people from uh, BSC, from the Max Planck Institute, from uh, the University of Cassino, and from the University of Napoli. <clears throat> Uh, let me mm, just start with a couple of words, uh, uh, recalling what uh, Gilles Fourste um, introduced yesterday regarding basically uh, the um, the context of this work. So this work uh, finds finds uh, its place in the Euro Eurofusion theory and advanced simulation coordination, the ETASC, which is a coordination between the fundamental research provided by the TSPV and the uh, um, ACH um, uh, structures, which are providing instead the expertise uh, in computer science and software engineering. In particular, I, am, uh, I belong to the uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, uh, where uh, hosting the one of the ACH, the, the one from CMAT BSC. And here we have uh, three groups uh, dealing with the, with the code uh, of fusions. And in particular, I am uh, part of the fusion group uh, uh, at the BSC. Uh, so this is the outline of my talk. I will uh, start giving a brief introduction of, to the JOREC code uh, and uh, to the response matrices. What are the response matrices? I will talk then about the matrix compression that we techniques that we choose and how it is implemented in the current uh, version of the development uh, code. Uh, and in, a, in addition, I will also give you some hints about the how, met, how the, this method performs with application. In particular, 
with the vertical displacement event simulation and the tearing uh, mode instability simulation. And we will also give uh, some um, issues and ideas uh, that we found uh, during uh, during this development. And I will conclude, gi conclude giving uh, the next steps uh, that we have in mind. So just uh, uh, going to the introduction about JOREC. The JOREC code is a nonlinear MHD code with many extensions. Uh, including uh, uh, both kinetic and uh, hybrid models. Uh, from the geometric point of view, on the meridional poloidal uh, side, uh, it has a fin uh, Bezier finite, finite element modeling, uh, while in the toroidal direction, uh, it, um, it implements a Fourier expansion. Uh, it uh, it possesses uh, the implementation of a fully implicit time evolution scheme, uh, and it, it is capable of uh, modeling the vector tokamaks, uh, including uh, one or more X points, like in the grid uh, that you see on the right. Uh, those are typical grids uh, uh, for, for JOREC. Uh, it is used usually to, to simulate the plasma instabilities, uh, like uh, the one that you can see in the bottom. Here you can see some snapshot of the pressure during a simulation of a vertical displacement uh, of a vertical displacement event. Uh, it was originally uh, developed at the CA uh, Kadarash. Uh, in the present work, we decided to adopt the uh, simpler uh, reduce MHD model. Um, it is the code is written in Fortran 1995, and it also possesses. Uh, uh, an hybrid parallelization uh, with MPI and OpenMP. So it is already optimized. Uh, then switching to the response matrices, uh, basically in one of the extension, the one that we are interested in in this work, uh, which is the free boundary and resistive wall extension, uh, the code leverages uh, on, um, on, some, on some matrices, the response matrices, to have a description of the interaction between the wall of the tokamak of the device and the plasma. Uh, those matrices are provided by external codes, uh, namely the star wall code, which provides a 3D uh, uh, thin resistive wall response with a geometry like at the bottom left. Uh, so you, you can see that the coils here are, uh, are thin. Uh, while on the other hand, we have also an extension with the Cariddi code, which provides 3D volumetric resistive wall uh, with a typical geometry, as you can see in the bottom right. Uh, the goal of, uh, of the present work, of the, 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 the work that was requested to the ACH at BSC, is to enable the modeling capabilities of uh, uh, realistic and accurate 3D wall structures within the MHD simulation of plasma instability inside the tokamak. And if you want to be able to model uh, such accurate um, geometries, uh, you will find out that those uh, response matrices become really, really big. Uh, so we the objective is to implement a way to reduce the memory of those matrices and possibly to improve the, the performance. Uh, we want to, in particular, to apply factorization and compression techniques to those matrices uh, provided by the external codes uh, Starwell and Cariddi. Of course, this presents several challenges. Uh, in particular, uh, there are some task-related challenges because, uh, as I was saying, those matrix uh, uh, can become really, really big for uh, for uh, accurate geometries. And uh, when, when you have to deal with uh, big matrices in, in HPC, is always uh, challenging. Um, he, there are code-related challenges due to the fact that uh, the, the code itself is a, a complex, complex um, collection of, uh, of several Fortran files with uh, those matrices provided uh, by uh, computers externally by other codes. Uh, and there are also some project-related challenges because uh, the JOREC code presents several parallel developments. So when you want to implement something else, when you want to provide the further development, you should always act with uh, in mind some chord orthogonality of your development with respect to, to, to the other developments. Uh, so uh, now we will talk about, I will talk about uh, the matrix compression technique that, that we choose. In particular, we choose to, to implement the singular value decomposition, uh, also known as SVD in, in jargon. Uh, which basically is sketched here in this figure. So you can see that here a uh, um, square dense matrix A of dimension n times n can be splitted, can be written 
uh, with as a product of three matrices, uh, one left orthogonal U, uh, one diagonal matrix sigma containing the singular values, and one right orthogonal matrix V. Uh, so uh, if you decide that, uh, if you find that uh, the rank of the sigma, sigma matrix, which is also the rank of, of A, is K, uh, smaller than N, uh, you will find out that, and if you decide to um, to store u times sigma together, u sigma and vt, so two matrices instead of three, you will find out that you need only two n k elements instead of n square. So for particular choices of k, uh, this can be a smaller number with respect to n square. If A is rectangular instead, you will need the MK plus NK elements. So in both cases, you see that the um, dimension of the, the, the number of elements that you need scales linearly with K, with the rank, with the, rank, uh, with the chosen rank. This kind of method has some powerful features uh, in view of application because uh, the SVD can always be performed. Uh, uh, and, and SVD with the singular, value, uh, singular values um, ordered in decreasing order always exist. So it means that uh, it is useful to cut out uh, the smallest one. Uh, and, the SB, and the SBD is also an opti optimal uh, approximation with respect to the residual computed via the Frobenius norm. So it gives you an optimal uh, approximation method. Uh, from the implementation point of view, moreover, uh, there is a, a subroutine from Scalapack, the PDG SVD subroutine, which provides uh, the, the capabilities of computing the SVD of a given matrix. And since Scalapack is well known to be already optimized and parallelized, it, it is a, a really uh, viable way to, to implement uh, this kind of, uh, of method. Uh, how it is implemented in particular in our work. So uh, we started from the block, simple block diagram above. You can see that uh, here there is a Star Wars Caridi producing uh, world response matrices, which are then fed into JOREC, which is run and produce output to be analyzed. Uh, in our uh, work in particular, um, we want to, uh, we added uh, a compression tool, an external code, a further uh, external code, between the response matrices and JOREC. So it will take the response matrices uh, uh, as input, it will uh, uh, compress the matrix and it will give them back to JOREC. Uh, how this compression tool works? It works basically when you compile, when the user compile, it selects which matrix it wants to compress uh, from, the, from the file given by Starwell and Caridi. Uh, and what fraction of singular values of the SVD to retain. So basically it reads this, the Starwell and Caridi response file, uh, the Scalapack subroutines perform the SVD, so it uh, factorizes the matrix uh, in uh, three matrices. Uh, then the code compress the matrix, basically retaining only the biggest singular values with, with respect to what was chosen by the user. And at output, the file, uh, at output, uh, a file containing this factorized uh, matrix is, uh, is printed out. So uh, in particular, each uh, factorized matrix is, will be split in U sigma and VT. And the, I also implemented the possibility to re-aggregate this, uh, this factorization in order to, for sake of, of validation, basically. Uh, and those runs with the, comp the compression tool are typically really fast. Uh, of the order maximum of minutes for very big matrices since uh, they rely only uh, on the Scala pack called the um, optimized library. Uh, and the compression in addition needs to be run only one time per, for each JOREC simulation. And this is the reason, main reason why we, we choose to uh, put this, um, this compression uh, algorithm uh, inside a separate module. Uh, some notes regarding JOREC, of course, uh, when you when you want to uh, change a matrix into a factorized version version of the matrix, also the main JOREC uh, code should be adapted. So it, it uh, needed some adaptation, uh, and I, in particular, I already implemented the MPI and OpenMP hybrid parallelization for these adaptations so in order to 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 optimize uh, the, the calculations. Uh, and we, in addition, we have chosen two uh, of the response matrices, in particular, we, which have uh, uh, 
uh, the dimension of uh, W times uh, BZ, where W is the whole degree of freedom, and BZ are the Bezier degree of freedom times the Fourier harmonics in toroidal direction uh, for each element. Uh, so this means that those matrices, those two matrices that we choose, uh, serves to um, to give uh, the uh, interaction be between the wall and plasma. Um, of course, the dimension of uh, the matrix in the BZ direction changes if you choose a different number for the toroidal harmonics. And this is a fast way to, to test bigger matrices. Uh, the rank of the matrix, uh, of course, of the matrix uh, when, when you when you split the matrix um, via SVD, is always limited by the minimum between W and BZ. And, the, and we will see that this we this can be a limit. Uh, so uh, switching now to how the method performs with application, uh, we tested the the um, vertical displacement event, which is an instability. Uh, that occurs when you, you lose in some way the control of the ver of the magnetic axis of the plasma uh, in, in the vertical uh, direction. And so the plasma starts to move inside the Togamak. Uh, we choose several values of uh, uh, a rate uh, re of retained singular values. So this, this can be can be seen as a, a measure of uh, how much you are compressing the matrix. So a smaller rate means that you are compressing a lot uh, more. So for example, if you choose to uh, a rate of one, it means that uh, the matrices are only factorized, but not compressed. So in, in particular, the sides can grow a little with respect to the standard matrix. Uh, a, a rate of 0 0.75 means that you, you are retaining the three fourths of the singular values and so on. And then we also run several simulation with all these uh, uh, rate of retained singular values. Uh, adopting uh, different numbers for the toroidal harmonics. So if you only consider the n equal zero toroidal harmonics, uh, we were able to obtain uh, the equilibrium for uh, uh, down to 0 0.75, so down to uh, three fourths of the singular values to be retained, but uh, also in the separatrix of the equilibrium that you see here uh, on the bottom left, you can see that is, there, there is some deviation with respect to the uh, only factorized or standard version. So uh, the results were inaccurate. Uh, then if you consider more harmonics from zero to nine, we were able to obtain a simulation, uh, uh, the convergence of the simulation. But as you can see here from this plot in the middle, uh, the Z coordinate of the magnetic axis lose some accuracy during this, the, the evolution. And this means that the, the results are not accurate. Um, in, in, um, finally, if we consider more harmonics, even more harmonics from zero to 19, uh, we were able to obtain a, a right, a correct evolution for the Z coordinate of the magnetic axis, but we lose in, in accuracies in the uh, magnetic energy and, uh, and so on. So basically just to recap what we did for the VDE, uh, we initially had some performance issues that were addressed through the implementation of uh, the hybrid uh, MPI plus OpenMP parallelization. Uh, the, uh, the simulation with uh, uh, the retain rate of 1.0 shows matching result with the standard code. So this means that the implementation is validated. Uh, it is a correct imp implementation. But on the other hand, uh, what what is the take the take uh, the takeaway message is that the n equal zero part seems to be very sensitive to the compression, which is the uh, dominant part. Uh, so increasing n, n, increasing the number of toroidal uh, uh, harmonics slightly improved the compressibility, but not uh, not satisfactory. Yes. So uh, in in uh, finally we we can we can say that the implementation is optimized and validated, but the efficiency is still improvable. Uh, but on the other hand, we, we tested the, this, this kind of implementation with other tests, the Turing mode instability, and this is what we get. This, in this plot, you can see how the memory of the matrix, of one matrix, varies with respect to uh, the rate of retained uh, singular values. Uh, here, it, it is uh, important to say that those matrices do not contain the n equal zero part, uh, so they are not sensitive in principle to this, uh, to this issue of the VDE. Uh, but on the other hand, and, uh, on each curve, uh, the a star indicates the smallest uh, retain rate. So the maximum compression that we are able to reach uh, for giving accurate results.
Uh, we started with the black curve here with this resolution of uh, W and B, Z. And uh, without doing uh, basically anything, we were uh, straightly obtaining uh, a minimum retain rate of 0 0.15. So uh, the matrix was compressed down to the 15%. And this is a really good result. So we decided to perform a scan in the dimension of, uh, of the matrix. So starting from a basic, uh, basic uh, re resolution of... Uh, um, uh, more than 2,000 uh, degree of freedom on the wall and 400 degree of freedom on BZ. Uh, we produced the red curve, but here you can see that uh, we only were able to obtain um, a compression rate of 0 0.75. Uh, if we multiply by three the degree of freedom in the wall, we, uh, uh, we straightly uh, have a minimum uh, retain rate of 0 0.5, 25, sorry. Uh, if instead we leave the degree of freedom of the wall untouched and we multiply by three the degree of freedom, of freedom on the plasma, uh, we were getting a better result. So the retain rate down to 0 0.1. And finally, if we multiply by three both W and B, Z, uh, again, the, the minimum retain rate is uh, again 0 0.1. So the takeaway message from this test is that the compression is of course more efficient on large matrices, and this is a, a general result of, in compression of matrices. But in particular, we, we found that uh, um, this, is, this is more efficient for larger resolution on the plasma side. Uh, so uh, let, let me recap briefly the issues uh, that we found, that we learned, and the ideas on how to address them. From the VDA, we learned uh, how the matrix uh, uh, is composed. So it has some blocks for each toroidal harmonics, uh, toroidal, uh, toroidal, number, toroidal harmonics number. Uh, but the n equals zero part seems to be really sensitive. So we want to be able to avoid the compression of this block here and apply the compression possibly only to the, this part. In reality, uh, a, a common uh, results of the literature says that uh, if you compress um, the par uh, parts of the matrix, the, co the final compression that you will reach would be uh, greater. So we want to be able to compress each toroidal harmonic separately. Uh, on the other hand, from the tearing mode instability test, we learned that uh, the plasma, uh, the plasma side, is uh, in some way um, limits uh, the amount of compression that you can apply, and this comes uh, directly from the, 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 the um, definition of the singular value of the composition from the SVD, because basically, if you if you uh, see uh, the dimensions, you will find out that this k, which is the the rank of sigma is what is limiting uh, is limit is always limited by the minimum between m and n so if you want to uh, decrease the degree of freedom of the biggest of the maximum between the two you will not to uh, do not do anything basically uh, therefore we need to find a way to uh, develop uh, develop something to select a worthy region on the walls uh, to be to be compressed because in in all the cases that we studied uh, the, the, the walls on the, um, the walls degree of freedom were uh, greater than the plasma degree of freedom because you want to be more accurate on the wall. So just to uh, give you a final recap of what we did, uh, we, uh, we gave, we, we show a first implementation of a tool for compressing uh, the response matrices. Uh, and uh, we gave also its validation. We, we validated this and we also performed the first assessment of uh, how it works with, with, uh, with some application and it works well for some application. Uh, and this first implementation will be the playground where we, where we'll, where we will um, uh, implement further, further uh, features. In particular, for the future, we want to be able to uh, separate, to treat each uh, modes, each harmonic modes separately, to, so to be able to compress each mode separately. We want to assess the effectivity of this new implementation repeating the VDE tests, the vertical displacement event. We want to improve uh, the efficiency in compressing in the wall degree of freedom. So uh, this can be done, for example, with other methods that can be uh, algebraic multigrid or uh, hierarchical matrices or, metho or similar methods. We have to to, to, to find a way to do that, that efficiently. And uh, in addition, we would like also to be able to implement and test 
the compression for uh, other matrices because there are uh, some other parallel developments for uh, for example for an, um, the couplings for full MHD and allo current uh, which are dealing with uh, with other matrices and we, and we would like to be able to compress also those matrices so this is uh, all from my side and uh, uh, questions are welcome Thank you very much for your talk. It's very nice, very interesting. Uh, audience first, uh, do you have any question or qu question? If you have any, please uh, write in the chat or raise the hands so that you can speak. If not, meanwhile, I I, I want to ha ask some question. In slide, I, I forgot uh, 15 or something about the benchmark uh, no, the not benchmark, the memory compression with BD case, this one. Mm -hmm. uh, the right top panel, the the table says, so with a rate of retained singular values one, it's yes. hard, but uh, so if it's 0.75%, it's no longer accurate. So in this case, this BD, BD test case, the compression is not very, how do you say? Uh... It's not efficient, it's not accurate. Yeah. So uh, basically you you are able to compress the matrices, but the, the compressed matrices are, are not giving the correct results mm -hmm. or from one side, from the convergence point of view or from the, accurate, from the accuracy point of view. So we have uh, uh, problems with accuracy of results. But on the other hand, the, the positive aspect is that when we only factorize the matrix, uh, the results are matching perfectly. So this right. means that the implementation is valid, but we should find a way uh, to, to, to make the compression works. And uh, given that increasing the number of uh, toroidal harmonics, we are getting better and better results. The idea is to uh, isolate each toroidal component in the matrix, uh, compress each toroidal harmonics, each, each block for the, toroid, for the different toroidal harmonics, and then uh, regather re uh, the information after uh, the compression. Uh, this, of course, needs more development, and it's not trivial. Uh, but uh, yes, we, we, think, we really think that this n equal zero part is the most sensitive, because uh, adopting only n equal zero we were not able to even obtain uh, the evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think uh, physics physics phenomena may affect the uh, uh, fraction of uh, S SVs depending? For example, if the VD motion is fast, probably you need more uh, singular values to reproduce the original data like well, this. This can be yes. This can be possible. Also, we are studying uh, the effect of the resistivity of the wall, con mm. uh, changing the resistivity factor, and we see that uh, uh, with the higher resistivity, for example, in the TM in the tearing mode, we have better compression. So we we can all we would like also to test this uh, in the VDA side. Mm -hmm. How about basics? Or maybe relevant. How about the numeric numerical uh, convergence point of view? For example, if you compress the data of the uh, wall response matrix, for example, in the Jorex simulation uh, time time integration, for example, number of GMRS iteration may be larger or smaller. No, cannot be smaller, no. but larger. Or have you ever checked? I I'm interested in. This yes. Point. No. We okay. I I did not uh, make uh, um, an extensive uh, study on the number of GMRS uh, iteration, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, or, or, um, just uh, as an intuition, I can give. I can say that uh, I always use the same uh, limit for GMRS uh, resolution. So base um, accuracy. So basically. The number of iteration that I use for the maximum number of iteration for the GMRS is always the same. And if I have convergence, usually I obtain the same convergence with the with the same number of GMRS uh, iteration. I did not uh, make the uh, a, a 
precise study, so I, I am not 100% uh, sure of that, but I am pretty confident of that. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think I think it be reduced because not the memory size. I think if the amount of the calculation may be smaller, probably it's, it's it can fun. be it yeah, can, can be possible. Can be, I guess, yeah, yeah. It, can be it depends. For example, if the numerical convergence is achieved in uh, ten times iteration, or you need a uh, hundred times, then see calculation computing time is much quite different. That's why uh, I'm curious in this point. Yes, yes. Now, on the other hand, we are not touching the the matrices in the GMRS. We are only touching the other matrices. So there are also some other uh, developments for the GMRS uh, improvement in convergence. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, they are related to other matrices. They are not related with, with the matrices uh, uh, with which we, we worked. But this is interesting. I mean, uh, this this is from the numerical point of view. Yes, it, it is powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and do you have any question from the audience? By the way, if not, uh, I think it's time to start to move to the next session. Thank you very much, Federico. It was a nice talk. Thank you. Yeah. So the next. Uh, next speaker, or oh, before moving to the next speaker, there will be a uh, room, second room will be open if you are interested, uh, those who are interested in uh, Dr. Do Dominga Gitara, please move to uh, room two. In the main, main room, we will have a next speaker, uh, Dr. Alexis Par Parmakalides, sorry if I pronounced wrong. Um, but uh, Alexis, do you Alexis do you hi there? Can do you share the screen? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. You. Okay. Yeah. Now you um, have our attention. Yeah, that that was a good job at, at trying the the surname. It's a tough one. Um. Also, a PhD candidate, not quite a doctor yet, but thank you for uh, <laughs> maybe hopefully predicting the correct the correct outcome. Uh, so yeah, my name is Alexander Pharmakalidis. Um, I, I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Cambridge and uh, funded by Tokamak Energy, uh, one of the companies in the UK trying to trying to achieve uh, fusion. So my work is more on uh, fundamental numerics side of things, trying to find uh, better schemes of, of simulating uh, plasma, simulating uh, MHD. Uh, and this talk is going to focus on a specific scheme that together with uh, another colleague of mine at the lab, Ricardo de Mate, under the supervision of uh, Dr. Nico, Professor Nikos Nikiforakis, uh, we developed this scheme uh, for <clears throat> magnetically dominated uh, viscoresistive MHD. So, quickly jumping to the to the equations that that we're solving. Uh, so it's the the viscoresistive MHD system of equations uh, in fully conservative form. So we have obviously an evolution equation for the for the density for the for the momentum uh, that is coupled to the Maxwell equation, so the magnetic field feeds in there. Then we also have evolution for the for the total energy and, of course, the, the magnetic field. So then we also have viscoresistive effects, which uh, on the right uh, are denoted by the, the F tensor, uh, the F viscoresistive tensor, and in here come viscous effects as well as uh, heat flux uh, and resistive effects. Um, so the, the purpose of, of this talk is, is basically how, how can you solve these equations in an efficient uh, and accurate uh, manner. Um, typically in, in, our, in our group, we focus on using fully explicit methods. Now, I don't know if uh, people here are familiar because mainly implicit methods are used, but when you use fully explicit methods, um, they're, they're not very good for long time simulations. Now, we want to study things like, like ELMs and VDEs, and these typically occur very gradually from some near steady state uh, solution for the for the plasma that will slowly gradually build up uh, into into some instability we specialize in, in explicit methods because they they are uh, very very good at capturing shocks shock waves discontinuous solutions uh, and they respect the underlying mathematical properties of of the systems of, of equations but they have severe limitations in these kind of regimes um, one, one of which is the unfeasible simulation times because you need to take so many time steps. Essentially, the time step of your simulation 
is uh, limited by the fastest waves. Uh, and of course, with viscoresistive MHD, these, these fast waves can be uh, not so much of interest physically, but they are there and you have to resolve them with a fully explicit method. So your time step is severely restricted. And of course, in the low Mach number incompressible regime, uh, explicit methods have an incorrect scaling for the uh, numerical viscosity, and, and this can lead to, to inaccurate solutions uh, over the course of a simulation. So as I mentioned, fast waves uh, can be not so important for, for the phenomena that we're trying to study. And so some form of implicit treatment can help with this. Um, so our aim is basically to design a semi-implicit MHD scheme with the following in mind. So we want to solve, we want to still solve the, the equations in the conservative form so that we can retain the shock capturing capabilities that, that the fully explicit schemes are, you know, so commonly known for uh, and, and loved for. Uh, then we want to treat fast terms implicitly so that we remove their constraint on the CFL condition. The CFL condition is is a sort of stability constraint for the, the time step that you can take during simulation. And so this involves treating implicitly magnetosonic waves, alpha N waves potentially, uh, sound waves and, and diffusive waves relating to viscosity and uh, resistivity. Also, when uh, dealing with the MHD equations in, um, in conservative form, you have to deal with this uh, divergence constraint of course, there are no magnetic monopoles in nature, so we have to enforce uh, div b equals zero. Um, so in order to, to go about this, uh, based on previous work in the literature involving uh, flux vector splitting, um, we, we looked for a, a suitable flux vector splitting of the MHD equations that can give us something that we can work on to, to uh, arrive at the scheme that, that I'm outlining here. So based on a, on a paper uh, a few years back by Balsara et al, um, if you split the flux in the following way so that you have two subsystems. So on the left here, we have the convective subsystem, which essentially contains advective terms for all the, all the, uh, all the, all the uh, primitive variables in the equations. And on the right-hand side, we have the so-called pressure subsystem. In the pressure subsystem, we have um, terms relating to the, to the magnetic pressure, uh, and the gas pressure. So the whole point of splitting the flux like this is uh, that when you analyze the eigenvalues of the left subsystem, the advective subsystem, you find that they are only uh, the, the fluid velocity. So if you were to treat this subsystem explicitly, then your time step is only restricted by the, the fluid flow velocity. On the other hand, the pressure and magnetic subsystem, which contain all the fast waves, essentially, is treated implicitly. And this is this is something that we we want. Furthermore, this this um, this way of splitting the flux was analyzed in this paper, and it was found to have uh, desirable mathematical properties relating to the hyperbolicity of the of the equations and and such like. So what's the what's the methodology? So we we take basically um, our our state at time n, and we do the the explicit update. Uh, we use a simple simple centered Rusinov flux, uh, which is which is commonly used in the literature. Um, we do this because the convective system is not strictly hyperbolic. It's it's pretty much well behaved, but it theoretically it's not strictly hyperbolic. Um, a simple Rusinov flux uh, is is enough to to update to an in intermediate state vector Q star. So we take our state QN, we apply the advective flux update, and we arrive at Q star. Then the uh, the implicit Subsystem is is a little bit more involved. Um, this here uh, picture denotes the algorithm, and I'll take you through a little bit step by step. I know it's difficult to read uh, on the screen there, and I'll, I'll break it up into smaller pieces. But first, I want to talk about what exactly we're doing, and then I'll go back to the the specifics of the al algorithm. So what we do is we try to linearize the the, the right hand the the pressure subsystem uh, through the use of a Picard iteration scheme. So we treat nonlinear terms as, as Picard variables, and we we march uh, this Picard iteration scheme until we find some convergence. At each iteration, we solve uh, a linear system using standard techniques, maybe Jimres uh, or Big Stab, uh, both of them suffice. Now, within the double-nested algorithm, uh, first of all, we solve for the magnetic field um, through the substitution of, of velocity. We update the magnetic field and the velocity, and then we substitute these into the pressure equation and solve for the for the unknown pressure. Basically, this is repeated until convergence, and we find generally that within 
uh, one overall um, one overall iteration for for both SIPs systems, and then two for each uh, two iterations for let's say the magnetic field and two for the pressure is enough to to um, find convergence. Um, now, if we were to use a more general equation of state, uh, here we're using an ideal gas equation of state. If we were to use a more general one, uh, this would require a nested Newton uh, algorithm for the for the pressure, but that is definitely something that that can be done. So, looking more at the uh, the anagram I showed previously, um, so we start with our intermediate state here, U star. We uh, we take the momentum equations and we basically implicitly discretize the magnetic field and we take the pressure explicitly here. We insert into the magne magnetic evolution equations and we solve the linear system as said. Uh, then uh, of course we have the divergence constraint to, to satisfy and I will talk a little bit about what we do there in a second uh, so that we ensure that divergence of B is equal zero. And then of course we have, we have the next Picard iteration uh, magnetic field. This is then fed into the uh, momentum equations, which are discretized implicitly, and substituted into the into the energy equation, which is rearranged for the unknown pressure. Okay. Once we have the the pressure, we can repeat this cycle until convergence. As I said, usually one or two uh, iterations of the full algorithm uh, are are required. As an example of of what the evolution, sorry, of what the the equations look like when you substitute the momentum, uh, it looks like this, um, and we have analogous expressions for for solving for the pressure, um, and essentially this this then is rearranged uh, in the corresponding a x equal b uh, linear system uh, form, which can be solved using standard uh, linear solvers. As I mentioned, uh, how do we basically enforce the divergence to be zero. Uh, we use a discrete form of, of the Faraday induction equation. Um, so taking essentially that uh, the uh, the time derivative of B is equal to to the to the curl of E. Um, essentially what we need then is uh, the electric field and there is a common um, method used in the in the literature called the constraint transport methodology. Uh, where essentially you you stagger your magnetic field onto cell faces, and then you you compute electric fields on the cell corners, and these can then be uh, used to update the magnetic field. If you use the electric field on the corners to update magnetic field on the faces in a consistent manner, uh, discreetly your divergence will be uh, zero. Of course, it's uh, not exactly zero, but it's up to machine pre precision, ten to the minus fifteen, ten to the minus sixteen. Uh, levels. Alex, you have uh, five more minutes. Okay. Um, so we basically took a, a well-known algorithm, um, which here involves derivatives of the electric field. And these these are computed uh, using our, our state from coming from the linear solve. So we basically, we predict the magnetic field as a solution of the linear system. And we input this into the into the constraint transport to give us then the corrected divergence-free uh, magnetic field. I'm just going to skip over this in the interest of time. Um, but but yeah, also we we uh, discretize implicitly the, the viscous and resistive effects, as I, as I mentioned. Um, and these are essentially terms which are added to the, to the linear system uh, and solved for uh, using the standard linear solvers. So just to provide some numerical solutions. Um, so we... We like to benchmark with a number of uh, case studies from ranging from high to low Mach number and anything in between. So some standard benchmark uh, one-dimensional Riemann problems for the MHD equations. These are very, very tough um, problems to, to solve and usually only explicit, fully explicit methods can, can capture the, the regions of, the, of interest and accurate, provide accurate solutions. So you can see that with our methodology here shown in points against the exact solution in, in black line, uh, we are able to match very well uh, and capture the positions of the of the shocks and and everything is uh, seems to be working well. Moving on to two dimensional uh, test cases, the Orsac tank problem uh, really tests here the ability of the scheme to capture uh, shock to shock transitions and transitions to, to supersonic turbulence. Um, 
and uh, it, clearly our scheme here is able to to capture the beha behavior quite well if you compare it to literature uh, it, it agrees very well and also the divergence of the magnetic field is maintained uh, to machine precision levels uh, moving on to another test case is the mhd rotor again this uh, tests the shock capturing capabilities and the ability to deal with the divergence constraint uh, more something similar to to what uh, the fusion community you might know is uh, here we have a, an advected theta pinch equilibrium problem, um, which is essentially a, a force balance gradient pressure equal J cross B type of, of scenario. And here we compare how does this R scheme compare to a, a, a fully explicit scheme. And you can see on the right here that depending on the initial value of the, of the magnetic field, so how strongly magnetized the plasma is, um, explicit schemes, uh, essentially the error uh, increases as it does the simulation time, whereas here with the blue crosses, our scheme is really able to to essentially stay stay the same same simulation time and same same level of error. And this is <clears throat> this is because we are able to to take the same time step, which is based only on the fluid velocity and and not to do with the fast waves uh, of the system. Uh, some more validation test cases: current sheets and uh, viscoresistive Kelvin Helmholtz case. I know I'm firing through these, but in the interest of time, we can come back to them if anyone has questions. Um, these are, again, more validation cases uh, compared to literature, uh, which agree very well. Um, also, we've we've carried out a lid-driven cavity with, with an imposed magnetic field to assess how can uh, our scheme deal with complex boundary conditions and also in, in, the, in the incompressible regime. Um, and this is interesting to the fusion community because uh, if if a different equation of state were used, um, one could indeed uh, simulate something like liquid lithium, uh, which is in the in the blanket um, of, of the tokamak. Um, again, these agree quite well with literature, and and that's really positive. And um, we were happy to find these results. And as a final test case, uh, I want to show the the so called plasma washing machine, uh, in which we took we took the lid driven cavity, we imposed a magnetic field. And we started to uh, ramp up the lid velocity. So starting from from near zero, so near steady state, ramping up the uh, the lid velocity to supersonic uh, Mach number, and then ramping back down to to a steady state. And this test is basically to to really test the all Mach number capabilities of the scheme. Is it able to start from a near steady state, go to something that is, you know, very kind of violent, and then go back to to something like a steady state? And indeed here, so three different times uh, at the top right is, is uh, near steady state at the beginning, which closely matches literature. Then as the lid velocity speeds up, you can see that the flow accelerates and uh, uh, a recirculation zone grows in the bottom right. And then again, as, as the lid velocity is ramped down, the flow reaches a sort of steady state, um, quite symmetric uh, flow pattern. Uh, just showing you what the magnetic field here is doing. Uh, it's basically advected with the flow. It's a Z-oriented magnetic field, so it doesn't influence the flow, but it's just advected with it, and it acts as a kind of tracer, uh, hence why it's called the plasma washing machine, because the plasma is is uh, moving round and round inside the domain following the, the velocity profile. Uh, so just to wrap up, um, so we've uh, designed here a scheme uh, based on a on a splitting of the MHG equations, which is found to have good mathematical properties. We treat fast waves implicitly, and so our CFL constraint is only constrained by the uh, the fluid velocity. We've validated the scheme for for low, high, and all Mach number regimes, and this scheme is is really quite well suited to to highly magnetized um, highly magnetized low Mach flow, which is what what you would find in a tokamak in uh, sort of instabilities that that form there. Uh, future work will involve uh, putting in complex boundaries, so something like a complex uh, geometry wall, um, and we have some ideas how to do that. We would also like to extend the scheme to higher order in space and time. At the moment, it's second order in, in space and first order in time. Uh, we'd like to include more physics through additional source terms, uh, potentially trying to, to model the two fluid equations, as I mentioned. Um, also, a more complex equation of state would be really uh, useful. And finally, we'd like to simulate some some more realistic uh, plasma test cases like like edge localized modes or or vertical displacement events. So that's all from me. Thank you for listening, and uh, I'll take any questions.
Thank you very much. It's nice. Uh, it's an interesting talk as well. So first the audience, do you have uh, any question? If you have any, please write in chat or raise the hand so that you can speak. If not, uh, meanwhile, yeah, I I have a question about uh, the test. The yeah, the your your work interesting about the test of high Mach number with the Osjak Tang uh, test. Can you go go to the previous one? Yeah, go up. This one Osjak Tang. This previous one, go up. Yeah, this one. How so? Black line is the ideal the solution. You said. What, yes. what does it mean, red and blue? And how can I read uh, this? Figure? Yes, so essentially here, I, so I'm showing the solution for the for the vertical magnetic field. Okay. Uh, the black is the exact solution, is a, is a reference solution uh, computed with a very, very high number of cells using standard explicit schemes. And the blue and red here is showing uh, the difference whether I choose a time step restricted by the velocity or a time step restricted by the fast waves, because with our scheme, you're free to choose, you know, you can choose the time step restricted by the velocity, but maybe you want to resolve dynamics, which are fast. Um, but what we show here is two different choices for the time step. Uh, I believe uh, blue is is uh, with the velocity and red is with with the um, using the fast waves. Mm -hmm. And we show here that they produce pretty much uh, the same the same result. So for some cases, it will produce the same result. Uh, in other cases, it may diffuse the solution slightly because uh, the dynamics are really driven by the fast waves. Uh, so, so this is the point of the red and blue here. Okay. Uh, the next next figure, by the way, how do you assess the shock capturing properly work or work or not? How how do you assess this? Yeah. By this so the, this this here tests are are really. For that purpose, uh, there are there are strong so a shock here. You can see there are multiple shocks um, in in these problems. The right and, one at the x-axis, 0.5 and 0.7. It's yeah, looks up. yeah. So 0.5 and 0.7. Of course, this this is a low res. I'm showing the results with running at a quite low resolution. Uh, if I run higher resolution, it, it it matches very very well. The point though is when you showcase benchmarks like this you you want to you want to be able to see how is the scheme you know converging slowly to the to the correct solution mm -hmm. um, well that's well that's interesting interesting work interesting work yeah not, maybe not directly related to to the field but the, the oh, more it's, fundamental... important, it's important this kind of activity also important yeah. uh, see important step yeah. Uh, now, sorry, it's time to move on. It seems there's another question in the chat, Federic, by Federico. You can uh, you can continue the discussion in the chat, but please let me go uh, proceed uh, to introduce next speaker. Next, thank you very much, Alex. Next you, speaker is uh, uh, Shudong. I hope the panel. Pronunciation is okay. Shudong Keling, could you share the screen and start? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You can start. Can, can you see the screen? Yeah. So hello everyone. I'm Shudong, and I'm also from the University of Cambridge. Uh, and following my colleagues' work today, I will present my work, which is uh, novel algorithms for the two fluid plasma equations. Uh, so the motivation of using the two fluid plasma model is because it is applicable in a regime between kinetic and MHT models. It is valid in regimes with small time and length scales, such as the Larmor radius or the plasma frequencies. It captures important physical phenomena that sometimes are more difficult to capture with MHT models, such as charge separation or self-generative electromagnetic fields. And compared to kinetic models, uh, it has lower dimensionality, and this could mean that uh, they could be cheaper than kinetic models. So basically, the objective of this project is to extend the validity of fluid models and bridge the gap between MHD models and kinetic models. 
However, there are some problems, uh, and these are related to the computational costs related to the small time scales. And these are introduced as Steve source terms, which lead to a small CFN number. And also because of the speed of light constraint, which is higher than the fluid speeds. And if we're using a fully explicit time integration scheme, that could be very expensive. And finally, we also want to use divergence-free methods. So currently in the literature, people tend to use hyperbolic divergence cleaning for the two fluid plasma model. Although divergence cleaning works quite well with MST models, it sometimes doesn't work very well with the two fluid plasma model because divergence errors are not completely removed and there are hyperparameters that need to be tuned. So these are the equations that I'm modeling, which are the ideal five moment to fluid plasma equations. The first three equations are the fluid equations for the density, for the momentum, and for the energy. The last two equations are the Maxwell equations, here written in a conservative form. And here you can see here C is the speed of light, which is higher than the fluid speeds. On the right hand side, we have source terms, which can be stiff if we're considering a large charge to mass ratio or small Larmor radius here. Additionally, we have two divergence constraints, one for the electric field and one for the magnetic field. So the numerical approach used, so you might heard my colleague before that would try to use finite volume methods for their shock capturing properties. And for the fluid equations, I will be using a standard second order TVD reconstruction, and I will be using an explicit uh, temporal disc discretization. And for the Maxwell equations, here comes the innovations where I will be using divergence free methods. And the, I will be using two. And the first one is the finite difference tandem method or the image. And specifically, I will be using a chronicle source scheme to relax the speed of light constraint. And the second divergence free method used is the finite volume tandem method, uh, mainly developed by Balsara and collaborators. And the advantage of using the finite volume tandem method is, is that one can achieve very high order of accuracy quite easily. So I, I will be using a second order TBD reconstruction or a third order Wiener reconstruction. I will be using a multidimensional remote solver. And since these methods are frequently used as explicit, I will, I will also use an explicit discretization, but to relax the speed of light constraint, I will be using subcycling. And finally, for the source terms, I will be using strong splitting and an implicit method to relax the CFA constraint. So here I'm showing some details on the implicit source treatment, but I won't go through the details. The important thing is that this update allows a high CFA number, and this, uh, this has been used by other people in the literature to solve these equations. The innovations of this work is to introduce these divergence-free techniques. And the first one is the finite difference tandem method, where the electric field is discretized at the cell faces and the magnetic field is discretized at, at the cell edges. And here I'm showing um, the second order quantical source scheme for the electric and the magnetic field. And these two equations can be rearranged into a single implicit equation shown in the equation 14 here. And this implicit update relaxes the speed of light constraint. The second uh, diversion free method used was the finite volume tandem method. And you can see here that both the electric and the magnetic field are defined at the cell faces. Here, and as, as an example, I'm showing the explicit update for the X components in 2D. And you can see here some uh, star states on the right hand side. And these star states are from the multidimensional remote solver. But I won't give all the details here. And as you can see, this is an explicit update, which is constrained by the speed of light. And to relax the, this constraint for the whole system, I will subcycle the Maxwell equations. 
And finally, the last innovation is to use projection methods because you might notice that uh, I'm solving the source terms of the electric field at cell centers, but I'm solving the curl of the electric field at cell faces. So averaging between cell faces and cell centers introduces electric divergence errors, and this can be removed by using these projection methods, which is basically solving equation 18 for the Laplacian of a potential. And with this, one can recover the constraint preserving electric field. So here I have uh, a description of the overall algorithm. So since I'm using strong splitting, I first update the source terms at cell centers using delta t over two, restricted by the fluid speed. Then in point three, I'm, I'm updating the fluid variables using a delta t fluid. And the next step would be choosing either a finite difference tandem method or a finite volume tandem method. And for the first one, it, it, this is an, an implicit update using a big delta T fluid. And for the second one, I will be using some cycling for the small delta T C, which is restricted by the speed of light. And finally, I will be updating again the source terms in point six. And lastly, I will use projection methods to reduce any divergence errors created. Uh, some results here. So as you might know, we're using the AMREX computational framework, which is developed by the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Uh, I'm using uh, parallelization using MPI. And most of my simulations are run using 16 cores. So they are somehow cheap. And the aim will be to compare the two divergence-free methods. The first one, the implicit finite difference 10 domain, and the second one, the explicit finite volume 10 domain with subcycling. And both of them relaxes the speed of light constraint. Uh, for the finite volume 10 domain results, I will mainly show or results using the second order TVD reconstruction. And sometimes as a reference, I will also show some results using divergence cleaning and finite volume 10 domain methods without subcycling. So the first test is the Brian Wu test. And you can see here the results. So I'm showing in blue and green the finite volume tandem methods without and with subcycling. And in red, I'm showing the implicit finite difference tandem method. And also as a reference solution, uh, a solution from a paper using very, very high resolution. And you can see here that uh, the, the approach to the reference solution quite well. Here I'm showing another test problem for, for the same test, but in another regime. And you can see here that um, the blue and green, which are the finite volume tandem methods, uh, they, they capture the, the reference solution better than the implicit finite difference tandem method. And for, for this test, actually the finite volume tandem method uh, were more accurate and more stable. Here I'm showing the computational times and the number of, step, of steps. And you can see here that when using subcycling or when using an implicit time stepping, the number of steps are, are reduced. So do the computational times. And for this problem, the maximum fluid speed is about half of the speed of light. So subcycling is quite efficient, as you can see here, which has the lowest computational time. The next problem is the ideal MHD or certain vortex. So this is uh, a problem in the ideal MHD regime, which can be modeled using a small Lamar radius shown here. So I'm using a Lamar radius of 0.01. Here I'm showing the results on the left, results using divergence cleaning. On the right, results using finite volume tandem method with subcycling. And you can see that the both of them, uh, they have very similar results. So one, one of you might ask, why do we need to use divergence-free methods if divergence cleaning also works well? Well, the problem is that with divergence cleaning here, it requires some parameter tuning, and also it was more expensive than the finite volume tandem method. Here, I'm, again, I'm comparing the divergence cleaning method with the implicit finite difference tandem method. And you can see here on the right, um, 
the features are captured better with the implicit final difference tandem method. And if it, these features could, be, could only be captured with divergence cleaning methods when we increase the resolution as shown here. So on the right, this is an increased resolution, but on the left, this is a lower resolution. Uh, here I'm showing the computational times and the number of steps. So again, using subcycling and implicit time stepping, the number of steps are greatly, are greatly reduced and also the computational times. And just as an example, uh, for the high resolution divergence cleaning method, that took more than 7,000 seconds to run, which is about 35 times more than the lower resolution implicit finite difference time method, which is this tool. So the, the left one it took 34, 35 times more to run. And for this problem, um, the, the maximum fluid speed is about one fourth of the speed of light. And when the speed of light is much higher than the fluid speeds, the subcycling loop becomes more expensive and the implicit time stepping becomes more, more efficient. As you can see here that the CPU time per step is lower for the implicit one. Finally, the last problem is the magnetic reconnection challenge. And here I'm comparing um, the explicit finite volume time domain with subcycling and the implicit finite difference time domain. And I'm showing here the IO momentum with a not very high resolution. And you, you can see here that uh, on the right, the finite difference time domain method, it could capture the central magnetic island. And the same can be seen here showing the electron momentum. And with the finite volume time domain method, it can capture the magnetic island if we increase the resolution as seen here. So here the resolution is increased and you can see that the Manity Island could be captured. The same can be seen here uh, when showing the electron momentum. And finally, I'm showing some reconnective fluxes with increasing resolution. So you can see here on the right, um, the reconnective fluxes converges to basically the same for the implicit finite difference time domain, but it doesn't really converge very fast for the final volume time domain methods. Next, I will show the final volume time domain methods, but in this case, I'm using Wino. So before I was showing with second order TVD, and now I will, I'm showing with the third order Wino. And you can see that it does converge. And just a comparison on the right using the same resolution, you can see here the red and the green curves, they, they are basically the same. And these are the finite volume time domain we know and the finite difference time domain method. So they both give the same reconnective flux. And finally, uh, this is showing the reconnective fluxes again using a lower resolution, using about 250, 100 uh, times 130 cells. And these are compared to a reference solution from a paper using a much higher a much higher resolution and you can see here that in green the final difference time domain case uh it can capture well it, it gives a very similar reconnective flux compared to the reference solution so some conclusions at the end so in this work uh the speed of light constraint was relaxed and divergence free methods were used in general, the implicit finite difference time method was more efficient for most problems, but not for problems with very strong initial discontinuities, such as the Brion Wu test. Uh, I haven't shown many results using finite volume time method with Wino because of the space and time constraint, but in general, uh, it is more efficient than the second order case. However, they are less efficient than the finite difference time domain case. However, one of the advantages of using the finite volume time domain method is that one can achieve high order accuracy. So maybe if I use a high order we know it might become more efficient, but not, that needs to be explored next. Uh, one of the next steps is to consider the 10 moment to fluid plasma model. 
So currently I'm considering the five moment model, which assumes local thermal equilibrium. And uh, when considering higher moment models, um, I can describe the deviation from the local thermal equilibrium. And that's all for me. And I want to thank finally my supervisors and also other lab members and to thank my uh, my funding sources. And thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I, I'm happy to answer. Okay, thank you, Shudon. It was nice uh, talk as well. Uh, for the audience, do you have any question or if you want to say something, please raise the hand. It seems there's a question from Federico. I read it. Question for Shudon. Nice talk, thanks. And indeed, IFDTD and or FVTD necessarily limited to hexahedric head curl shape elements? Uh, well, so currently, uh, so our group focuses on so capturing explicit methods using Cartesian mesh. So uh, we're not really considering hexahedral shape, but in that case, uh, maybe other methods could be considered. But for Cartesian mesh, uh, uh, the methods that I have mentioned are quite traditional and popular. Uh -huh. Okay, that's nice. Yeah, thanks. I have a small, uh, small question. You mentioned two fluid, two fluid, uh, two fluid uh, simulation. In the beginning of the slide, you say uh, bridge. Probably this is not the focus of this uh, talk, but uh, I just wanted bridging the gap between fluid and kinetic model. Would you, what what do you mean? Would you say something more, something comment on this? So so basically, uh, what people tend to use either an MHD model or a kinetic or a general kinetic model, but these two are quite different, and mm. so that's the aim of using this model, which is the two fluid plasma model, because it is somehow in between them and it is still a fluid it is still a fluid model, but it tries it is closer than the kinetic models compared to standard MHD models. Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. It seems it's time. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, so Good afternoon, everybody. And again, welcome to this second part of uh, the workshop. Um, I will chair this session that is called Liquid Metal MHD. So it is devoted to uh, magnetic hydrodynamics uh, developments and assessments. Uh, in this session, we will have uh, three talks. Uh, the first one is an invited talks that will take 25 minutes plus five uh, questions. So remember to switch off your microphone, please. And after you can uh, do your uh, questions by raising your hand or by uh, putting your question inside the chat. Remember also that at uh, uh, 2.30, uh, there will be start also a, a parallel session called code optimization. So you, can, you will be able to switch following the um, procedure that is will be uh, put it inside the, the chat. So uh, we can start with the first speaker of this session, that is Dr. Fernando Rocorgorri from CMAT. And his talk is um, called Accuracy and Scalability of Incompressible Inductionless MHD Codes Applied to Fusion Technologies. So please, Dr. Roca, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Palermo. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. OK, so I'll share my screen. Yeah, so. Yep. Okay. So, is it working? Yes. Yes. Great. So, well, I I would like to start uh, thanking the organized committee for giving the giving me the opportunity to to give this talk. And this work has been done in in, co in collaboration between CMAT and the International Center for Numerical Methods in Engineering, together with other colleagues from universities. And I will start uh, the talk by introducing the, the problem at hand, which is the MHD problem in applied to, to fusion technologies, in particular to fusion breathing blankets, and why uh, this problem requires of, of HPC techniques, why it's so 
uh, computationally demanding. I will enter a bit in in a, in a numerical reason for that, which is the charge conservation issue for, for some codes. And in the second half of the talk, I will compare uh, in relatively simple cases, uh, the performance of uh, uh, two codes, a commercial plat platform, uh, Fluent, widely used in, in CFD, and uh, another code uh, called GridApp, MHD, we, that we have been developing since the last couple of years. And both codes uh, approach the, the problem in a very different way. So uh, the MHD problems in, in blankets, so uh, the green blanket is in, in this picture is this gray component uh, is located in, in Tokamaks here. And uh, it is therefore uh, immersed in, in the magnetic field used for the plasma confinement, uh, whose strong component is the toroidal component. And in in some uh, concepts, in some green blanket concept, there are uh, a liquid metal flow uh, flowing through this uh, through this this blanket through this component. And depending on the design, in different directions, but it is usual that the toroidal uh, magnetic field and the lead lithium flow are uh, perpendicularly oriented. So we have a, a very good electrical conductor, the liquid metal, immersed in a in a magnetic field, so we have uh, induced currents, electric currents in, in the bulk of the, of the fluid that will generate a lot of forces that affects the dynamic of the fluid. So this, uh, this MHD uh, is a multi-physics effect that couples hydrodynamics and electromagnetics. Uh, how we model this uh, from the mathematical perspective, but well, the relatively a straightforward approach. We simply introduce a new uh, volumetric source in the number of stock equation, which is the, the momentum, uh, the equation that describes the dynamics of incompressible flow fluids like uh, lead lithium. Uh, so the Lorentz force is a new volumetric source uh, in this equation. And when we write this equation in dimensionless form, uh, the two dimensionless numbers arise. Uh, the most noticeable is the Hartmann number, whose square is the ratio between Lorentz and viscous forces, and it mainly represents the intensity of the external magnetic field. In, in fusion, uh, normally uh, we can uh, uh, use the so called inductionless regime, uh, which is, uh, by the way, the in, in some sense, the opposite regime of the uh, of the MHD equation solved in, in plasma. And uh, in this regime, the, the external magnetic field uh, can be considered constant. Induced magnetic fields are, are much more weaker. And the generalized Ohm's law, the electric currents follow, follow this, this equation. And we close the system of equation by imposing mass conservation and char electric charge conservation. So we have a system of eight equations and eight variables. And why this uh, system requires of, uh, of HPC? Well, first, uh, you, you may imagine that since we have a, a bigger system of equation, we have more variables so than regular hydrodynamics. So we need more, uh, more resources. Uh, but there are more reasons. The, the first one that I, want, that I want to mention is the is a spatial resolution reason. To, to illustrate this, uh, let's consider a fluid uh, in the direction perpendicular to the screen, and the magnetic field is transversal to, to, this, to this channel, to this uh, rectangular section channel. In most of the cross-section, uh, the, the electric currents will in, be induced in, in a direction perpendicular to both fields, which is called the core flow. But since the chart is conserved and the currents need to close, if the, um, the channel is electrically insulated, the, the currents close inside the, the cross-section of the fluid. And when we increase the, 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 the Harman number, the magnetic field, uh, the, the boundary layers in which the currents close which are the only regions in which viscous forces are relevant, 
become thinner and thinner and thinner. And for Hamann numbers of the order of 10 to the fourth, which are, which are the typical order of magnitude for fusion technology application, these boundary layers can be as thin as a few uh, dozen of, of microns. So we need a, a mesh agree that it's able to capture the physics in the boundary layers to get uh, accurate physical solutions. This situation is, is equally demanding or, or even more demanding if uh, the walls are electrically conducting, since some currents will close their path through the walls, but we need to compute accurately the fraction of, of currents that, that closes through the fluid and through the solid to, um, to compute uh, with sufficient, sufficient accuracy the pressure drop. So at the end, very high mesh resolution are needed, very high, very fine meshes are needed, and, and the problem is, is quite big uh, because of this. Time resolution could, could be also a, a constraint, especially if we are interested in the transient solution. And also for explicit solvers, they require uh, quite a small uh, time steps. But uh, this is not the only reason why why we we need uh, very fine meshes, and, and the problem is is big, and we need to to solve it uh, with HPC. But there is a numerical reason for uh, for most codes, which is the uh, is the the, chart, the charge conservation issue. And what what do I mean is that um, when we try to to solve this uh, system of equation using a finite volume method, which is a very common approach since the problem is written in in terms of of uh, continuity equations, uh, <clears throat> uh, then uh, a very normal approach is to apply the the divergence of Joe of, of J in the Ohm's law and obtain a Poisson equation for the electric potential. And in this way, uh, we waive the, the dependence with J and we have only five equations with five variables. This is called a fee formulation. And to solve this, this equation, uh, a lot of codes follow a staggered scheme in which uh, the Poisson equation is solved first and then we, the code reconstructs the the current, the electric current, computes the Lorentz force and solves the momentum mass conservation coupling with the standard techniques like simple like schemes. And the thing with with this approach, which is I, which is as I said, uh, very popular, is that charge is not necessarily conserved at discrete level, since we uh, have uh, hidden the the charge into this Poisson equation. And the, the, this charge conservation issues uh, arises uh, mainly because of two factors. Um, to illustrate the first one, uh, we can consider a, a fully developed flow along the x direction and a magnetic field along the y direction. And if, if you do the math uh, in the Ohm's law and in the Lorentz force, you see that both are computed as a differentiation uh, of two numbers. And it, it can be proven that when when we increase the Hamann number, these two numbers become closer and closer and closer. The, the difference becomes smaller. And it is uh, very it is necessary to 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 resolve this difference accurately. And any any truncation error coming from, from the Poisson equation difference in the electric potential can accumulate when reconstructing the, the current and lead to, to, to solutions that do not preserve charge, so no physical solution. Okay, uh, and there is another important uh, another important reason, uh, which is the interpolation uh, errors that occur when, when reconstructing the electric current. For doing so, there are Mainly two options for the codes. Uh, since we know we need the the uh, Lorentz force as a volumetric source, so acting to the complete control volume, we need it in in the cell center. So we can reconstruct the current 
directly in the in the cell center. And in a typical uh, staggered mesh, in which the uh, velocity fluxes are defined in the phases and the scalars are defined in the center, uh, we we see that. We have we need the electric potential gradient and the and the velocity fluxes in the center, but we have it in the phases, so we have to interpolate them, and then to compute the the divergence of J, we need to know the electric currents in the phases, so we have to interpolate again, and this can generate errors. Uh, especially for for mesh with uh, with high skewness or or non uniform mesh with high aspect ratios. Uh, so yeah, so this this can be a problem. Uh, we have a, another option which is reconstruct the the current in the phase directly in the phase. So here we have the the variables where we want it, and we can impose, uh, we can compute uh, charge, charge conservation in the control volume easily, but when we want to compute the Lorentz force, we need the current in the center, and we either need to interpolate the current from the phases into the center, or to compute the terms of the Lorentz force. So in any case, uh, this option is, is the preferred one, uh, but it, it requires of, of uh, high order, um, high order schemes for the electrical potential calculation and a conservative scheme uh, it requires a more sophisticated uh, approach let's let's say but in any case uh, there will be always a mesh size and mesh quality limitation inherent to the to the fee formulation uh, so at the end we will have a very high messes and uh, and and yeah, the, this uh, and with this uh, and, and in fusion, we we are dealing with uh, arbitrary complex geometries. So we need to to use uh, tetrahedral. We need to use meshes with with uh, not the best quality, probably. So this is this is a, a constraint. And at the end, we have uh, we need uh, highly scalable codes uh, to to solve uh, MHD problems. Uh, uh, real uh, relevant uh, size. So now in the in the second uh, half of the talk, I will uh, show you a exercise of numerical experimentation with ANSYS Fluent. So Fluent features an MHD module, and it has some some advantages like a soft learning curve, and and it is compatible with with a, a lot of of modules from ANSYS. So Performing multiphysics analysis is it's uh, relatively straightforward, and the main disadvantage is is, is that the the source code is not available to the user. So uh, yeah, yeah, I reading the documentation, I'm I'm pretty sure that it reconstructs the current with with the first option I I mentioned, but I cannot be completely sure. And yeah, there have been some exercise of validations. Uh, for moderate harmons and uh, hexahedral meshes. So this, uh, um, I, I have considered a, a simple 3D problem of a square section channel with conducting walls and a re relatively high or moderate harmon number of 1000. I have considered four different meshes uh, one coarse mesh, two medium meshes, and one fine mesh. The difference between the two medium meshes is that uh, this one uh, presents a, a more aggressive uh, clustering of of cells towards the, the boundary layer. So this one has a higher spatial resolution uh, in the boundary layer, but it has a higher uh, aspect ratio, so the quality of the mesh is, is, is uh, smaller. Uh, I have also um, uh, used different time steps uh, for the so the transient calculation, but since Fluent um, uses an implicit uh, scheme, and uh, we are only interested in the in the state state solution, uh, I have not found significant difference. The solution of this problem is is 
well known is this uh, uh, M-shaped profile in which the flow becomes fully developed very rapidly uh, and the currents are cross-sectional. Uh, this uh, fully developed flow has been computed with the second tool I, I will uh, talk uh, later. And uh, we are qu quite confident in this solution so that I have used it for, comparing, for comparison. And I will uh, explain why. So first, uh, the convergence of, of the solution, uh, we have um, monitorized three different variables, pressures and maximal velocity, electric potential. Uh, well, we see that the convergence is slow. We need a lot of iterations to reach the steady state. Uh, the fine, the, the bigger the mesh is the higher the iterations we need. And also the, the accuracy is heavily depending on, on the mesh size. Uh, the solution we reach, we reach is different. And it, it is also curious that this uh, green curve, with, which is the the mesh with with uh, and with this extra bunching of nodes towards the the walls uh, exhibits a much slower convergence and uh, the accuracy is not increased. The solution is very similar to the one of the yellow curve, which is the the regular medium mesh. So this uh, mesh with with more resolution but less quality is, is not producing any beneficial effect. In terms of accuracy, we have compared the, the pressure gradient with this 2D fully developed solution. And, and we see that the medium and fine mesh uh, agrees well with the solution with a deviation below 1%. The other one do not. But uh, when comparing the velocity profiles, uh, we see that there is a significantly significant lack of accuracy especially in the side boundary layer, which is the one parallel to the magnetic field. And the fine mesh can replicate, replicate quite well the fully developed solution in the, in the Harman boundary layer and in the core flow. But in, in the side layer, there is still a, a significant deviation. The reason for this lack of accuracy uh, is the mentioned um, charge conservation issue. Indeed, if, if we plot the contours of the divergence of J, an absolute value, we see that it takes maximum values uh, next to the side boundary layers here. And these uh, values reduces when, when we increase the, the size of the mesh. But even in here, in the best scenario, uh, there's still some relatively high values here. And despite the charge is, is preserved uh, globally, locally, it is not. So these curvatures, these elbows in the currents are not uh, are very different from one mesh to the other. And it is what is creating this lack of accuracy. If we compare the shape of the currents with the fully developed solution, we see that very next to the wall, the, the solution is fine. And also in the core, but this uh, call to here is not well captured, not even by the fine mesh, and of course even worse for the medium medium mesh. Uh, we, we have also performed a, a simple strong scaling exercise in which we fix uh, the mesh and the magnetic field, and we increase the number of processors. And it, it seems like fluent scales uh, relatively well while we stay in the in the same node. Uh, we have to go. Uh, so in, in our case, it was uh, yeah, some uh, 36 processors. If we have to go to, to two nodes to increase the number of processors, uh, yeah, we, we lose the scalability. Uh, and if we use the Intel uh, hyper-threading, we, we also lost the scalability. Uh, on top of that, uh, we also have performed uh, an scaling exercise in which we fix the the mesh size and we increase the, the Hamann number and we can see that the solving time grows with Hamann to the one third and the iteration needing, since the, the iteration needs to reach the steady state increases with Hamann number. So uh, when we increase the Hamann number, not only we need a finer mesh, but we also need uh, more iterations. So now I will move uh, to the to the other tool with this grid app MHD. 
and grid up image you have five minutes five okay minutes. perfect perfect okay. thank you and uh, this um this tool, uh, as I mentioned, um, approached the problem very differently since it solved the complete set of eight equations in a, with a monolithic approach. So it, it solved it simultaneously. And that way, a uh, chart is, is guaranteed at discrete level since we are including the chart conservation equation. Grid um, MHD is an open source code uh, you can find it here. Uh, it's built with the grid up finite element library and based in the formulation by Lee. Uh, and it used for the J block uh, a HD uh, test spaces. And the elements are uh, Revietoma polynomial space of order one. And with this formulation, we ensure this uh, nice child conservation uh, property. Um, the status of the code is still uh, under development. Uh, we have uh, validated here uh, the code for, for 2D cases against analytical solutions, and we are validating the code with 3D geometries against experimental data. And as I mentioned, it uses this monolithic approach for the steady state solution. And the linear solver for the solver for the linear problem uh, is taken from uh, from a pe from Petsy library, it's MUMS. Uh, which is a direct solver, very robust solver, but uh, not very efficient. And yeah, and, and this is the fully developed solution uh, I talked earlier, and this M shape profile, and and you can see that the the divergence of J is very uh, a lot of orders of magnitude uh, smaller than in in the other case. So we are quite confident that this solution is is physical. What is the price to pay for this nice? The price to pay for this nice formulation is that the the size of the problem is, is very big. Uh, here is an example of um, of an expansion of a three D geometry which we are using for validation, and uh, the mesh is relatively small since in this case Harman is small, and even with only fifty six k l hexahedrals we have uh, over 3 millions of degrees of freedom. So the, in terms of memory, this approach is, is really costly. My colleagues from Simne has also performed on a stronger scaling uh, test and a weaker scaling test. And they found that the computation of residual and the Jacobian uh, scales quite well up to hundreds of, of processors. But the solve, this, this solve from Petsy, uh, do not scale uh, scales uh, particularly well. So we are right now uh, trying to develop an iterative uh, solver uh, based with uh, with block preconditioners, trying to solve this limitation and the memory limitation. Uh, the um, the um, when we increase the Hamel number for for a given mesh size, we also see that with this approach, the solving time is mesh mesh independent. Is is Harman dependent? Sorry, uh, we are not sure sure that this behavior will be maintained with the iterative uh, solver, but with the direct solver it does. Another advantage of this formulation is that we can use um, tetrahedral meshes with uh, no uh, no important requirement of of quality. Uh, here is an example of a three D insulated pipe with Harman five hundred, and we see that. Uh, currents are uh, the divergences is, is are really small at, at discrete level, so the solution is, is physical and it evolves from the initial uh, parabolic uh, possible flow to an MHD profile in an insulating um, in an insulating wall. So yes, to summarize. Um, the, the simulation of MHD flows in relevant condition for fusion technologies is a still a, a big computational channel, challenge. Uh, real geometries requires of, of very big meshes and uh, of codes that are able to, to, to scale good at uh, with uh, a lot of processors. And yeah, and there, there are uh, uh, an issue uh, of charge conservation that impose strong limitation to the meshes, um, to the mesh size and quality 
uh, for most of the codes. Then we have uh, performed this comparison between these two codes that uh, they have their advantages and their income and their inconvenience. Yeah, um, that I have uh, covered in the talk. Uh, I won't enter in detail because I think I consume my time. So thank you. And happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Roca. Very nice presentation. So it's now time for questions, both from the chat and from raising your hand. I have uh, just a curiosity for the last um, slides that you mentioned about the how to scale with a realistic um, geometry. So um, if um, you plan to, to do it and uh, what could be expected from a more realistic uh, um, design, I would say. Uh, okay, it's a very interesting question. Um, uh, from yeah, I have this this figure here that uh, I, I decided not to include it at the end. But uh, this is a. Uh, Can you put in in a yeah, full sure. screen, please? Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is a figure from from this overview paper from Sman Seth, and yeah, they. They mentioned this this work, which is a very nice uh, work. To my knowledge, is is the, the biggest problem that it has been solved. And yeah, it is uh, it in it it needs hundreds of millions of cells. Uh, and this problem is a complex uh, DCL TBM, uh, but this is still simple enough to use hexahedral meshes. So um, in arbitrarily, arbitrarily uh, complex and big geometries, uh, it, it is difficult to, to estimate. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely, we need to go higher than this. OK. And so uh, the further plan for your um, for the, your your code, the grid MHD code, uh, if you mm -hmm. can say some some words again. Yeah, well, yeah. as I as I mentioned very very quickly, uh, we are we know that we need to to change the the solver uh, because we are limited in in size because of of memory. We are obtaining very nice solution. Uh, are uh, physical in in terms of charge conservation, but when we want to go to 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 big problems, the degrees of freedom are so big uh, for the direct solver. So we are thinking in an iterative solver with and treating the the problem in 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 blocks. So separating the block the Jake block block for the for the U block. Uh, and this has some advantages, for example, that the nonlinearity of the problem is, is located only in the in the convection term of, of the Navier-Stokes equation. So in, in okay. principle, we can solve a, the, the, electric, uh, the electric blocks only one, one time, not every nonlinear iteration. And yeah, we're, we're working in, in that line with, along with my colleagues from, from, from Sydney. And if we have this in, in principle, we, we will uh, have a, a strong tool uh, uh, and hopefully that it's skills good enough to to use it with uh, with hundreds, with several hundreds of processors at least. Okay, thank you. I have another question by Daniel Suarez. Uh, please go ahead for formulate your question if you want. Well, thank you for the presentation. I uh, have a question. Maybe, maybe you 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 said that already, but I just didn't understood. So, do you expect with your new code um, you will be able to perform similar, like um, same kind of uh, simulations, but with less resolution in in terms of mesh size? Uh, that, that's a, a very good question. I, I expect that in in principle, when when since we are uh, using um finite element uh, approach with uh, 
uh, with uh, polynomials with degree two for velocity, for example, and and this Rabietoma polynomials with are also in in some direction uh, degree two. In principle, the finite element approach we need a, a smaller mesh, but this is not um, not a this might be deceiving because might because um, okay the mesh might, might might be small but the degrees of freedom is as big as, as in the finite volume at least so the comparison is is not uh, fair in in this sense uh, so yes I would expect a, a smaller mesh but no I I wouldn't expect a a smaller problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I don't know if, okay, there is another question inside the chat. So we try to be fast. Uh, thanks for the talk. This was extremely interesting. Two questions. Do you see scalability on or as a significant problem for the monolithic solver? Could this be solved by, for example, using different linear solver in pets or, uh, or are more substantial substantial changes needed. And the other question is, will this be extendable to arbitrarily conducted walls with a thin walls approximation and or a full solve for the currents in the walls? Mm -hmm. Okay, so concerning the second the second question, uh, the code is, is uh, right now uh, validated with, uh, with this thin wall approximation. So, when dealing with this uh, single fluid domain, it it can use this this boundary condition and it use a penalty to impose the boundary condition, which is not ideal because we have to try and assess the penalty. And uh, we are right now uh, developing a a multi-domain uh, code, which is also necessary. Uh, um, and we have it worked uh, in serial. And I think that first version in parallel are also working. So this should be the, the next development, I, I think. And concerning the solver, um, for what we tried with, with the Petsy tools, Mooms and um, uh, Jim Res, uh, yeah, I think the the, the problem remains with with direct solver. The problem remains the memory consumption is, is too much, and uh, iterative solvers uh, are we, we think that are the the yeah the, the right way to go. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, thanks again for the speaker, and we can switch to the second um, talks by Dr. Pranav Putan, and the name is Alma Toolkit for Simulation of Magneto Hydrodynamic Duct Flows. So please uh, welcome to the speaker and please go ahead. Hi, so I just want to make sure before that um, if I'm audible. Yes. And also if the slides are very clear. Yes. It's good. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present some of my uh, results. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Pranav, and we are a team at General Atomics working on uh, simulation and validation of MHD benchmark problems using Alma. So there's a huge need, as the previous speaker already mentioned, that um, liquid metal blankets play an important role in protecting the, uh, in separating the magnets in the vacuum vessel from uh, neutron radiation. It also helps in tritium breeding and um, converts most of the neutron energy to heat and then transports it away. Um, the, the problem, however, occurs when uh, you deal with the modeling challenge, especially geometric challenges of um, the blanket simulations. So there's a huge need for uh, tools to understand liquid metal flows in uh, blankets. So there have been commercial tools um, 
So ANSYS that you have already seen um, in the previous talk, and uh, there are research codes and application specific codes in literature that have attempted at solving um, and addressing some of these issues. So in this talk, we are going to present our uh, new exascale solver. It's called ALMA, and uh, ALMA stands for Antisymmetric Large Moment Accelerated. So we have a multi-app structure with uh, several apps that can simulate um, a different set of equations. For example, two-fluid plasma models or MHD or Navier-Stokes models. And um, the let's start with what antisymmetric means. So in um, literature, you can write uh, you can write some of these uh, flux terms in the equations using the following identity, you can simplify them. So when you try to apply this identity, vector identity to some of these fluxes, you observe that um, uh, when we substitute this formulation back into the Navier-Stokes equation and simplify them, you would obtain a set of equations which look something like this. So this is slightly different from the original Navier-Stokes or MHD equations that one might be familiar with. Um, the difference here is that you have a set of operators operating on moments. So the moments are shown in the blue box here. And um, we solve the fully inductive formulation of the magnetic field. And um, it uh, the, the reasons for this formulations will become evident in subsequent slides. But uh, just to reiterate the point that we're using central difference schemes to um, do the spatial disc discretization. And we time advance using um, familiar Rangekota methods. And for more details, of course, you can check out the paper by Halpern et al. Now, the key here is that if you write this entire uh, set of equations in matrix form, one can find that uh, this matrix here is anti-symmetric. And this anti-symmetric operator operates on a set of moments. So with this formulation, this formulation inherently preserves the square norms of the moments, which the square norms being the density, the kinetic energy, the internal energy, and let's say the magnetic energy. So, and also like, so we've mentioned that it has this multi-app structure and the way it's written, um, it is scalable on heterogeneous uh, systems which can take into account the leverage really the opportunity to scale it in both CPUs and GPUs. So uh, just to give some um, more details, so we are uh, using Fortran for the solver the MPI and OpenACC is used for the communication of the GPUs. The way the solver is written, we can switch stencils on the engine side without changing the application. So we can go from second order stencils, fourth order stencils and higher order stencils. And we do have um, elliptic solver as well. So, so that we can develop multiple apps concurrently and uh, we are working on an immersed boundary method that uh, is also going to be integrated into the solver. Now, talking briefly about the scalability, uh, it was uh, in several mo several clusters around um, in the US. This there's a there's a good scalability with regard to the the time taken per iteration. So that's what you're seeing in this plot right here. So we have uh, gone up to uh, 2048 nodes in this particular um, plot. And uh, the elliptic solver, we have tried it for larger meshes. And um, we, we do observe that there are some differences in scaling amongst uh, different clusters. Um, but as you can see, you can easily scale the solution up to um, very, very highly refined meshes. So that's a huge advantage here. And to validate our 
liquid metal MHT solver, we undertake a set of um, benchmark cases of Smolensk et al. 2015. So in this paper, they talk about uh, five different cases, a combination of laminar and turbulent cases. So in this talk, I'll be focusing more on the laminar cases and with brief insight into the ongoing work in MHD turbulence. So we start off with a very simple problem of the Hartmann Possil flow, which is basically a 2D problem with the magnetic field being transverse to the velocity. Now, in this case, the key non-dimensional parameters in such simulations is it's basically the flow is governed by the Reynolds number, the interaction parameter, and the Hartmann number. So in this problem, for example, we use both uh, conduct, perfectly conducting and insulating walls to compare our solutions. And upon comparison, so in this case, we've gone up to Hartmann number of 100. And um, there is a huge um, overlap between the expected results uh, for our um, ALMA code and with the analytical uh, solution. Uh, that's true both in the case of the velocity field and also the induced magnetic field and with conducting walls as well as insulating walls. So we um, add complexity to this problem by uh, looking at the flow in a 3D duct. So as the previous speaker already mentioned, the Hartmann layer, is it's, it's very difficult to capture this Hartmann layer right here. Um, partly because the thickness of this Hartmann layer scales inversely with the Hartmann number. So in this problem, for example, we're looking at Hartmann number of 10, uh, just to illustrate that point. And um, it's from simulations from analytical solution and simulations from uh, the numerical solution from ALMA. And here, typically, uh, the, the flow is going into the plane uh, just to make that point clear, and the magnetic field is transverse to it. So the CW here is the wall conductivity. So looking at a Shercliffe's case, wherein there is insulating walls on all sides, the as the Hartmann number increases, you observe this inviscid core that forms, and essentially you have a Hartmann layer that becomes thinner and thinner. So in this 3D plot right here, you can see that the, the gradient actually is huge close to the walls. And this presents a huge computational challenge. So we really need to focus a lot on the grid design right here because of that. And um, moving on to a slightly different problem. Uh, this is a Hans case. You have an insulating side wall and a conducting Hartmann wall. In this case, the challenge lies in resolving the jet on the side wall. So uh, you have five minutes, five minutes, yeah. please. Okay, thank you. So we have um, a huge gradient in the uh, near the side walls where the velocity increases and this velocity, the maximum velocity of the jet is actually um, increasing with increasing Hartmann number. So that's the huge complexity of this problem. So in our case, we move from, um, we go up to Hartmann number of 10 to the power four. And the Shercliffe's case, we observe a very small error bar. Even the Hans case, it's definitely small, but slightly higher because uh, of this issue in resolving the jets. However, um, we should note here that uh, at higher Hartmann numbers, the error is grid converging. So it's it's to do with the grids. And uh, the grid design, um, as the previous speaker mentioned, has always been a challenge. Now, in a, going on to an, another more um, a, com a problem with higher complexity. So here we're looking at the um, a 3D laminar flow with a spatially varying magnetic field. So the we look at the pressure drop and the Hartmann number interaction parameter and the wall connectivity 
are adopted from the results of Alex et al. Uh, sorry, the Reed et al., the Alex experiments. And um, here, the so the ALMA is able to capture the overall trend in the pressure drop. Um, the complexity lies uh, in actually representing the background magnetic field correctly because previous simulations have shown that um, at the magnetic barrier, the solution is really sensitive to the to the curve that you use to represent the background magnetic field. So that could explain some of the deviation near the magnetic barrier. So um, just a small peek into the ongoing work. So we are really trying to understand the role of the um, the advection of in the magnetic field equations because in literature in MHT uh, liquid metal flows, uh, everyone uses the induction form induction less formulation. So we are trying to understand the differences between the fully inductive formulation and the induction less formulation, especially in the case of MHT turbulence. So for example, here uh, you see this background magnetic field in the problem. The advection term is really dominant and it is in the fully inductive framework and it basically changes the profile of the magnetic field. So um, in an induction less formulation, you would get very different results. So I think the sensitivity of the solution to the magnetic Reynolds number is something that we are really, really focusing on, and it's it's a part of our ongoing work. And um, so, in the summary and future work, we would like to uh, we so we have showcased the anti-symmetric form of uh, MHD equations solved using um, Alma. And uh, in the future work, we'll be looking more into the turbulence regime, um, both Q two D and three D turbulence. And um, one of the challenges in the case of um, blanket flows is to uh, the previous literature has not really focused on time varying background magnetic fields and its influence on this flow profile. So that's also our focus. Um, with that, I would like to thank um, everyone for this um, attending the talk and I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Puthan. Uh, so there is time for very short questions from the chat or from raising your hand. Okay, so Fernando Roca, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, thank you for for the for the presentation. Uh, it was really nice to see different approaches to the to the problem. Um, just curious, um, yeah, what what would you say? It's the the main limitation of of this anti-symmetric uh, approach uh, is it going to high higher Harman numbers or do you think this this is not not the issue it's just the you know or do yeah. you think that it, it is slowing you down going to real fusion application? Yes, so definitely. Uh, just by adopting this anti-symmetric formulation, we are not completely able to solve the problem of going to high Hartman number. Uh, that has always remained a challenge. And um, the, the the grid density has always been a problem here. The main advantage is that uh, since this energy conservation is inbuilt, the, the, the solution is bounded and you always have um, a stable um, solution with the total energy being numerically bounded. So um, that's that's been the biggest advantage, but when you say biggest challenge, uh, definitely the the grid design um, is is definitely a challenge when, uh, as you can see, the, the, uh, the error is like uh, still in the, in the, in the 10% range and at admin number of 10 to the power four. So, at higher Hartman numbers, um, that could that could definitely present an issue. Thank you. Okay, there are more questions. I'm curious, uh, just um, for for my knowledge, if you plan to use this methodology for a specific device or inside a specific project or a specific tokamak or breathing blanket. 
Yeah, so I would like to remind that so there are multiple formulations here that we're working on. So it's um, we are not looking at a single formulation approach, um, which is why we have this elliptic solver as well that we're developing so that we have uh, an induction less approach and a fully inductive approach with the same underlying uh, engine, um, if I can say that. And uh, we're trying to like compare it, um, compare the different formulations and see if what is suitable for um, for capturing the physics really well. So um, we are not, it's uh, not really tokamak specific. If I have to, uh, yeah, it's it's not, not tokamak specific. Okay. So uh, there is also another question by Daniel Suarez. Please go ahead. Hello. Thank you for this nice presentation and showing us some new ways to compute the liquid matter emissive flows. I had a question because I, uh, in your, um, in your formulation, you're using uh, um, a scheme where uh, the magnetic field is, uh, the induced magnetic field is influencing the whole magnetic field and therefore the MHZ. And if yes. I'm, if I'm not wrong, that, uh, that complicates a little bit the, the boundary conditions that you have to specify for solving, um, for, for example, um, electrically conducting walls cases. Uh, are you, how, how did you uh, address that issue? If you could shortly comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, so in the case of uh, fully, so in the, in the fully inductive formulation, we are directly applying the boundary conditions on the different components of the magnetic field. Um, the, the current density per se is computed using the, the Ampere Maxwell's equation. Um, and we are not uh, looking to Im implement in, in this formulation, we are not applying the boundary conditions on, uh, on J per se. Uh, we are looking. We are looking to implement all the boundary conditions in the for the different components of magnetic field. And yes, you like you mentioned, uh, definitely um, because of the induced magnetic field uh, causing some nonlinearity in the solution that complicates the situation definitely. So um, we are still in in literature. I think. There has been a depth of uh, studies that have not looked at this nonlinear effects. Um, so the approach has been to straightforwardly assume that um, the magnetic uh, Reynolds number is really small. Um, but really, the question is, uh, at what, at uh, how small should the magnetic Reynolds number be for this induced magnetic field to not affect the solution? So that's that's our uh, challenge here and that we're trying to study and address. Okay, thank you very much again, Dr. Putan. Thank you. Uh, so we can switch to the last speaker, uh, Daniel Suarez, with his presentation regarding the characterization of buoyancy driven eddies of liquid metal MHD flows in breathing blankets. So please go ahead. Oh. Hello. Thank you. I'm trying to share screen here. Oh, I'm having some problems, maybe. I'm sorry, I'm just having a problem with the sharing screen. Uh, let me see. Okay, now? Yes, please. Okay, perfect, sorry, thank you. Um, okay, so um, thank you for, for having this chance to present this uh, investigation that we're carrying out with my fellows, Eduardo Iraola and Joaquim Serrat. Uh, it's called characterization of buoyancy driven eddies in liquid metal flows in breathing blankets. I'm currently finishing this investigation from the Oak Ridge National Lab, which I joined a few months ago. 
Um, and I'm, I want to, before starting with the technical detail, just comment that the views presented here are, are only reflecting our opinions, not they don't constitute like of official consensus at the lab. So just uh, want to make sure that uh, we take that into account for this presentation. Um, the big question that we're trying to address here is uh, with the blanket uh, shows eddies caused by buoyancy in in the channels, uh, and we are trying to address that issue with uh, with uh, some some investigations and some methods that we're going to present now. Um, the liquid metal will flow in vertical channels in most of the designs that uh, are being studied right now. I'm not going to uh, again comment on the what is the blanket because my the previous speakers already explained that in a very accurate way. Uh, so the very the blanket will. Uh, be absorbing the heat produced by the by the fusion reactions in the plasma and some designs uh, um, they contemplate the possibility of having vertical uh, channels where the flow with uh, will start will enter the blanket from the very bottom and in some in some occasions they will live from the very top like the VCLL design by the CMAT laboratory, which is like a full segment channel. A uh, very interesting design with insulated, uh, electrical insulated walls. And, and some other designs may consider also like a backward uh, flow, but uh, for sure all of them will have upward flow uh, from the bottom of the, of the segment going up. Um, I'm, I'm going to introduce an orthogonal simplified model that we are going to that we used to analyze to study this problem and to present the relevant directions of the problem. In this case, we have the plasma on the right, we have the velocity field going up in the poloidal direction, we have the gravity field going down. This is two A, which would be the, the dimension, the, the width of the channel in the direction of the of the heat uh, flux, like uh, we're showing. Here, the heat flux direction in the radial direction. We can show here also the magnetic field direction, which is perpendicular to the velocity field, which is perpendicular to the heat flux. So we have the three uh, components in this problem. And we can define a couple of planes, like this would be the two dimensional fully developed flow plane, which um, is perpendicular to the velocity field, which is this plane that uh, the previous speakers were commenting about. Um, like Hartmann, uh, Shercliffe flow, hand flow, this kind of uh, typical benchmark cases are based on the fully developed approach. And I'm going to introduce also another plane which is of relevance for our analysis, which is the quasi two dimensional flow plane, which is perpendicular to the magnetic field direction. And this plane um, is uh, using the, uh, start analyzing this plane uh, is taking advantage of this characteristic uh, of uh, liquid metal MHC flows in which the Hartmann boundary layer scales by U divided by Hartmann, meaning that for very high Hartmann number, this boundary layer is very narrow and the velocity is not going to present any, any, um, uni any non-uniformities in the direction of the magnetic field, meaning that it is like very, very, very constant along the magnetic field direction. So we can assume that the flow will will advance in a two-dimensional plane um, for the for the whole channel. So let's say that the, the flow will be like completely the same in the in the parallel channels of this quasi to the flow plane. Um, we in our model we contemplate this non-uniform volumetric heat source um, with this exponential uh, profile of the neutron influence to the a liquid metal uh, within the channel. Uh, the forces affecting the flow may generate this kind of profile if we consider mixed convection flow. We have the plasma on the left, the, this part is heated more than this one and therefore buoyancy influences the flow um, pushing the left part uh, more fast than the, the, the fluid in the right part of the plot. The Reynolds number which characterizes the inertia uh, are going to push the boundary layers in that direction. The buoyancy term defined by the Grashof number are going to try to twist the flow in this direction. 
as I mentioned, because this left part will be heated more than the right part. And eventually the Lorentz force will try to um, dump the, those spots where, where velocity is maximum. Uh, in this case, this peak will be, will be smoothened by the Lorentz force increasing uh, as the Hartnell number is going to be increased. Um, this happens, this eventually provokes, may provoke some instability, some, um, some inflection points within the profile that eventually may lead to some instabilities. They were described by, by Small and Seven and his uh, colleagues in 2013, uh, showing that this turbulence uh, generated by these instabilities can, can show different flow regimes. Like uh, we can say this strong turbulence on the left and some weak turbulence on the right, we're going to show them uh, here uh, in the same article or in a similar article of the continuous of this work that they did in 2013, they were studying uh, a fully developed flow, including some perturbances, and they eventually showed this graph, which was a really nice and clear uh, map of uh, what this kind of the kind of regimes that we're going to find in the um, yeah, for different for different uh, flow conditions, for example, Hartman, Reynolds, and Grassoff here. The Grassoff is 10 to the 8. And if we find our combinations of Reynolds and Hartman in this region, it's called the stable region. The flow will present a uh, fully developed uh, profile. Uh, the weak turbulence uh, will show some eddies contained within this very close to the boundary layer. And eventually the strong turbulence will generate eddies of the length scale of the width of the channel uh, and uh, the, kinet the turbulent kinetic energy will increase, uh, will be very high. So those are, as uh, I, I try to be sure that uh, it's clear, uh, fully developed flows. The thing is that in the, in the blanket, we're not, we're not likely to be having fully developed flows. And the, the question that we want to pose here is what flow conditions will promote coherent structures in operating conditions of the blanket channels? That's what is driving our research here. So we use some procedures and methods. Uh, we're going to describe the case. We're going to describe the quasi to the code that we develop uh, that considers buoyancy also. Uh, we would, are going to recall some, some tool that we prepared a few years ago regarding the bidimensional fast Fourier transform to identify eddies. And finally, we're going to comment briefly the HPC resources that we are using. Um, here we see again the simplified um, main directions and the simplified model. And if we focus on the quasi to the flow plane, we, we can define this case where we have the inlet at the bottom, the outlet at the top. We define a, the weight of the channel being 2A and the, the length of the channel is going to be uh, 100 times A. This means that 2A, if a uh, typical A would be in the DCLL design by CM at something like 0 0.1 meters, so like 10 centimeters, this 100A would be like 10 meters, which is kind of a significant length, just to uh, give some, some uh, dimensions estimation. Uh, the magnetic field would be transverse, as uh, I mentioned before, and the plasma will generate a non-uniform volumetric heating into the channel. The walls will be electrically and thermally insulated, and the velocity field would be imposed in a uniform flat velocity profile at the very inlet. And we uh, we impose the boundary condition, which is a vective boundary condition that can allow eddies to continue after the after the the boundary condition. Uh, this boundary condition has given us has provided us good results with uh, with. Uh, vortex generated after an obstacle, for example, in previous investigations. Uh, the quasi two-dimensional code is based on the Sumeria Muro model described it's 40 years ago. And basically in the momentum equation, um, he or they imposed or they defined this um, Hartman um, breaking term um, that will basically generate a, a, a a break, so uh, it will, it's going to smooth the, the, the velocity in those spots where the velocity will be higher. And also we have the Boussin-esque approximation for the buoyancy term in the momentum equation. We have to take a look at the definition of the of this Harman breaking time and also to the um, temperature equation, which includes the source term, which is non-uniform, as I explained before. It's following an exponential uh, 
interaction profile. It was benchmarked with three different cases, the three-dimensional finite enclosure by Autier, the natural convec convection infinite enclosure by Tagawa, and the mixed convection infinite enclosure code comparison uh, with a fully developed flow, which would be, which was a mixed convective flow, not natural. And uh, since I don't have time to get into the details of the three of them, I'm only going to explain the first one, which is probably the most interesting. I mean, yes, please. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, natural convection in 3D finite enclosure. Uh, I, we have here a finite enclosure where top and bottom walls are, uh, they are, it's, it's a finite enclosure we hit from the, we have a hot wall on the left, a cold wall on, cold wall on the right, and then we see how the flow evolves um, like this. So we have Hartmann uh, 0, Hartmann 900, we see that for higher the magnetic field, the flow will arrange differently. This is a three, this is, um, yeah, this is a quasi to the uh, solution for this three dimensional problem. And we can see the green line here that the code was successfully capturing the Nussel number for different Harman numbers, but it's more precise as higher the Harman number is, as we can observe here. It's a conclusion that we always reach in, our, in all our benchmark problems. The B-dimensional fast Fourier transform, for the detection basically was benchmarked with the cavity driven flow. So we have a moving wall on the top, we generate a, lar a large scale eddy and we eventually identify and densify all the information contained in the velocity field in this uh, matrix of coefficients that define and characterize the eddies. Well, I'm not going into these details. Uh, we, can, we can talk about that later. We have been using Kates, which is the HPC available at ORNL together with Submit and Frontier. Uh, it uses Cray CPUs. It, it's using uh, 543 nodes that are available at burst queues, and the data is using NFS and Luster systems. Our specific requirements for our cases, it's, uh, they are basically, the case contains around 2.5 million cells. The optimal parallelization has been around two nodes or seven nodes, depending if we work with low or high Hanman number. And bottleneck of the simulation is the time, like the simulation time, because the flow is slow, the domain is large, and then in those cases can take around two weeks, more or less. So I'm going to show the results of uh, one simulation for strong turbulence in full channel, meaning it's not fully developed, as I mentioned before, for Harman 500, Reynolds 5000, and Grassoff 10 to the 8. Um, here we have at the very left the sketch of the, of the model that we are using. And here I'm going to show a small video where the on the left, sorry, we have the vorticity. On the right, we have the temperature. And right now we can see that at time 100 and let's say 50, we already see that these arrows, maybe it's a little bit tiny, but on the left, they are uh, going up. On the right, they are going down, meaning that natural convection is already taking effect. The boundary condition and the difference in temperatures will generate some perturbation that will enter the flow. This is something that we could expect and uh, it's interesting to see also that, oops, sorry. Sorry, this is just one second. Uh, we can observe here, let me see. Yeah, exactly here, that there are also some perturbations being generated at the very bottom. So basically the flow enters uniform, then it, it receives the flow going back from the cold zone and then disturbances appear in this region. And eventually the, the turbulence is being generated all around. And so temperature mixes all around and the flow basically is turbulent all around. That's for Harman 500, Reynolds 5000, gas of 10 to the 8. The result of the dimensionless vorticity field can be this one for the velocity field could be this one. If we take a deeper look at this small spot at the very exit, we can observe that we do have eddies and that our FFT to um, post-process just can define properly the main characteristics of those eddies, identifying not only the eddies themselves and the presence, but, the, but also the coefficients that are relevant for the definition. And I want to discuss uh, very briefly the importance of the dimensionless numbers and take a broader look on uh, the, our cases. So we are running the stable, so uh, stable, considered the stable region case uh, in the in the smallness of work that I mentioned before, the weak turbulence case and the strong turbulence case, basically changing the Hartmann number. 
And uh, we're, cur we're currently working on the demo similar simulation, demo similar um, uh, simulation because um, it has a, like a larger Richardson number, which I think it's, in, it's relevant to consider. Uh, briefly, just to summarize, we have that our flow uh, gets hot on the left, gets cold on the right, and eventually it will generate a big recirculation through the channel. If our channel is long enough, that will that will provoke that natural convection will dominate the flow, in my opinion, very, very, very strongly. So some conclusions just to finish. Um, we have validated buoyancy, the buoyant quasi to the code and the FFT2 method. We have used gates HPC configured and set to solve parametric analysis. We're ready for a large amount of calculations. We have performed the full, first full channel simulation showing strong turbulent flow. And uh, important thing is that relevant dimensionless numbers are suggesting that natural convection will dominate the flow in the blanket itself. It's not only in our cases that we're running, the blanket itself that the, the current design is considering a Richardson number of around 2,500, which is by far uh, clearly a natural circulation case. And this is all, thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Comment. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suarez. Um, so that's time for question. We have time for a short question. Fernando, please. Uh, thank you, Daniel, uh, for the, the presentation. Uh, yeah, it's a quick question about this uh, last discussion. Uh, you, you, you are confident that you will have this national natural convection dominated flow uh, because of the Richardson, Richardson number uh, value, uh, which is fair. Mm, but is that number take into account the, the damping effect of the magnetic field, or, or this is more uh, represented by the like Kudis number, for example, or something like that? Yeah, let Which me... I, I, yeah. Yeah, let me just uh, comment on that. This is uh, something that I, I found really interesting. Uh, I have here a comparison, I prepared this comparison table for 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 developing this a little bit more if that will be the case. And thank you for the question because I think it's very appropriate. Uh, because uh, in demo, uh, you see my screen, right? In demo, we are having 10 to the four, we're having 20, around 20,000 Reynolds graphs of 10 to the 12. We have a interaction parameter 5,000, like with this 100, Reynolds to the Harman 2 and 2,500 Richardson number. To my opinion, this is my opinion, natural convection uh, is gen it's dominating when the Richardson is higher than three. This is what theory says. Uh, it doesn't mean that it will not be dumped. It, does, it only means that we cannot consider, in my opinion, um, fully developed model. So this two dimensional fully developed plane in which we are, uh, calculating share clear for Hans case. The, it's perfect for benchmarking, but for this CLL blanket, if we have uh, long enough channels, the Richardson number will be so high that uh, natural convection will dominate. That's my 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 current thing, thoughts about that. Uh, it will be damped. So here we see Reynolds divided by Harman, meaning being two, meaning that the boundary layers will be stable in terms of uh, turbulence. So they will be stable. Uh, natural convective will behave as two-dimensional since the Likudis number will be 100 in demo. Uh, it's higher than four, which is what Takawa says, that it provokes two-dimensional natural convective flows. And the inertial, as the, sorry, the Stuart number being 5,000, meaning that the flow will behave as, as iner in inertial, as, right? Uh, so to, to me, my opinion is that the flow will behave as natural convective um, two-dimensional MHD flow, but uh, it will be similar to that Autie case that I used as benchmark before. M more similar to that than, a, for example, a mixed convective flow or even like a forced flow profile. That's my opinion on this. Okay, thank you. So yeah, at the end of the question, you, you opened the presentation. Uh, it's not yet answered. Let's say so. It's what you want to 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 know to still know for sure. 
Yes, uh, we are currently uh, finishing our calculations on the other cases, weak turbulence and strong turbulence. And also this, I call it uh, demo similar simulation because I'm trying to keep uh, like ratios on the range similar to demo, at least high, like far from the limits of the the physical phenomena that they identify these these numbers, these dimensionless numbers, and but as right now I'm pretty confident of this uh, conclusion. <laughs> Let's see. I will. I will. Uh, when I finish the the calculations, I will be more more confident. But uh, right now I'm pretty pretty confident about that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we are a little bit late, so we can thanks again to the speaker, Daniel Suarez, and uh, we, uh, so we finish this session, we have a small break, uh, and we return at uh, 3.30, so enjoy the break, and see you later. Bye. Benjamin Coleman, who is a associate professor at Princeton University. Is an expert on plasma control and is leading the group that is developing the, the code desk, which is becoming a very important player in the accelerator optimization community. Are you ready, Ajiman? Are you ready? We see your slides. Do you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, now. Okay, all right. Hi, everyone. This is Agamemnon Coleman. Thanks for the introduction. I'll talk about uh, Stellarator optimization, the new tool that we developed. It's, a, it's called Desk Suite that allows us to do fast equilibrium and optimization of Stellarators. And this is me and my group. And our website is control.princeton.edu if you want to check out this code. And first, the plug, we're looking for postdocs if you're interested in uh, novel Stellarator design, Stellarator diverter topology, scraper layers, and other applied math problems. You can reach out to me about this. Okay, so uh, when we look at tokamaks, uh, we have a disruption issue. You probably know this, but I'll show the video of a disruption at CMOD. So the plasma is going, and then all of a sudden, uh, in very short time scale, you see these uh, sparks coming out. So what happened is the plasma just hit the wall, and these sparks are coming out because the metal pieces fly off. And this is a, a problem in tokamaks because tokamaks need currents, uh, inside the plasma to drive the colloidal field uh, that's you know required for tokamaks. So even though tokamaks are simple, they're axisymmetric, simple geometry, easy to uh, build. Uh, because of the required current, you give instabilities, and you have to drive this current as well, which is not easy. So uh, an alternative is the stellarators, if you know. And uh, stellarators are more 3D structured, as you see here. And they have complex geometry, so they're a bit hard to build, like W7X. And confinement is not guaranteed. But uh, it is doesn't have currents, and there's a big uh, design space. And you can make uh, stellarators without currents and, and good confinement properties, like W7X. But to look at this big design space, you need good tools because it's high, very high dimensional. Um, so we want to do uh, uh, optimization of stellarators. So what is the best way to do it? Well, first off, you know, if you think about structurally, uh, we want a tool that can take the constraints that we give. We call this constraint GOX here. So a constraint is that we are always in MHD equilibrium, right? We don't want a non-equilibrium plasma. And we have some insight from the physicists. For example, you can give the analytical calculations near the axis of the plasma from some expansions. And engineering insight can be the aspect ratio should be small for it not to be too big of a machine, et cetera. And then you give objective functions. So you give your F. These can be that you want quasi-symmetry, you want low turbulence, and so forth. And then uh, you need to specify the engineering and physics insights, uh, relative importance of the 
these terms, the, the things that you're optimizing for objectives. So you give the constraints, you give the objectives and the relative importance of the objectives, and that's it. Ideally, you don't need more than that in a in a, in a optimization, and your code is able to handle everything after that. Uh, so then what you do is you say, okay, I want to optimize for my uh, uh, cost function subject to the, the, the constraints, and you want to do this fast. Fast means today, in today's terms, you need a GPU because GPUs are fast algorithms. You can run them much faster. And the second thing is that you need Jacobians because uh, Jacobian-based uh, optimization is almost always faster than uh, non-Jacobian based. So in your code, so you want a code that can run on GPU directly and as Jacobians uh, directly as well. Then you say, okay, I give my constraints. So I say, okay, fix the near axis, uh, do an equilibrium. And then you say, optimize for other things of importance. Optimize, for example, here for uh, quasi-symmetry. So here's an example. So you give this, this the red one is the, in, uh, from what you get from near axis, and then you say optimize, and then this is the solution you get. Um, so that's the, the roughly what you want. And we basically developed this tool uh, in desk, and it allows you to do equilibrium. Here's on the left, you see some equilibria. It allows you to get very high accurate equilibria, and it allows you to do very fast optimization. So it, it, it allows you to look at the huge uh, design space. And here's some examples of omnigenity, omnigenous fields that we achieved, and I'll give you some uh, other examples as we go along. So what is the philosophy? Uh, the philosophy is that everything is an optimization. So when we're in DESC, uh, equilibrium uh, is, is, is uh, just an optimization problem. So normally for equilibrium, uh, you say, I want fixed boundary, you give the pressures, you give the currents, and then you say, okay, I want to optimize to have force error B zero, J cross B equals grad P. Or you say, I want to minimize energy. So normally people say, okay, I want an equilibrium code. But what equilibrium code is literally is an optimization code. So what you do is you put your F and G, and in this case, G is just some, you know, uh, force error. And you call desk to optimize for that cost function, and you get equilibrium. And then if you want to optimize for stellarator parameters, then you're, uh, you might have the same constraints and the objectives might change. In this case, you want quasi-symmetry, stability, et cetera. And you call desk again, uh, but the same one way, you just give your FNG and it gives you the optimized stellarator. So you basically pose all the problems, including the equilibrium and optimization as a big optimization problem so that everything comes in together. Okay, that's why it's important to have equilibrium and the, the optimization all together. So uh, we have the design principles for desk. And the first one is we wanted a very simple user interface for people to use. So it's, it's an open source code, it's on GitHub. You can go check it out. It's GitHub Plasma Control Desk. And it's uh, in Python because it's much easier for uh, especially younger students to work with Python. It's really well documented. It's probably the best documented plasma physics code you can see. And uh, we, we have huge amounts of test codes. And every time you add a code, it goes through 100 tests and so forth. And it's very easy. It's one line of code to install. Um, so we work with local error. So we use uh, pseudo-spectral collocation methods because these are much faster than uh, other type of methods. It's, it uses the global structures, but it's, it uses, it finds the local errors. And uh, we use Zernike polynomials, the global basis function of Zernike that gets resolved the issues at the axis. And we use uh, exact derivatives uh, with JAX, so you don't have to write your own derivatives. And as the code evolves, it's able to do it. And this allows us to do automatic uh, Jacobian calculations directly. And it's hardware uh, agnostic. The code can run on CPU, GPU, or DPU. It's like a one line of, you just say, run on GPU, and it's that's it. You don't have to edit anything else. And it's extendable to a modular, flexible structure. So let's start with the, the Zernike spectral basis and why it's better than concentric circles. So. Uh, Basically, topologically, we have a torus, and you can write a torus as a bunch of Poincaré sections. And each Poincaré section 
is like this. It's a it's basically a disk, and and to give the disk, you can write it as Zernike polynomials, which are given here. This is zero zero one one two zero two two. All these different uh, basis functions for Zernike. The nice thing is that it's analytic. This function is analytic at the 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 core here. And it's exponentially conversion if a solution exists, obviously. And this, uh, if you were to use concentric circles, which pretty much all the other codes use, then you do not have this uh, analyticity at the core. So the most used code before this came along was VMAC. Here's the force errors as a function of row, row from going from center to the edge. And as you see, there's a huge error in VMAC in the center. And as you increase the the, the uh, resolution, you go from 12, 16, 20, uh, the, basically the core error doesn't go down and it basically saturated at some point the force errors. At the same resolution, but the uh, desk, you're able to increase, uh, reduce the, the force error exponentially. And you see that there's no problem at the core or at the edges. Basically, the, the force error is constant throughout the volume which is very important if you're, and you're doing optimization and then you're doing stability analysis. So that's a very good advantage. Second advantage is the speed. It's much faster. So here's the example of Stellop versus desk on a CPU and desk on a GPU. So this is the Stellop as you increase the number of variables. You go from eight variable optimization to maybe 50. And here uh, a desk doesn't change, the, the compute time doesn't change with number of variables that you're optimizing for because we're using the whole uh, variables anyway. And, and as you go to GPU, it gets even faster. So if you look at here, this is roughly the optimization space we look at, it's basically a thousand times faster, uh, three orders of magnitude faster. And uh, so then you can do coil optimization and other things um, very easily. Okay, um, so <clears throat> uh, you know maybe I, I, I skipped this one. But if, if we want to do uh, optimization, historically, the, the you know, stellar optimization use basically a, a function like this. So you have one 0D optimization figure, so you have a cost function. And then for inequalities, uh, so you put basically equality constraints, you put a weight in front of your equality constraint, and you make this weight quite big, and then you try to kind of minimize this whole thing. So you uh, basically choose your weights and, and have one single function to approximate and use basically some sort of penalty to optimize. Obviously, this is very hard because you don't know what the weight should be, and uh, this is not really ideal for optimization. Uh, what is better is you basically set your problem properly. So you write your uh, things that you're optimizing for F, and the constraints that comes with its own Lagrangian, and uh, you can have the, the, the uh, quadratic penalty, uh, which is the augmented Lagrangian method here. And if you use this type of uh, setup, uh, basically the, the lambda and the mu here is automatically set in the, the code, and you don't have to then uh, choose these weights, and it automatically converges to the right problem. And, and there are a bunch of packages that does this that we implemented on desk. And this allows, more importantly, this allows combined constraints and optimization at the same time. So normally what you do is you're in a space here. This is, let's say, the space of all the equilibria, uh, nested equilibria solutions here. And you want to go to some uh, quasi-symmetry direction. This is your direction for your quasi-symmetric perturbation. So what normally we do is you just take a step that way. You come here, but not now you're not in equilibrium. So you do a equilibrium find uh, uh, set. So you do a fixed boundary iteration. And then you project here. So this is obviously not an ideal way of doing optimization. And it might lead to all sorts of issues that we see in, uh, in real life. So instead, what we do is, is oh, let me see if I have that slide now. Uh, what we do is you can just go from uh, uh, to the final position without having the constraints satisfied at all, all times. You can relax this, you know, constraint being zero all the time, so you don't, but at the final point that you get there, sorry if I can, I don't know if I uh, missed that slide here. Uh, yeah, I have that slide missing, but it's okay. So, um, 
anyhow, so uh, here's an example of how you can use this multi-objective optimization where uh, you're using the augmented Lagrangian method. On the left is the NCSX accelerator. Here is the uh, NCSX with um, uh, pole precise uh, QA solution. It has a nice magnetic well, so it's it's stable, but it has large convex regions, as you see here. So this was kind of an improvement on NSTX in some ways. And then people uh, developed other stellarators, like Estelle, shown here. So it's a simpler geometry. As you see, it doesn't have these beam structures here. But if you look at the stability, it has on a magnetic hill, so it's unstable. So what we said is, okay, we want the combination, some sort of, uh, we want the stability, and we don't want these bean shapes. Can you give us that? And then you say, okay, I want uh, my mud is my multi object of uh, objective optimization. I want force error to be zero, so J cross B is equal to grad P, and you want some, some iota term, and then you say, okay, stability is given here by the magnetic well, and you say, okay, I don't want curvature to be too bad. I don't want bad curvature. And then you go ahead and do your augmented Lagrangian. And what you get in the end is this new QA solution. As you see, it doesn't have any bean like shapes. Uh, so it's in a way similar to Estelle in some ways, uh, but it doesn't have, a, 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 you know, the, the, as good at quasi-symmetry, but it has good quasi-symmetry. It's better than NSTX. So this is NSTX, and this is the new QA. So you get better uh, QS than NSTX, but at the same time, you don't have any bean-like shapes. So this is something you can do with optimization. And this is all, all done automatically, so you don't have to do like 10 different iterations. You just give your cost function, and you get the solution at the end of it. So this was literally done, uh, like the, this is probably the first try we got this result. Uh, we can do free boundary solutions. So free boundary requests that uh, we have the boundary for the plasma, and across the boundary there's a plasma. Pressure is conserved, so inside and outside pressure are the same. And uh, we implemented uh, multiple methods using uh, the, the NYU folks' method and, and the Nestor methods. And uh, using those methods, we are able to find the equilibria. This is the free surface desk versus VMAG equilibria. And we did some tests. I have more uh, analysis of this. So basically, the free surface is converging uh, right now to as good results, if not better, and faster than what we have with, desk, uh, with VMAG. And another important thing is the, the near axis uh constraints on on the desk that we can put in so normally uh we have a physics analysis and physics exp uh, like a taylor expansion if you will around the the centroid here gives us some sort of what the shape would look like for let's say a quasi symmetric stellarator so these greens are basically the the near axis behavior that you get if you were to do it but to do the optimization, what we end up doing is you give this uh, near axis expansion, and then you go all the way out and find uh, this this uh, expansion goes all the way out, and then you give this uh, solution that you get at rho equals one. This is the outer edge, and you use that as your initial input to do a Vmax solve. So let me go to the next one to show you what it normally does. So what you end up doing is you do this expansion. So the expansion of interest to us is the core, but as the expansion goes outwards, it becomes very problematic like this. So normally people take this bad out boundary, put it in VMAC and solve a new equilibrium, which is this step here. And now they say, okay, this is my quasi-symmetric solution. And then I start going from there. But as you see, we want it to match the core, but this doesn't match the core at all. In VMAC, you can specify anything. It's flexible. So you can specify the core only. That's what we do here. So in, VMAC, in, in desk, we were able to put in the core and not the edges. And it, when you fix these, it's able to find a very relaxed solution that matches the core we want. And it doesn't have this 
weird funky corner uh, plasma shape and it's able to here is the near axis expansion and here is the desk so it's able to match the iota that we want and because it's matching the core better where the qs is uh, analytically known it's getting better uh, quasi symmetry as well so quasi symmetry is interesting but we have a bigger space of possible magnetic fields. If you look at all the magnetic fields, the subspace of that is the nested flux surfaces, which is what we want. We all everyone wants a nested flux surface as a stellarator. Um, and, and subspace of that is the closed magnitude of B as a contour setup. So these are basically, B can be, uh, uh, the magnitude of B can be a coordinate. And in here, you can separate it into two parts. You can have, you have the poloidal, and you have the toroidal that's going around torus, and hel helical, which is a combination of toroidal and poloidal modes. And subspace of this contour, a uh, closed B contour, is omnigenous. Omnigenous is where you have the a bounce distance between the consecutive B points are independent of the field line. And the subspace of that is quasi symmetry, where you have QP, QH, and QA. So for omnigenous, we have QP, we have OP, omnigenous poloidal. For OH, we have uh, QH, we have OH, omnigenous helical. And QA, we have OT, which is the omnigenous toroidal. Um, so uh, these omnigenous fields have pretty much the same properties as QS, but it's a much larger space. And it's great to, to analyze to see maybe we can get better uh, reactors here. And this is but this hasn't been done much because we didn't have the tools. So we developed this tool. So we have a general omnigenous optimization implemented in DESK. So what we found is that you can uh, write your omnigenous fields by defining first a symmetric function, B, and shift it in space in the bottom as shown here. And after you shift it in uh, zeta and theta, then you can sp specify the full Boozer coordinate magnetic field as shown here. So we can parameterize basically all the omnigenous fields with a symmetric spline plus two shift functions, shift and zeta, shift and uh, zeta. And these are uh, uh, Fourier shifts. So, and, and then what you say is I want this omnigenous field. Then you say, okay, I want to optimize the error between equilibrium B minus the B that I specified here. And you can show that if you write it out, that this indeed gives you the, the constant bounce distance, so the, the delta d alpha is equal to zero. So that means these are indeed uh, omnigenous fields. So uh, we implemented this and found various omnigenous fields. Here's the OP, which is the omnigenous poloidal that we got, omnigenous helical systems, omnigenous toroidal, and in addition, we have uh, QP, QH, and QA. So you can pretty much uh, get whatever you want. You give the initial conditions from near axis, and you optimize for homogeneity for different types of options. And here is what the Boozer plot looks for these. So this is the uh, OP, OH, and OT. OH is the helical setup here, and OT is going in the toroidal. And the QA, this is just like token back. So it's all uh, parallel. And, and OOT gets a bit of drift around it, uh, ways around it. And what we found is that there's a lot of uh, omnigenous toroidal fields that are the very good confinement. So this opens up a huge space here and there uh, for us to study. And once you do that, you can look at the, the confinement of these things. And here's the examples for the confinement uh, computed with NEO, neoclassical calculations and with with simple code which is the collision three minutes, okay okay yeah i'm coming to them um and it basically this shows that they have really good confinement uh these things that we found have uh better than w7x uh particle confinement uh another thing that gp allows us to do is direct optimization of particles so when we talk about quasi symmetry and so forth these are uh, uh, simplified uh, proxies uh, that we use. But what we really care about is the particle confinement, right? So uh, GP allows us to do uh, the same computation for many, many times really fast. Uh, so we can put particles 
on the surfaces, integrate those particles, you can put thousands of particles using the guiding center motion here. And then you can integrate them really fast and you do auto differentiation and you can find the drift rates or the, the ensemble of all your particles so on the surface. So uh, we are able to do that. So we integrate these particles. This is the starting equilibrium particles here. As you see, they drifted out. They're not on the surface. And when you may optimize, the particles are staying on the surface. This is the, the uh, original where the particles are moving out. And in here, they're not moving out. So this is opens up a lot of opportunities where you can like literally uh, write from first principle what you want with the particles and optimize for that, so for the ensemble of it. And we did the, the turbulence optimization with GX and DESC. And you see when we do this, this is the initial, this is the optimized uh, heat flux traces. So heat flux goes down by a factor of three, nonlinear, this is nonlinear heat flux, and you get good quad symmetry as well. So this is a, uh, showing basically coupling to very sophisticated turbulent uh, transport codes. And going forward, we're looking to end-to-end -end optimization with automatic differentiation. This is the SIDAC work that we're doing with Michael Churchill. And this is the equilibrium here, but it's connected to all sorts of things. And we want to do that optimization with all the coils and everything incorporated. As a conclusion, I want to say that that uh, desk does multi-objective optimization that can work on turbulence, it's near axis, can do free surface, and it can do uh, general homogeneity. And it allows us very flexible, easy to use code. So if you're interested in stellar optimization, I think these days everyone is using this code. I, uh, you can reach out to me or just try it by yourself. It's free uh, code on GitHub. Thank you very much. And I'll leave it here. Uh, Thank you very much for this interesting talk. We have now some time for questions. You can raise your hand in Zoom, or you can write it in the chat. I don't see any questions. I have one. Oh, okay. Maybe you can, you comment, you, you said that the, the computational cost in this doesn't depend on the number of variables. That surprised me. Can you That's comment right. on this? It doesn't. It doesn't because, um, yeah. So I can go back to that slide. Let's see. Yeah, because we are calculating the Jacobian at each time anyway. So the code is based on calculation of the Jacobian at each time. So what happens is when you're doing the equilibrium calculation, we are using a Newton step, like a Newton step like so, setup at least. And you're calculating the Jacobian for that. So basically when you're doing the optimization, you're using the Jacobian that you already calculated. So optimization basically comes for free then. It doesn't make a difference uh, when you're doing that. Uh, this is per step. Uh, obviously, if you're doing a, you know, bigger dimensional space, you might need to do more iterations, more more steps. This is per step. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's nice in that way that if, as we go to bigger and bigger problems, the advantage becomes more, more and more. Yeah, but the computational cost depends on the number of features that you are improving, you are optimizing. Well, the number of iterations will increase if you have too many variables, right, to find the right one. But per iteration, the 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 the, the iteration costs the same if you have one or ten or whatever variables. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. And uh, another question, more general: You obtained uh, general omnigenous uh, configuration that are large aspect ratio. I'm curious about what is what pushes you to, to this large aspect ratio, because in general, you want to have lower aspect ratio. Oh, yeah. OK, so this is the first paper that my student wrote. Mm -hmm. This was to show that you can get these. Um, so the the we have now, I, I didn't incorporate it. We have a database of thousands of these quasi-symmetry 
right now. So for those, uh, there's a wider set. So this was just to, to show that, that the ones you're seeing here are to show that we can get perfect or close to perfect uh, omnigenous fields. Uh, and this was the first thing we got. Uh, but now we have a presentation and uh, coming up in, in Simon's meeting next week where we have thousands of these things. So we just basically put put it in the cluster and let it run for a week and you get many, many of these. And and they would have lower aspect ratio and so forth. But there is the, the, the situation that is that as you reduce the aspect ratio, uh, well, uh, the the uh, you cannot match the omnigenity um, perfectly. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a compromise you have to have. So you cannot have aspect ratio of two and perfect omnigenous fields and so forth. So there's some sort of a weighing you have to do there. And in this kind of configuration of omnigenous configuration, can you find the difference between quasi symmetric close to quasi or let's say omnigenous helical omnigenous uh, axisymmetric and poloidally omnigenous? Let's say. Usually in quasi symmetric devices you have a smaller large a smaller aspect ratio, while quasi isodynamics are larger aspect ratio. That's right. Did you find something similar in this in general? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so with with QA and OT you can go to lower aspect ratio. So with OP and QP you're you're a bit more stuck on the <laughs> the uh, higher aspect ratio, generally speaking. But but our our a big data analysis paper is going to come out. We haven't that finished that, so maybe I can give you a better answer than when we have, you know, like a million of these things, and we 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 do better uh, uh, quantitative analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have run out of time. So thank you very much for this interesting talk and for your answer to the question. Okay, uh, yeah, let's start. Okay. Yeah, hello, everyone. Welcome to this session uh, with uh, the first uh, talk given by Jan Narbut from uh, IPP Greisfeld uh, describing simulations of fully global electromagnetic turbulence in uh, stellate double seven x Jan, please. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, okay, uh, yeah. That was basically the introduction and also the title. So um, what is the current situation, uh, which is uh, important for my work? And so in accelerators with the recent of all the new classical optimization that happened in recent time, um, we are now facing the problem that instabilities and turbulence are the performance limiting factors in accelerators. Um, and while we do understand instabilities and turbulence, I, I think quite good on, uh, on on low beta and electrostatically, uh, we have very thin data on high beta instabilities and turbulence, and this is a problem that needs to be addressed. Also, furthermore, we do need global codes uh, to simulate uh, accelerators, especially because of the complex geometry. Um, and so they are necessary, but they are also very new and demanding tools in, in the context of fusion research. And um, so it's also important that we know, uh, that we learn how to use them. And to address all this, or this is all around my work, and to address all this, I did simulate a W7X UFM configuration, um, where I was interested in kinetic balloon modes, but also general high beta behavior. And for this, I did a scan in beta electromagnetically linear for now to observe growth rates and frequency and basically see what other observations I can make along the way. And also to learn more about global codes and the numerical demand uh, they use in different situations. I had a look at that, but more on that later. And last but not least, I will show uh, a turbulent simulation where we observe some particle and heat fluxes. Okay. So what is the UFM configuration? Um, it's a theoretical W7X configuration that has not been tested in the experiment yet. Uh, hopefully it will in the future, but we don't know yet. Uh, it's a very low shear configuration, as you can see in the plot, and it's also a QI configuration, just uh, like W7X is, as you can see on the top right. It's of course not perfect, but this is what it is. 
Um, for the profiles, I assumed equal temperatures and a finite temperature gradient. You can see the normalized profiles on the right. Uh, also, I assumed the finite density. And to scan in beta, we just increased the density. And the simulation was done with Utopi. Uh, bear in mind, I'm only a user here, not a developer. And Utopi is a global particle inside the Delta F code, meaning that it basically just pu uh, pushes particles back and forth and also just evolves the perturbed part of the distribution function. Uh, for now, the simulations were done linear, but fully electromagnetic with Delta B parallel. Uh, they were collisionless and fully kinetic, but we had a slightly increased mass ratio just to speed up the simulations. And the scale of the simulations is on the order of the flow radius and a bit higher. So what about the physics? If you look at the right, you can see two plots. In the top plot, you can see the growth rate, whereas in the bottom plot, you can see the frequency of um, what I extracted from the turpy. And as you can see, uh, if you concentrate on the purple and green line, you can see the typical behavior of the ITG that is stabilized by increasing beta. Um, and um, also based, uh, you can see this also on the frequency that it's slightly beta dependent. But as soon as we reach approximately 2.5 to 3% beta, we do see a change in physics. We do see a destabilization of some mode. But most interestingly here is that this mode does seem to go into the electron dimagnetic direction, which is surprising. This is not something that we did expect it. And so we invested, uh, investigated this a bit and did other simulations. And for example, if uh, we turned off the electron temperature gradient while keeping the overall drive the same, this is when uh, the, the, the blue lines over here, and we can see that we jump back to the uh, to the ion dimagnetic direction and basically jumping back to the, uh, to the HD. Also, what we did is we disabled the particle trapping via the mirror force in uh, the simulation. This is when the blue dot. And you can also see um, that when the mode also comes back to being ITG. Uh, other tests we did was we simulated lower mode numbers, so larger scales. Uh, the, those are then the, uh, the slightly orange lines over here. And uh, we then seem to get kinetic balloon modes. However, they do appear to be quite stable over here, but that's what it is for now. Um, for uh, last but not least, we did uh, disable the ion temperature gradient. And what we then saw is a very strong destabilization for 0% uh, beta and also 4% beta. I, you can see the arrows pointing up here to the very high growth rates. Um, and this one also further indicates that definitely the electron temperature gradient is responsible for this mode here. Looking at other diagnostics, um, one of the diagnostics I used was um, the ratio of the perturbed magnetic to electric energy. This you can see in the top right corner, where the ratio is displayed in the uh, log 10, um, in log 10 units. And as you can see, the ratio concentrating on the purple and green line does increase exponentially with beta. Why it does increase so steadily with uh, with beta um, is not yet known. We don't know this. But very interesting to observe is that once the ratio crosses a value of 1, this is also where the critical um, beta is. And then the transition in the frequency and the uh, growth rate occurs. Also, if we look at the other simulations that we did, we see that for all those simulations, excuse me, um, that for all those simulations, the ratio does decrease and go either close to a value of one or below, and then signal again a transition to another physics service ratio may can uh, may serve as a proxy to see what's happening in the physics. Um, another diagnostic that I had a look at is the phase space and um you can see this in the in the bottom right with the parallel velocity on the x-axis and the perpendicular on the y-axis and this color scheme here indicating the j.e diagnostic so that is the transfer of energy from particles to the fields and vice versa with uh, the sign uh, with a negative sign indicating that the particles destabilize uh, the fields um and you can see here for the ions that nothing, uh, not a lot happens, uh, mostly just a bit of Landau damping. However, if we go to the electrons, you can see a vastly different picture, and you can see that all the drive is happening within the trapping cone, as indicated by the blue lines. 
And not a lot is happening outside of a trapping cone. So most of the drive really is by trapped electrons. Um, we do have uh, the drive and damping from trapped electrons, but uh, the drive by trapped electrons is overwhelming here. And this seems to determine the mode. Um, to further confirm this, uh, I'm also showing now the phase space for the electrons uh, when we disabled uh, the mirror force. And then this whole phase space structure is gone and is replaced by an alphanic resonance which you can see uh, so here outside of the driving cone in the bottom, this is hinted at, but this is just probably pushed aside by all the trapping effects. And so um, authentic resonance doesn't have a chance to, uh, uh, is dominated by the trapping effects. Okay, um, talking about that, I wanna now shortly go into numerics and numerical convergence. And I did uh, various things, so I varied uh, time step markers, but also grid size to see what happens. And uh, you can see all the um, all the numbers up here in the table and plot down here. And as you can see, the, the purple line, which is case number one, was our cheap scale, which only with only a few thousand core hours, so pretty cheap. And if you look at all the simulations, you can see that. Uh, far away from the critical beta, there is not a lot of difference in the growth rate. This is also the case for the frequency and all the other diagnostics. Um, uh, the, the only difference here is at 4% beta, you can see here where I simulated the true uh, mass ratio, uh, which was quite expensive with 24 times more uh, core hours needed uh, compared to the cheapest case. Uh, the only difference here was the frequency increased by a factor of two, but otherwise the, the growth rate had a slight shift, but basically everything otherwise looked the same, so not a lot of tension physics, so that is good news. Um, but if we go close to the transition at the critical beta, we see vast differences in the physics, and here we even went as far to simulating the electron skin of, so um, increasing the grid resolution by a lot. Uh, which is a factor of 72 more than the Cheap's case. And uh, close to the transition, you have to go this far because there are two modes competing here. Um, and so a slight difference in the differences in numerical resolution can have big differences in the outcome. So the good news is uh, that the simulations are relatively cheap far away from mode transitions here. But the bad news is that close to the mode transitions, uh, close to a critical beta, they can be very expensive and you have to go that far and use the resources. Otherwise, you're constantly going back and forth um, with which mode you're getting. Okay, um, now again, giving a short physics summary. So we saw the stabilization of an ITG with increasing beta, which is what we all know. But past the critical beta, we saw a transition to a uh, mode rotating in the electron direction, which is further stabilized with, uh, destabilized with beta. Um, uh, the mode also seems to become more magnetic when electrostatic pass with critical beta and has a very strong drive for trapped electrons. Furthermore, uh, the mode seems to vanish for uh, for the uh, for no mirror force or no trapping effects, vanishing uh, electron temperature gradient and also a larger scale or no mode numbers. Um, and all this behavior is also confirmed with uh, gene simulation, uh, so they, they show the same uh, physics. And uh, the conclusion, uh, so this uh, the, the conclusion then is that this is a high beta electromagnetic electron temperature gradient driven trapped electron mode, which is quite interesting. This is definitely not something I expected to observe here. And the only unclear point right now is uh, which parity this mode have, whether it's ballooning or tearing. Maybe we'll figure this out in the future. Okay. Um, so I, pro I did promise, uh, I did show, uh, say, turbulence in the title, um, but I was sadly not able to finish the nonlinear runs for the UFM case. So I'm giving you a teaser right now. So uh, what a lot of our colleagues in the Stellarator uh, theory department do is optimizing uh, Stellarator configurations for various, um, uh, with various goals. And three of our colleagues, uh, they optimized the configuration for uh, turbulence. And what they did here is they focus less on uh, being MHD stable, but try to basically push the critical uh, temperature gradient for the onset of ITG turbulence uh, as, as far up as possible uh, to decrease the ion uh, ITG heat fluxes. And you can see the configuration on the right is uh, really a heli um, uh, helical uh, uh, symmetry, and it's uh, very good going from axis to to uh, to the edge. And 
um, a supervisor did the simulation while I uh, while I evaluated the simulation, and the server simulation was uh, also done with utopy, nonlinear, also fully electromagnetic with that to be parallel collisionless, uh, but uh, fully gyrokinetic uh, kinetic with an increased mass ratio, and basically the same profiles as I used before. And this was conducted at a moderate, um, a kind of an intermediate volume average beta. Uh, so going into the results on the top right corner, you can see the uh, total electric fields over, over time. And there are three phases in the simulation. First of all, there's, uh, there's an ITG, as you can see, and the poloidal cut below at the phi equals zero plane. And on the inboard side, um, this is the proof of color scheme here indicates the normalized uh, electrostatic potential. Um, and on the inboard side, you can see a uh, high mode number and ITG, uh, trying to extract uh, or when ex extracting the growth rate and the mode number from this uh, simulation. This is very interestingly, very close to what they obtained in linear gene, uh, gene runs in the papers of the authors of this configuration. Um, going into the next phase of the simulation, we do see a ballooning mode. As you can see in the plot, this when the ITG in the middle is then slowly going to vanish. And you can basically see on the color um, that this is uh, really ballooning on the outboard side of the configuration and less active on the inboard side. Uh, why is this a ballooning mode and not a kinetic ballooning mode? Uh, a colleague of us, uh, Carly Nuremberg, did a simulation with CAS3D MHD stability code. And in that simulation, she did find uh, the same dominant uh, mode. As we did in utopia, though with a slightly, uh, with a, with an increased growth rate, almost by a factor of two. Uh, the reason here presumably is because utopia is a kinetic code, while Casper D is not, and um, so our mode is kinetically modified. Um, though, um, this, this, despite despite the name, this is not a kinetic ballooning mode, because the scale of this ballooning mode in the simulation is presumably too small to be a kinetic ballooning mode. Uh, this is a bad nomenclature at this point, but I didn't invent it. Um, and in the last phase of this uh, simulation, we're going to the saturation phase, which you can also see in the plot where the ballooning mode is then overlaid with uh, zonal flow. Um, it is not clear whether the zonal flow explicitly is responsible here for the saturation, but it appears nonetheless. But what we can do now in this phase is we observe fluxes. And in the middle part, you can observe the heat fluxes in time, and then in the bottom, the particle fluxes uh, in time. And you can see that both are looking pretty much the same. And they're strongly oscillating um, back and forth. Um, um, you can see that they are strongly oscillating back and forth. And uh, the heat flux is here connected to the particle flux. And the reason is the following. Um, uh, we started out the simulation with uh, with flat density, so zero density gradient, and this seems to cause a particle pinch, which causes inward particle flux. This then seems to build up the density gradient, which causes mode, uh, some sort of mode activity, which then causes strong outward flux and flattens the density gradient again. And so basically, the plasma is push, uh, is being pushed back and forth, and this then also transports a lot of heat with it. But this is because the plasma is moved, not because the heat is moved. So this was a very interesting to observe. And this then also brings me to my... Uh, conclusions, but since I'm already over time, I'll let you read it myself. Just saying um, the next steps is for me, I want to investigate kinetic balloon modes and low mode numbers in the UFM configuration. And also I want to do those nonlinear simulations to observe the fluxes and see whether the kinetic ballooning modes or high beta short electron mode dominates in the UFM configuration. Okay, thank you for attention. I hope this was good. Yeah, thank you, Jan, for your talk. Uh, mm -hmm. There the are questions, Thomas, uh, please. Uh... Mm -hmm. I, yeah, and on the the final example where you had this first structure, which I in this early phase, which is this what you were labeling as the ITG? Um, uh, this one. So this yes. to me looks. I mean, okay, st stellarators are complicated, but to to me this mm. looks anti ballooning. Is this a property that you see in structures uh, commonly, or, or or what's going on here? Okay, uh, so for the, for the ITG. Uh, this is apparently for, um, as far as I understand it, in Tokamax, you would expect the ITG to be strictly on the outboard side because of the curvature. But in Stellarators, as far as I understand it, uh, the curvature is generally a bit more complicated and you can't necessarily expect to be the ITG on the outboard side. But I also might be wrong here. This is, this is my understanding so far. But I, I agree that it looks strange. Thank you.
Uh, Hieronimo, please. Yes, uh, hello. Do you have uh, any clue or indications about the potential impact of this uh, electromagnetic extrapolator motor and non linearly? Um, uh, sorry again. Please. Could you repeat your question, Hieronimo? Yes, ah, uh, yes. Do you have indications of what kind of flux? Uh, can drive this electromagnetic mode uh, you have shown at the beginning of your talk. Oh, um, what, what kind of flux? Uh, well, I would assume since uh, trapped electrons are most responsible here, uh, they are also going to drive a flux, but honestly, I don't know yet. I, I will find out though. Okay. Yeah. Maybe question on my side. Uh... In uh, nonlinear simulations, uh, electromagnetic nonlinear simulations that you have performed or observed, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. what kind of flux can you see there? It's, it's follow up to Hieronymus question essentially. Do you see uh, like uh, huge heat fluxes, for example, or? Um, huge... Really, okay. I think I, I do see uh, more heat fluxes than particle fluxes, but. Uh, I think it's not exclusively limited to to heat fluxes. I mean, maybe maybe you can show heat flux from 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 that uh, uh, solar data that the nonlinear simulations that you will exactly mm -hmm. yes that's a heat mm -hmm. flux of yeah of course it's uh, well, I mean, it's the unstable configuration right yeah it's it's a bit unstable the thing is to to really extract the heat flux here one would have to try to correct the heat flux for basically the sloshing of a particle flux and and yeah and, 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 but, and... but still in zero bomb units it's like 15 20 right it's 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 not mm -hmm. and it sort of saturates in a sense it's clearly a non-linear phase and mm -hmm. does not yeah i mean if you would kind of try to to average over this you would get a few gyro bomb I, I suppose uh in in, in the mean value in the uh, uh, volume averaged yeah, yeah, the, the, the strong oscillations do not appear if uh, MHD uh, stability is uh, satisfied in, a, in other configurations, more benign. From this yeah, this, um, yeah, this is also a, a thing in this configuration. We um, actually were sacrificed a bit of the MHD stability. And as far as I can remember, this, uh, for example, a Mercier uh, criterion is not fulfilled at every point. So this might have to do with it. If there are no further questions, I don't see any. Right now, we can move forward. And yeah, uh, thank you very much, okay. Jan, for your presentation. Okay. It's time for the next talk. Yeah, hello. Please share your screen. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yeah, it's not full screen yet, but... Uh, no, no, it's a full screen. <laughs> Sorry. So, so hi everyone. I'm Lin Wanhao from Southwestern Institute of Physics in China. Uh, the topic of my talk is the is about the formation of internal transport barrier in HL to a tokamak. So HL, so internal transport barrier, the IDB is a localized region in tokamak with large gradient of temperature or density. Here we have a typical IDB discharge in our HL to a uh, this IDB, as we can see, triggers at at uh, 510 milliseconds, and after 100 milliseconds, it becomes fully formed and afterwards well sustained. Uh, such IDB indicates that conf the confinement is improved, and uh, it is only generated when the heat flux is suppressed. And as the heat flux is driven mostly by the micro instability or micro turbulence. The mechanism for IDB must rely on any method to suppress this micro instability. So we have, for example, the zonal flow and equals B shear, and it's also reported lately that the effect of fast time also have a st stabilizing effect. So as for the characteristic of IDB in HL2A, uh, they are mostly operated with high power neutral beam injection. Uh, compared to the low density of the plasma. So we have really high fraction of fast ion density and the beta 
is also high and it's not high but, but it's increased and we have plasma rotation and uh, equals b shear and another interesting phenomenon is that uh these idb are often found coexisting with with the n1 long lonely mode here in the spectrum of the monoid coil we can see that after the uh, idb is sugar we can see a, a long lasting and persistent mode here of about 21 kilohertz and another weak mode here at 70 kilohertz. So since we have all these factors, one main naturally asks the following questions. Uh, which one is the main cause of IDB triggering in HL2A? Uh, if, and if one of them are affected during the IDB triggering, will it be mental throughout the whole process of IDB formation, uh, including the, the IDB sustaining phase, that is when the anti-hemorrhage gradient are large and stable. So I will talk, we will try to address this uh, question. So this is the outline of our talk. Uh, we have finished the introduction and we will begin with the simulation setup. And we will analyze the instability that reside in our simulation. And the knowledge of this instability will help us understand the transport reduction in the nonlinear simulations. And we will explain how uh, the IDB in HL2A is triggered and sustained. And more importantly, why we believe that this IDB is self-sustained. And finally, we will give a summary. So our turbulent and transport energy were carried out by performing gyrokinetic simulation, which is a five-dimensional simulation because the gyro motion is averaged out. And the, and the velocity of equation is so coupling with the Maxwell equation. The, the code we use is the famous string code, and we take parameters directly uh, from, from the experiment at both the triggering time, the 510, and, and at the time when IDB is fully formed, uh, at 650, as, as shown in these figures. And some parameters, such as the density of fast ion, the beta, and the equals ratio, will be scanned to provide indications for IDB formations. And we have used high resolution and uh, many uh, medical or computational time to produce this result. We, we have concluded the details for the parameters in our paper, and they are omitted here. So let's start analyze the instability in here. So here is a, a spectrum of the linear growth rate and frequencies. Uh, we indicate different parameters by different colors, and the experiment time is indicated by the by error. So the common thing here is the undamaged gradient mode. Uh, as is well known, it, it is stabilized by the beta effects. But here, in addition to beta, uh, we can see that it is also stabilized by the fast ion, fast ion dilution effect. Another notable mode is the high frequency mode in the low end region. Uh, this is what we identify as the beta induced awaning mode. It is an electromagnetic mode destabilized by the gradient of thermal ion instead of fast ion. And they only appear in the condition of final beta. And, and we must comment that uh, these lim linear simulations are limited because we didn't include the equals B share, because the equals B algorithm is not compatible with the linear convergence monitor in the in gene. And these modes are decoupled. And in such a case, the normal mode is, is stable. Uh, but when we include the, the equals V share and made the mode coupling, we will find the zone level very dominant. This cannot be compared with the experiment because you cannot detect the zero frequency fluctuation in, in the experiment. So we had to we we have removed them in this figure, but they're actually present in, in the simulation. And, and after we do this, we find two uh high frequency mode at uh, at 650. Why there, there is no other mode in the 510, uh, only a lot a broadband of the low frequency fluctuation. So if we compare in detail these two modes with the experiment, considering the rotation frequency, we find there are one of them are the M1 lonely mode and the other are the M2 BAE. Uh, although there are some inconsistent in the amplitude, but this should be okay. And, and we, we should know here again that the free energy of this low end mode derived from the IDB generated uh, large temperature gradient because they never emerged before IDB, only 
only after it. So another ob observation is that the lonely mode is sensitive to equals V sharing, without which uh, it won't appear either. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the transport reduction analysis. Uh, in this figure, we plot in, in the left the nonlinear fast spec fast spectra uh, obtained directly from the nonlinear simulation, and then in the right, their total value along with the with a dashed line indicate the prediction of quasi-linear model. So the first observation here is that most of the files are driven by the IDG modes. Uh, the low end EMO, although they are very dominant in the frequency, sorry, they are very dominant in the frequency spectrum, uh, they made little contribution to the directly to the flux. And after comparing all the V and without case uh, indicated by the color, we can see that uh, at 510, the, the flux is mostly uh, reduced by the effect of fast and dilutions. Uh, this involves only linear physics because every everything can be reproduced by the cross-linear model without without even need a nonlinear simulation. So uh, another observation is that the equal ratio make little difference at at the uh, five hundred ten as well as the later time. At the later time, on the other hand, the first is reduced mostly by the nonlinear effect of beta. Uh, what what is important here is that. Uh, this transport reduction in five, in six hundred and fifteen uh, deviates significantly from the prediction of quasi-linear model, and which indicates that the nonlinear coupling here should be essential, and um, we should discuss it in detail in the following. So, so when we so this pro so here we plot the uh, iron heat flux and the zonal flow energy together in this for the case vm without beta uh, in the beginning of both cases uh, when the zonal flow energy is low we can see that the heat flux here grows almost linearly and for the for the case without beta in the left uh, the zonal flow energy will soon saturate and the heat flux of the of, of a thermal iron will begin to fluctuating around a certain value. But in the condition of finite beta, we see that the zonal flow in the right develop in a much larger amplitude and almost almost three times larger than this one. So, and in the meanwhile, the heat thrust is drastically reduced uh, until the zonal flow energy saturates. So we conclude here that the zone of flow growth is the key factor of the sustaining of ITB at 615 milliseconds. And uh, so one and then one may ask, what's the cause of this zone of flow growth in the condition of finite beta? Uh, to, to answer these questions, we, we, we need to know that the zone of flow only grows when they are coupled with other modes. So we need to account, account for the, the contribution from any other end. And according to these formulas, uh, we have we have do the calculation and the re result is, is, is shown here. For the case without without finite beta, we see that the zone of flow energies are mostly fed by the ITG mode because this is the peak growth rate peak of ITG. But but for the for the case we finite beta, the low end EMO will destabilize and they make the most contribution to the zone of flow. Energy. So this completes the final piece of our reasoning about the, about the ITB formation. And we, we, we can explain it by this chart. First of, first of all, the, the ITB is triggered by the fast ion dilutions. Uh, this happens linearly, we or without finite beta. But after ITB is triggered, we believe we believe that ITB as a Abundant source of free energy that can destabilize the lonely mode, which in, in, which uh which ch transfer the energy obtained to the zonal flow, and the later in return help reduce the fast and sustain the ITB. 
And all of this have happened only with, with final beta. So it is the IDB itself, we believe that we believe that uh, provide a mechanism that help is sustainment. So so we so we call it the self sustainment of IDB. So finally, here is our summary. So we think the triggering of IDB is caused by the dilution effect of fast iron. Uh, and after the triggering of IDB, the dilution effect uh, should not be sufficient to sustain this IDB. Instead, the effects of final beta are indis indispensable. And, uh, and we did not find any significant difference made by the equal speed share. So they are not playing any role. And we propose this uh, self sustainment mechanism of IDB because the IDB is sustained by the growth of zone flow, which live on the lonely mode that is destabilized by IDB itself. And we characterize the full IDB formation in SL2A Thomas. Uh, a, a so-called self-organized system. So, so that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your talk. Uh, Thomas has a question, please. Hi, you had very high resolution, particularly in the radial spectral direction. Yes. yes. My because question. Have... So my question is: Given that you already have a very high um, radio resolution, did you try global simulations? Because I could imagine that this might not be so much harder given that you already have very large uh, number of points in KX. Yeah. For, for the global simulation, there's another problem that the fast ion distribution function we use is the Maxwell distribution function. We, we believe this distribution function is not, is not suitable in global simulation because we found very strange behavior when we include the fast iron in global simulation. So that's, that's, that's why we didn't do the global simulation. Could, could you clarify what do you mean by, by strange behavior? I mean, lots of people use these this distribution in global simulation, so I'm curious. Because we, we found we found very, very negative frequency when, when we add the fast iron in, into the simulation. So we don't believe that it is realistic. So, so, so there, there may be some, there must be some problem. Otherwise, they, they cannot be that, that negative. Okay, thank you. Alessandro Di Siena? Uh, yeah, no, regarding to this point, uh, uh, I'm very surprised That's that you surprising. cannot run global simulations uh, using uh, fast particles in this scenario. Uh, because, I mean, as Thomas is saying, uh, we use Maxwellian and fast particles for global simulations uh, for ASDEX, JET, ITER, and we never have any issues. So maybe it's due to the numerical setup that was used. I, 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 check, I, I check your work previously. Did you ever test the fast line distribution function in the global simulation? I mean, the, the, the latest work you, you publish is, is about a local simulation, right? Uh, we have run global simulation uh, using uh, B Maxwellian distributions and slowing down, and that uh, even uh, shifted Maxwellian, and uh, the code is stable and there is no issue. So it could I mean, either they, they, be due no, to there's no sorry, yeah, please go ahead. But there's there's no finite obvious risk in Gene Y. The the effect of finite F O W finite obvious risk. Uh, there's no such no I think Gina is, uh, I don't think that's true I mean Gina is in principle uh, all these effects included uh, because, it could be it could be an issue of the because if even the, the distribution function you use is uh, uh, is dependent of the of the sorry sorry I don't remember the words it's, the the radio coordinate the radio coordinate is the flux coordinate if 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 the if the distribution function you use is dependent on the flux coordinate you shouldn't have consider the effect of final obesity because of the effect of final obesity will cause the problem that the the radio dependence should be should be over uh so we you should also include the the toroidal toroidal angle. I think the idea is to, to use canonical Maxwellian instead of just local Maxwellian. That's that's so okay. uh, I, you are suggesting to use distribution function, uh, which is a function of constants of motion. Is that what you are saying? Uh, yeah, 
maybe, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't understand you fully. Yeah, uh, uh, the arbitrates you are talking about. You you want to replace uh, the radial coordinate with something like canonical momentum coordinate. That's what you suggest. That that is your concern, to my understanding. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, maybe. maybe. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean that. Uh, I think uh, maybe we can discuss maybe offline because there could be that there is some. Um, numerical setting of the code which is uh, which can be tuned uh, to make the simulation stable because the i mean even if you don't have some effects the code <laughs> should not uh, give weird behavior i mean and uh, the, the code should work and uh, if it's not working correctly maybe uh, there is something in the setup which is not uh, uh, properly tuned maybe so if you want we can discuss this offline Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, maybe a question on my side. Uh, the long lived mode is uh, normally kind of kink instability. Uh, to, to mind, at, at least uh, this is what uh, people are saying based on kink instability. And in that sense, it's a bit uh, surprising that you uh, get uh, something related to a kink. Uh, using flux tube formulation. I mean, BAEs are also global modes. So do you think that flux tube formulation is sufficient for this? Well, I completely don't think it is sufficient, but it, 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 this is all we have. So because we, we can use the global simulation, as I say, because the, the when we add the first line, the, the, the frequency will get in linear simulation. Only we, we never try the global nonlinear simulation. In linear simulation, we, we, we will get a very strange behavior of the uh, frequency spectrum when we include the fast time. Yeah. This is what so, so we... Flux tube may be not very so, appropriate. So, so even even though we, we think this is not sufficient, we, we must live on it. So this, this is what mm. Okay, okay. Uh, Colin has a question. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I just want, you didn't mention the role of the Q profile at all in your talk. And I was just wondering because- Yes, the, yes, yes. The Q profile yeah. is very important for for ITBs. So, what can you say? What uh, the role of it was here? Yeah, this is the, exactly the question uh, the referee asked when we published the paper. Uh, this is because the 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 cube of the cube of the mechanism of the Q profile uh, is 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 only reported uh, effective when there is a MHD activity uh, before the ITB is triggering. But but here we can see that for for most of the uh this ITB discharge in HL2A, the the lonely mode only only appear after the ITB is triggering instead of before it. So so we believe that the the and and uh, and it is only reported the Q one Q one provide is related to ITB triggering. So so we we believe. The, the the Q provide only effective uh as, as they 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 it is the condition that the lonely mode level uh, but it did not directly uh play a role in the ITB triggering because we did not see the, any uh, MGD activity before ITB triggering but only after it. so so th this is why we, we did not consider the the effect of original Q. Okay, you're looking at a complicated Sorry. situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there is a comment on chat from Thomas about importance of canonical or distribution function depending on constants of motion in general. Uh, but this is, of course, as yeah, Alessandro yeah. Diciana said, not necessary condition in simulations. The code should still work, and if it doesn't work, then Yes, it, 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 this is what I mean previously because because the the first coordinate is not a constant of motion. You only mm -hmm. you have to you have to consider yeah, right. the toroidal uh, toroidal moment. The, so. Yeah, and using flux tube for MHD type is not is not always correct. Okay, uh, good. Uh, 
it's time for for, <laughs> for the next uh, stage in the, in the conference it's i think break uh, uh yeah uh, thank you very much for your presentation and thank you for your presentations let's close the session thank you thank you thank you bye bye Hello everyone, I am Julio Gutierrez from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. I'm going to chair the session. Today we have two talks on atomistic modeling of materials. The first speaker is Javier Dominguez from the NOMA 10 Center of Excellence in Poland. So Javier, when you are ready, please feel free to share the screen and start. Okay. Hi. Hello, Julio. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. So, so I think you can see my screen, right? I guess. Yes, yeah, all right. Okay, okay. So I'm going to start. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work. Um, uh, today I'm going to discuss something that um, Dr. Udo von Tussain uh, from Max Planck Institute and I have been dealing with for the last years. Um, I, want, I would like to present this work to everybody to share our findings and also the way we are trying to analyze threshold and the formation defects in hydrogenated tungsten, which is uh, a little bit uh, challenging. To, to model from the point of view of numerical for optimistic simulations because the goal of this project is actually to model non indentation of hydrogenated tungsten, which has been uh, the, the, the dream to have clean energy to develop a nuclear fusion reactor to try to understand what is uh, what are the physical and chemical mechanisms between the interaction of plasma with the tungsten materials which then we need also novel materials like refractory, tungsten based high entropy alloys, binary alloys. So we would like to understand first what is happening of tungsten, the interaction of the tungsten with hydrogen or the helium. And to further go to some alloys and the interaction of the helium, tungsten based high entropy alloys. The MD simulations that I'm going to talk about, everything is based on molecular dynamic simulations for single collision cascades and very low PKA in order to understand where is the threshold, where exactly is the, the, the value that creates the single uh, interstitial vacancy and this kind of defects. We are considering a small cell to analyze, to have good statistics, Different, different uh, orientations of the velocity of the projectile with random velocities, everything to have good statistics from 20 electron volts to 100 electron volts. Um, we are using different methods. For example, the machine, the novel, the, this new uh, interatomic uh, potentials that are based in the Gaussian approximation potential are now called tap gap to speed up the MD simulations that are developed in collaboration with the University of Helsinki. Also, the well-known and celebrated uh, adaptive bond order uh, potentials or terms of potentials that everybody, almost everybody's using for the interaction of tungsten with the helium. Um, also the EAM potentials. Tungsten samples we are considering two extremes, 0.05% and then saturated uh, tungsten samples. In order to, to, to verify and to target for MD simulations based on machine learning potentials with some approximation to get the interaction between tungsten and hydrogen, we uh, analyze first what is happening with pristine tungsten. The top gap potentials by the machine learning based interatomic potentials, you only have the training data set that I'm showing here with different subsystems, different positions, lattice, and uh, interaction defects, considering interstitial vacancies, divacancies, the liquid phase, uh, ground ions, everything needs to be calculated by EFT uh, calculations, the DFT simulations. We compute the force, the energy for all of this, we put it in the training data set, and we obtain for machine learning interatomic potential for performing simulations with lumps in, in my case. But this, it, it can be performed uh, with other MD 
eh, package. It's only cre the creation of the gap interesting potentials. And now we currently have other potentials for tungsten, tantalum, tungsten, vanadium, different alloys to have the, the, the high entropy alloy. But still, the question is what is happening when you have the deuterium or hydrogen in the sample? In order to analyze the defects, we know that Wigner size method is a little bit challenging because you have the Victor cells and sometimes you can miscount the number of interstitials with the vacancies if your thickness cell is not well adapted to, uh, to, to your molecular dynamic simulations, especially at high temperature or when we are analyzing the defects. Uh, and hydrogen is really small compared to tungsten, so we cannot use thickness cells. For this reason, Dr. Udo Pontosen and myself uh, developed the fingerprint and a visualization analyzer defects based on the roots of Gaussian approximation process, which is only to use the description of and the atomic description of the atomic environment of a single atom, what are the nearest neighbor, what is the energy of the atoms around, and all of this needs to be put in the data set as a reference. For example, we have a pristine BCT sample, which can have really good and good reference. Then we go to, to compute everything to tungsten. We know the the physics and all the structure of these thin tungsten samples. Then when we identify something that is not a BCC uh, lattice point, we say, okay, this is a point defect, and we start the classification. We know that we have interstitials, we have Franken pairs, we have uh, dumb dumbbells, we have tribe ions, and some other labels that people can give to these defects. But then when we have no clue about what is, is this a divacancy, is this is a cloud ion with some vacancy next to it. What is this? Sometimes we don't have label and we don't have the characterization. We take this defect and probably this is an artifact of the interatomic potentials. So we even can test interatomic potentials to say, well, um, this is not wet model and this is not even physically correct by checking with abinistic calculations. We give, give it to, to Fabat to retrain it and to identify the defects. This is then applied and we can see all the defects and cleaning and cleaning the sample based on this description of the atomic environment. And um, this can be improved and being more robust to analyze the samples. For example, this defect that is here in tungsten, sometimes it's a divacancy. We didn't have the descriptor of this divacancy. So we found it with the physical component analysis uh, and tools that now are known as machine learning tools. And we found that, that this is a divacancy. We compute the description of this divacancy and put it in the training data set. Then we analyze it again, and we import now that now we can analyze even the defects and the voids and the vacancies that are in the samples. To make it like a visualization more beautiful for everybody, we also can compute the, the size and the volume of the voids where are the interstitials, where are the bias vacancy, we can characterize all the defects with respect to the training data set that we, we have. Uh, it turned out that this method won the IIR challenge in 2018, and now we are making it more robust to apply it to iron, to not only BCC materials, to FTC materials, and to other different uh, materials, FTP, or and something that is in front of us. The next step is to analyze what is the threshold and how to classify these defects of only pure sample, the pure tungsten sample. We perform a collision cascade at very low impact energies, like 20, 40, 30 electron volts, and then we characterize the self interstitial atoms. We calculate the defects. What are the distance between the pristine or the uh, defect free sample to the defected one? And we can, in this way, build a histogram of the counts and characterize even at a given temperature, not only zero, a zero Kelvin, at a given temperature, what are the defects in the cell interstitial atoms for different methods, EAM, TERSO, DAP, GAP, and GAP. We have a reference and a, a, a tabulated data for the next uh, analysis of the hydrogenated samples. It turned out when we found the TAP, GAP, uh, the, the first call is at uh, for example, this is different crystal orientations. When you have one, one, one crystal orientation, or the velocity is in the, oriented in the one, one, one direction, 
And the velocities by this by electron volts for the 0, 0, 001 orientation is 50 electron volts, which is in good uh, agreement with the res re result reported in the literature. However, 110 is the one that needs 75 electron volts. When we have uh, hydrogenated the data detect tungsten, now it's a little bit more difficult to characterize and to say this is a pristine sample. The thing that we do is to consider the sample that I'm showing here as the pristine one and the defect free one, and then we say, okay, we apply PCA, we apply FABA to describe what is happening here. Everything, all the atoms, tungsten atoms that are next to the deuterium, they are not defects at the beginning. They are only the samples that are next to hydrogen. After the collision cascade is done, then we perform again the power, and we can characterize very well where are the text, the, the, the self interstitial atoms that are decorated with the deuterium or with hydrogen by performing power. This is the principal component analysis that we, we, that we apply to identify where is the real defect. For example, this cluster, you have all the tungsten atoms that are in the PCC material and the deuterium atoms that are next to a tungsten that is not defected. And then we found the only defect that is there in the tungsten sample, which is an interstitial with deuterium decorated. We perform these simulations at different concentrations of deuterium. We track the shear strain to more or less know the mechanical properties of these defects because it was my idea to try to see where the strain is leading to the collision cascade, how the story of this collision cascade is given for different concentration of deuterium. It turns out that for when you have different cases, when you perform the collision cascade close to the hydrogen atom or really far from Earth, is different. And when you have the saturated case, it's exactly the same. When you have a concentration density of deuterium, it is completely different. The story is different than when you have a low concentration of deuterium. Even for a saturated state, the story can be different and the strain mapping, it would be different. When it, uh, when it comes to the analysis of the threshold energy, we notice that for projectile next to the deuterium atom, it needs only 30 electron volts to form a Frankel pair. But then when the tungsten atom is far from the deuterium, it needs again 55, 60 electron volts. And my, my, with this, I would like only to give the message of most of my work. This work is still in process because we need to test more, more uh, interatomic potentials. We need to test uh, more defects to try to analyze now the effects of the temperature and what is happening with the formation of these defects, the strain mapping, and even more results that can be now analyzed uh, precisely. And I would like to thank everybody for listening to me. Um, I hope I can reply to the questions. Thank you, Javier, for the talk and for keeping on time. The room is open for questions. We have the first one from Robert Iglesias. Uh, he said, hello, thanks for your excellent talk. I would like to ask why choosing that particular type of distance? Um, is FABAT portable to non-GAP IPs? Yes, actually this has been... Uh, thank you, Roberto, for this uh, question. The, the distance was uh, chosen as a first try to, to try to analyze and to make a, a histogram based on the descriptor vector of all the atoms. Because the, when you have the temperature, we are trying to describe the defect-free tungsten sample at a given temperature. And this distance was the only one that, to our knowledge, uh, was capable of giving us the right distance between this defect free of the sample at 300 Kelvin, 400 Kelvin, 500 Kelvin, to the other uh, defect, uh, defected sample. We still need to test other distances, this is true, but the normal distance was giving, on, giving us uh, positive pulses and we opt for more robust distance. Thank you so much. And then Fava also can export to non-GAP IPS, it is true. Yeah, we can apply it to whatever we want. It, it doesn't depend on the of the interatomic potentials. We have been applying it also for snap potentials and for on own uh, machine learning potentials that are based on neural network uh, methodologies. I guess I should read your articles. 
<laughs> I, I can I can send you the draft and we can discuss mm-hmm. later. Thank you so much for this for the for your help. Okay, thanks. So one question. Yes. When you try to identify defects or any distortion in the structure with Fabat, you already have to know in advance what you're gonna find, right? You have to put fingerprints of single defects, D vacancies, yes. intersections yes. and so on, right? First of all. Yes. Yes, exactly. But then when we perform the MD simulations and there is a defect that we don't know, that could be the new uh, the, the new descriptor. And we put it again in the training data set. But because of this method, we noticed that the initial uh, tap potentials, they have some defects that they are not physical and we corrected this interatomic potential. So how it was used is sometimes used even for own case to check if the interactomic potentials are okay and are not given on physical met- on physical defects. But when you test it with DFT with BASC, well, they are not energetically stable. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, so then you start like if you start from from completely from scratch, you can distinguish between perfect and not perfect, and then you can yes, start exactly. making groups. Of different yes, different. exactly. Exactly. Oh, okay. This is doing the categories, different categories of the defects. Okay, very cool. And how flexible is that to dynamic models? Because if you are running at you know, 300 or 1000 Kelvin, then you have atoms shaking, right? And if mm-hmm. you do that in a, in a single, so do you do that in a single snapshot or you take like some? No, no, no. The, the, whole, the whole numerical cell, the whole, you can take everything. You, you analyze everything with that simple structure. The, the descriptor is based on 100, 1,000 atoms, it depends on the defect. And then you compare with the whole numerical set. The, the cell can be a million of atoms. It, it is it's quite useful and it's really fast because and it's really comparison. Okay, but do you iterate over time? Do you take like a statistics or do you do like for every single time step? Ah, for every single tension. Yeah, oh, every okay. single velocity direction and doing the analysis of every single uh, MD simulation, even tracking where the formation is forming as a function of the time, everything. Yeah, and, and it's, it's usual, this this method. Yeah, I've been playing a little bit my own. So, uh, <laughs> Thank I, you oh, so much. <laughs> so uh, actually, I wanted to ask you, linking with this <laughs> thing I'm doing, or I was trying to do some time ago. Can you... Locate the preferential site of a defect. Like for example, I had I can tell you my, my special case. I had a mm-hmm. temperature gradient. Okay, I had a low system okay. has a big gradient of temperature from one side to the other. So okay. concentration of defects is different depending on temperature. Yes, exactly. So is it possible to say, you know, between zero and twenty Armstrong and between twenty and forty and so on as identify? I mean Apart, yeah, apart, yeah. I think it's like my, myself, but is it possible to do it automatically or you just... Yes, can't? it is It is possible, but I haven't updated the, the program. I apologize for that. Yeah, Udo also told me that I have to update it. Yes, it is possible. I'm sorry. So <laughs> there's a no way. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, we can discuss. Yeah, it is possible to do it. Okay, I mean, you, you can always slice it by hand, take you know, a group of atoms yeah. and run it several times, but... Yeah, but uh, we we have been working on it to uh, automatize it because you know Udo likes to do everything by itself and to do this machine learning, artificial intelligence. Yeah, we did it to to compute and extract the data, but yeah, I have enough data. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, everyone, thanks. And well, I think I have time for a for a last one. So you have compared actually different interatomic potentials. Yes. Do you have any conclusion of you know are Scientific potentials that bad are the machine learning potentials that good. Is it you know is worth the, uh, the effort of or the computational time to use it or? Yeah, the computational time, the interatomic potentials of for, for all these CBL terms of uh, EAM, they are okay for collision cascade. Practically all of them, when you have this snap potential uh, or new interatomic potential that we have been developing here in NCBL, that are neural network based. All of them for collision cascades are okay when you have something like 100,000 atoms. However, our goal is to perform nano-indentation simulation of the alterated, alterated constant. 
and we have several restrictions la, or we have several uh, yeah, restrictions for the MD simulation because we need to go to 15 million atoms and also we need excellent uh, surface information we need the information that tells barrier energies dislocations and we need extreme a lot of requirements so the size of the sample and if we want to perform an indentation with the snap potentials we need gpus and computer facilities like they have in los alamos or you know, the computer facilities that you have to perform such uh, md simulations but even in cbj we cannot afford gpus and uh, cpus and 1000 uh, processors so the only option that it turned out to be good for us was tough gap to to compete with these limitations and to more or less improve the traditional methods. So yeah, is the limitation of the computational time and that's the reason the only option was tough gap. Okay, so thanks for the thoughts on that. <laughs> uh, I could be interrogating you about the FABAT for much longer, but I think we have to move on because we are in the panel session. To stick to <laughs> yeah, if you want, if you want, we can have another online meeting whenever you want. It's okay. That would be really useful. Cool. Thanks. So thank, thank you, you for, your... for the thank you, talk. Next speaker of this session is Davide Gambino from the Linkopin University in Sweden. So Davide, if you are around, feel free to yes. share screen and yes. Um uh, okay, can I kick in just directly? Sure. All right, can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. So thank you so much for the introduction. Uh okay, so I'm Davide Gambino. I'm from uh, Lean Shopping University in Sweden. And uh, so now I'm gonna speak about um our work on the computational investigation of radiation damage in uh, uh, yttrium barium copper oxide superconducting tapes for nuclear fusion applications. So this work was conducted by me and the group of uh, Francesco Laviano at Politecnico di Torino, especially by da Daniele Torsello and Federico Ledda. And so let's dive in into the, the meat of the, uh, this talk. So well, to put in, cont in context my, my work, uh, so what I refer to as uh, nuclear fusion here, I'm focusing on uh, deuterium tritium fusion and the magnetic confinement approach. So uh, as you know, in the magnetic confinement approach, we are uh, uh, trying to confine the plasma with a strong magnetic field. And so, for example, for uh, ether, I think that uh, they are using like or they're planning to use uh, uh, ni niobium tin or niobium titanium uh, uh, um, superconducting cables to generate the strong magnetic field needed to confine the plasma. Uh, so, of course, these are the so-called low temperature superconductors. So you have to operate at very low temperatures. Um, but in the last years, there have been like a big, a big uh, uh, development of uh, instead the high temperature superconducting tapes. So here on the left, you see like um, a sketch of uh, such tapes. So you see that they are made of many components and the High temperature superconductor is only this one here. And uh, so what's important uh, of these high temperature superconductors is especially that they have a very high critical current. So uh, with the supercurrent that you can run in these uh, systems, like for example, at 20 Kelvin, you can generate, uh, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, magnetic fields of about 20 Tesla. So what does this mean? This means that uh, these, these uh, magnetic fields are much higher than the low temperature superconductors. And this means that we can reduce the size of the uh, fusion reactors. So as an example here, I show the ARC reactor, which is a compact fusion reactor, uh, like the design was developed at MIT. And in this reactor, this design is based on HTS tapes. And uh, in this reactor uh, design, like the major radius is only three meters. So the, the advantages of uh, compact reactors will be uh, that we have uh, well, smaller reactors means like they should be cheaper and easier to build. Uh, so, and we could be able to get to, to have fusion in a faster time. But there is always a but. Uh, because of the compact dimensions of these reactors, the neutrons uh, uh, <clears throat> generated in the plasma will reach the uh, HTS tapes and it will interact with the lattice. 
creating structural defects. Uh, these HTS uh, materials are very sensitive to defects. So here I show, for example, the superconducting properties of uh, many commercial uh, uh, tapes. Um, so what happens under uh, irradiation with neutrons to the superconducting properties of these tapes. This was a, a work published by Fisher and others. So what happens uh, is that with increasing neutron fluence, we have always that the critical temperature of this material uh, decreases. And this is due to the fact that uh, the crystal is not perfect anymore, and this uh, reduces the uh, critical temperature. Uh, for what concerns the critical current instead, we have initially that in introducing defects, uh, we have an increase in this uh, critical current. And this is uh, due to, the, um, to an effect called vortex spinning that I'm not going to explain so much about it. Uh, but anyway, what happens after uh, a certain level of neutron fluence is that in every case of uh, in any commercial tape, this critical current current will decrease. So this, of course, means that your tape under uh, operational conditions uh, after some time will uh, uh, get get worse superconducting properties, and therefore we really need to be able to evaluate the expected damage in uh, uh, in these materials. To, to estimate if the arc design is uh, valuable as it is and for how long it will last, the reactor. So to investigate these, um, uh, these uh, effects, uh, we have uh, published this paper here in uh, Superconductor Science and Technology. And uh, so what we have done here was to develop like a framework to uh, study uh, High, high temperature superconductors, starting from the model of uh, the reactor's geometry and going down to uh, actual molecular dynamic simulations of uh, uh, this system. So I'm going to go through the first parts of this workflow. That is not my expertise, but still like it's important to look uh, a bit into it. And then I will focus on the molecular dynamic simulations. So first of all, uh, as I said, we started from like a model of the reactor's geometry. So here, uh, of course, this was like a um, uh, simplified uh, geometry, although we consider all the layers in the reactor. So the toroidal field coil is the, the, the coil made of the HTS tapes. So here we have considered like a one dimensional model. So we have the neutrons uh, um, generated in the plasma here, passing through all the layers and arriving to the HTS state. We have uh, performed uh, Monte Carlo simulations with the FITS code. And we have obtained, therefore, a neutron spectrum at the HTS tape uh, at its location. Uh, so from FITS, one can also um, obtain uh, directly um, the DPAs for, as a function of like the neutron fluence. And so we have uh, estimated the, the neutron fluence in 10 years of the operation of ARC. And we have found that this uh, value is uh, about 10 times larger than the experiments performed in uh, nuclear fusion, fission uh, um, reactors uh, on these HTS tapes. So in these experiments, they estimated a DPA of about 0 .0, 0 0.02 uh, DPAs, whereas in the 10 years uh, um, uh, operation of ARC, we, we, we ex expect uh, one order of magnitude larger DPAs. So, at these levels of DPA, the superconductor will not work anymore. So this calls really for some uh, more some uh, more shielding in these reactors. So going on from uh, the neut uh, neutron spectra, we can get uh, the um, the spectra of uh, primary knock-on atoms uh, with the pKa spectra um, code. And uh, here you can see on the right the the pKa spectra for each element in the system. Uh, that we have considered, YBCO, uh, also called. Uh, and uh, these spectra are then needed for the molecular dynamic simulation. So from this spectra, we have chosen some representative energies, and then we have carried out molecular dynamic simulations with lamps uh, performing the collision cascade simulations. So the results of these simulations were interpreted in terms of defect size as a function of energy, defect morphology, defect recombination, and temperature transients. So temperature transients are, of course, very important for the superconducting properties. As an example, the critical uh, current depends on the temperature of the system. So this is very important to estimate like uh, these temperature transients. 
All right, so I'm a material physicist at heart, so I have to show at least one crystal structure. Uh, here is the uh, crystal structure of yttrium barium copper oxide, the system that we focused on. This is a ceramic material and it is uh, present in the commercial uh, tapes, HDS tapes. Uh, so why did we start with the, this particular? Because there was already uh, an available interatomic potential uh, developed for collision cascade simulations. So this was a Buckingham plus Coulomb potential fitted on DFT results and uh, with the ZBL uh, screen nuclear repulsion uh, included. So just to show how we do our MD simulations uh, and our, our workflow is the same as uh, the this paper, Gray and others, where they develop the, uh, pot the potential. So we use a very large cells, about one to 100 million atoms. We initially equilibrate the system in the MPT ensemble. And then uh, <clears throat> we separate the system in two parts. So a, a spherical inner part where we perform the actual collision cascade. And then uh, an outer part that is heavily thermostated to draw uh, energy out of the system and mimic uh, the dispersion of energy in a real system. So how the simulation is run. So we have here a little sketch. The white ball is the PKA. So we, la we launch the PKA according to the spectra that I showed, the PKA spectra I showed earlier. And then we track the number of defects with the Wigner sites analysis uh, with Ovito. So here in this uh, vi little video, uh, the, ball the color balls are the defects and uh, we don't see the ideal lattice atoms, let's say. Uh, regarding the initial conditions that we have chosen, so we have uh, focused initially only on two different types of uh, PKA, barium and oxygen. Uh, we have carried out simulations both at 20 Kelvin at 300 Kelvin. Uh, this is because 20 Kelvin is the, uh, uh, the operational temperature or like what people want to run this uh, the, the, the reactor at. But currently experiments with neutrons on these materials are done only at 300 K. So we want to be able to, to see if there are differences in the damage at 300 or at 20 K. So for uh, the barium PKA, we also investigated a few different uh, energies with different orders of magnitude. So here for free EV cascades, we don't see any defects. So we just don't look at it anymore. And then uh, we have, yes, 0.17 and 110 kilo electron volts for the barium and one kilo electron volt for the oxygen. All right, so results. Uh, what we see, first of all, here, okay, on the left, uh, you can see the average number of defects generated in the collision cascade as a function of time. Uh, so on for the different, for these three different orders of magnitude of um, PKA initial energy, we see that the number of defects generated is about one order of magnitude uh, larger. And uh, in the inset here, we you can see the, the uh, the typical uh, recombination uh, behavior of the defects, although this recombination is much lower than in uh, metals, for example. Uh, on the right, you can see instead the temperature as a function of time in the system. So we can see that, uh, like we, in this case, was the simulations run at 20 K, uh, Kelvin. Uh, we can see that there is an initial strong uh, uh, spike in energy of about like 10 uh, uh, Kelvin, for example, here. Um, and this then decreases along the during the simulation, but even after one hundred picoseconds, it has not got back to the initial twenty k. This is very important to take into account, as I was mentioning, for uh, the modeling of these of the superconducting properties uh, of these materials. Uh, so, if we look at uh, how the uh, uh, the number of defects uh, depends on the uh, on the initial kinetic energy of the PKA. We can see this uh, linear behavior. Of course, uh, it's difficult to say if it's really linear because we have not investigated this whole region. But uh, anyway, what we can uh, really say from this, uh, from this uh, graph is that there is a big difference in the number of defects generated at 20 or at 300 Kelvin. So with the number of defects at 20 Kelvin being much, low, much lower than at 300 Kelvin. On the right, you can see the morphology of the defects generated. So for the seven kilo electron volt uh, cascade, we have this branched uh, um, uh, branched uh, defect, a cluster of defects. And then for the 110 kilo electron volts, we can see already the appearance of sub cascades. And uh, yes, so this uh, 
what why is important this morphology because the, the effect that I was mentioning earlier, the vortex spinning depends also on the on the shape of these defects. We have not done much yet on that, but we are plan we are planning to do something in future. All right now, some ongoing work. So of course, the ions uh, displaced ions in these systems are going very fast. So they will interact in in reality. They will interact also with electrons. So it's important to include at least the electronic stopping power in these simulations. So far we had not, uh, now we are doing it. Uh, so we have calculated the electronic stopping power with RIM. Uh, you can see it here on a, an element uh, for each element in the system. And we include these uh, in the MD simulations as a friction term as it is implemented in LAMPS. Uh, so what we see is that obviously inclusion of electronic stopping power decreases the, the final number of defects as well as the number of defects at the peak. Uh, what's interesting to see is that the decrease in number of defects at the peak is larger than at the, the, the final number of defects. And also interesting is that for the oxygen uh, pKa uh, that you can see here, uh, the, the peak almost disappears. So like the number of defects generated is almost uh, uh, reaches a maximum and then stays there. This, uh, the, this reduction happens independently of the uh, the temperature or the pKa or the energy. Uh, so we have started also investigating different types of pKa, so all the four different elements in the system. So here I show results for uh, collision cascades at 7 kilo electron volts at both 20 and 300 Kelvin. And uh, as you can see in these plots, uh, uh, it, what happens is that uh, the, uh, the peak, the, the size of the peak depends on the mass of the pKa. So for the heaviest uh, uh, pKa, barium, uh, we have a higher peak and then also a higher recombination rate. Uh, for oxygen, we have a uh, lower value. What's interesting to see is that the final number of defects uh, seems to be independent of the cation that we use in the pKa, whereas if, you use, if we use oxygen, we get like a slowly, uh, slightly lower number of defects in, uh, uh, as a result. Uh, I mentioned the recombination rate. So if I define the recombination rate as one minus the final number of defects divided by the uh, number of defects at the peak, we see this uh, very clear trend in the recombination rate as a function of the mass of the pKa. So uh, one of the problems of, uh, of, our, of uh, these systems is that we cannot really calculate superconducting properties. Uh, so we cannot say what in experiments they usually do is to um, uh, measure the superconducting properties and define, okay, how much the system has got worse. Another thing that they do is to take TM uh, micrographs. Um, so we are trying now to uh, obtain uh, TM reconstructions from our collision cascades. So you can see here an example of uh, such a defect uh, here. Uh, we have used the abtem code to reconstruct the uh, uh, TM uh, image from uh, this system. So if we focus on, oops, sorry. If we focus on the damaged area, we can see this uh, disorder here, which could be interpreted as a, an amorphous area. And if we compare it to TM images, we can see here this region five, it's an amorphous region or was considered as an amorphous region. And we can see that the it seems quite similar to our results. So in conclusion, if I have time, uh, I've shown you our workflow for the computational investigation of the of radiation damage uh, for in HTS tapes for nuclear fusion, starting from the neutrons and going down to the damage. Then I've shown you the defect size morphologies, uh, recombination and the transient temperatures that we obtain from our simulations and some model refinement that of ongoing uh, work. Uh, including the electronic system in our simulations, looking more into details into the defects as a function of pKa and energy, and the TM reconstructions. And uh, with this, I thank you for all your, your attention, and I should acknowledge funding from the Swedish Research Council. Thank you so much. Okay, so thanks, Davide, for this very interesting talk. I have a question myself. If there are not here, I have several, I don't know if we have, we have a couple of minutes. 
I think it's nice that you remember people that you can use a cheap backing have potential and you can run 100 million atoms, you know, compared to the mainstream direction that is using super accurate machine learning and running 10,000, right? Mm. What is the computational time of running a collision cascade with 100 million atoms and what DPA you can achieve more or less, what range of DPA in your calculations? Uh, okay, so... For like the the 100 million atoms were long and were were using a lot of nodes, so I think I used the 32 nodes uh, times uh, um, 32 cores. So uh, do the multiplication for yourself, and that took uh, quite a bit. Like it was uh, uh, a few days uh, calculation. Um, so in terms of DPA, I cannot tell you. I, I didn't calculate them because I don't know. I find it a bit difficult to say like, okay, in our, like if I have a cell of 80 million atoms and I do a cascade with 110 keV, I get a certain DPA value. But if I increase the size of the cell and I do the same cascade, I will have a lower DPA. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I didn't calculate the DPA in itself. So I cannot tell you that, but uh, um, I could look into that if you're interested. Okay. Are you, are you there are other potentials. Have you tried the potentials? Like, no, this? there is nothing. Or, well, mm -hmm. no, actually, there are there were a couple of potentials a bit older, but they don't reproduce well the Frankel pair uh, defects energies. Mm -hmm. So this uh, this uh, potential was really developed for that, like by these uh, these researchers in Lancaster University, uh, Gray and uh, Samuel Murphy. Uh, so th th this potential for the simplicity is amazing in how good it is at um, reproducing these Frankel pairs, mm -hmm. although now it's been realized that it doesn't reproduce all of them, and that might be a problem. So I have to go against your previous comment and say that actually we might have to go for more accurate potentials with these systems. I mean, these are extremely complex systems. Four elements, it's very difficult to model them. Yeah, yeah, a lot of interactions, yeah. But yeah, I think it's good to see this and good to show that you can do like very, very large scale. And I think it makes sense, especially in these kind of defects. Absolutely, yes, that I agree. So yeah, I think it's time for a break. Lunch break if you are in Central Europe, probably. If not, just we have one hour, I think. So we getting we are getting back to the workshop at uh, two o'clock Central Europe time. So thanks for being here and see you later. And thanks to all speakers in this session. My name is Merve Mansen and I'm from Barcelona Supercomputing Center. In this session, we have two contributed talks, each allocated 15 minutes for the presentation and followed by five minutes of question and answers. Um, you can uh, ask questions by uh, raise your hand button or writing in the chat. And uh, let's start uh, by, with the first speaker, who is John Vinyals from Barcelona Supercomputing Center. John, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to share the screen now. Okay. And three minutes before your time is up, I will give you a small warning. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's not in full screen mode yet. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to put it now. Okay. Excellent. Then you are uh, ready. Okay, I'm going to start then. Uh, okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I am John Vinyals and I'm going to explain the path that we took uh, for optimizing the 2.0 uh, uh, Eurofusion HPC code. Um, so for context, this is a uh, work done at the Advanced Computing Hub at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, it's a work done into the in the context of the Eurofusion program, and it's it has been done in collaboration of the uh, with the Aero two uh, developers uh, from Zurich Supercomputing Center. So uh, for those who don't know, uh, Aero2, it's a Monte Carlo uh, 
code and which uses MPI and OpenMP. Uh, for those who want to know, this is the setup that we are using for the analysis and later for the optimizations too. And we have done all the work uh, inside the Mare Nostrum for supercomputer, uh, which has this um, architecture. And we have used uh, the required libraries provided also by the supercomputing environment. For the analysis, we are using uh, custom tools from BSC, which are called Xtrae and Paraver. Xtrae uh, does profiling of the application, um, getting trace information, and Paraver is a tool to visualize these traces. So for example, here are the kind of images that uh, Paraver provides. Uh, these are timelines, and we have uh, on the x-axis, uh, on the y-axis, we have objects like uh, threads, processes, or whatever we are visualizing here. In this case, we are visualizing uh, different threads, and on the x-axis, we have uh, time. And we have two kinds of these uh, images. We have those that are color co color coded, uh, which we will have uh, a reference uh, next to them, telling what color uh, what semantic has each color, and then we have um, color gradient. Uh, views, which um, a specific color tells us what value does uh, this event has. So for this case, uh, what we can see is that uh, for the arrow to code, we have an execution where we have a lot of MPI calls, which is this uh, trace on top. Um, where we see a lot of communication on the thread zero of uh, process zero, uh, and then all the communication uh, scattered randomly among all the other threads. And we can also see that we don't have like a, a pattern in useful duration. So this tells us how long were we computing before each MPI communication or each uh, open MP barrier or something like that. So here we have the pattern that we observe. Uh, so for example, for an iterative uh, execution, uh, we would see like a pattern of repetitive uh, similar useful duration. In this case, we have a random scatter of different useful durations. Then we can also see the scalability. We have scaled the application uh, with this uh, same profiling tool. Uh, so we can see how different regions of the code um, scale. So here we have the computation region and the gathering region. We can see that the gathering region stays always the same size, so it doesn't scale, basically. And we can see for the computation region that it does scale, but we can see an increasing lot imbalance that at the beginning is very few, but as we get more nodes, we have more. So then we identified uh, arrow two as an a master slave uh, uh, parallelization schema, and we can also see that with these other types of view that Paraver gives us, which are heat maps. This tells us which processes are communicating to what other processes. So we can see that the master process is communicating to everyone, and that everyone is only communicating with the master process. And if we take a closer look to that, we can see an actual transaction of this happening. We can see that a worker sends a petition. Now we are only seeing uh, two processes, the master one and a worker. And we can see that the worker sends the petition and then the master sends the work to do. And then if we look, take a look at the same uh, zoom of these processes, we can observe also that we have some gaps of useful computation. We can both see that the master process, uh, all the threads of it don't do any computation, and that for the worker, we have some gaps where we are losing uh, useful time for CPUs. Then we went ahead and take a look at the code to understand what we just saw uh, with uh, the traces, to understand the scheme of the application. 
And what we saw is uh, exactly what we expected. We saw an application that uh, on one part, it had the master part where it wait for a request for the, for the worker. When it received the request, they sent the chunk of uh, work. And if there are any particles left to be confirmed, uh, they repeat again, wait for another work petition. On the other hand, if you're a worker, you simply ask for particles. When you receive the particles, if there are none, it means that the master doesn't have any more particles to share, so we are done. Otherwise, we open an OpenMP parallel loop, compute all the particles, and do it again. And for the part of the computation, it's also very simple. It simulates a step. If the step is done, we break. Or if we reach a limit of simulated time, we also break. Otherwise, we do the next step. Now that we have a clear uh, understanding of how the code, the code works, uh, we uh, went ahead and see where the code was uh, lacking or where the bottlenecks were in the code. So to do that, we used uh, performance metrics that we can compute from traces. These come from the pop COE. And in this case, I'm going to explain the ones that we are interested in, which are the load balance and the communication efficiency. Um, basically, the load balance tells you how well the application uh, distributes the work among all the resources that it has. And the communication efficiency, it tells you how well the communications are performed. So for example, if you have a lot of serialization among communications, you would see that here. This part of the communication that we see, we can probably attribute to the part of the gathering phase that we saw at the end, uh, which was basically a serial, um, a serial part. And the load balance, we can attribute to the different parts that we saw uh, these gaps among the different, the different chunks of work that were shared. So if we take a look at this uh, load balance issue, we can see these two kinds of load balance, an open MP load balance and an MPI load balance. We can see, for example, here, uh, two processes uh, with different uh, load each other. And we can see that, for example, this one that it's taking much longer to finish uh, ha makes the other one wait in the gathering phase. And we can also see for the OpenMP, these gaps, these parts that we see in blue here are OpenMP barriers, which means that the application was waiting uh, for the OpenMP uh, parallel to finish um, in order to ask for the next chunk of work. If we take a look at what kind of load balance do we have, we can see that it's a load balance that comes from instructions, which means that we are executing more code. So this probably means that we are doing more steps uh, of, of this uh, simulation. Uh, and we can attribute all of that to the instructions. We can see that there is no correlation between uh, frequency of the CPU and useful IPC uh, of, of this execution. So we saw a problem in load balance and we had a parameter in the input set that changed the, the chunk size of the chunks that we were sending. And we said, okay, so if we have a load balance issue, we can reduce this uh, chunk size to see if we get better performance. And what we observe is that when we change that, we basically are trading off a uh, load balance from MPI into OpenMP. And we said, okay, so maybe we can improve the OpenMP uh, load balance, but the program was already using the lowest granularity in the, in the OpenMP4, which was a dynamic one. So we went uh, that's the analysis that we did. Um, basically, we observed load balance issues in both MPI and OpenMP due to variability in the in the particle uh, computation time. So now we went ahead and wanted to 
prove that we could improve um, uh, these uh, executions uh, by changing the way we share the work. <laughs> so the first thing we did was uh, the guided uh, schema where we changed the chunk size to improve the probability of getting big particles at the beginning of the execution so that uh, we start them overhead. It's basically when you start filling a jar with sand first and then you put the big uh, chunks of work, then it's not going to fit. But if you do it the other way around, it's going to fit better. So basically we changed this part of the code where we are sending uh, a chunk. Now this is a variable size. Um, minutes, John. Okay, thank you. Uh, so when we did that, we went ahead and we uh, take another trace to compare with the other one. We saw a little bit of improvement, but we also saw these uh, particles that were extending and were getting far longer of the execution and delaying the, the execution time. So we decided that what we wanted to do is create an average time of how much time a particle is going to take to predict on average when the execution should end. We send that to the master and the master will kill the particle if it goes beyond this part. Here we can see at play these three versions of the code. We have the original code where we, at the end of the execution, steadily decrease the number of uh, threads that are working. With the guided one, we see a rough edge. So all the processes are stopping basically at the same time, except for these other ones. By the way, this is a parallel, so the par level of parallelism of the execution at this point. And then with the dynamic, uh, tracing time, we chop this part and we go, we finish the execution much earlier. With this uh, proofs of concept, we get uh, some speed up uh, depending on how many nodes you are using and different things uh, from the input. But on most cases, we get at least a 30% uh, increase. We also checked how many particles we were killing because if we kill all the particles, of course, we're going to go faster, but that's not what we want to do. So we only increased from roughly 1%, uh, 0, 1 to 0.1% to 0.2%. The other optimization that we did was at the OpenMP level. So we had this issue that each time that we finish a chunk of work, we uh, we have to finish the, ch the whole chunk of work to get new um, particles to compute. So what we did was to change the whole uh, parallelism schema. So now all the OpenMP threads are doing their own communication and they are getting their own job. And only the master thread, uh, the master thread of the master rank is doing the sharing of work. Here we have an example of this execution, this optimization at play. So we see here, for example, two processes, the master and the worker, and we can see that we had this lot imbalance throughout the execution. And with the optimization, we pack all together and we can even use the threads from the master. So basically, uh, this is the job that we did. Um, so we analyzed the application. We saw that we had a load balance issue uh, and we implemented the different techniques that we knew uh, that we could apply to improve the application. And that by working with the uh, developers and we successfully did an interdisciplinary job, uh, work. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Well, very interesting and very successful optimization that you have had on this error tool code. Now it's time for questions. Um, do, do we have anything on chat? Let's see. Uh, not yet. So while you think <laughs> some questions, let me ask you something. Um, 
it looked that uh, these tools that you are using, Paraware and Extra, are very useful for this type of work. So can you tell us a little bit more about this? Where do they come from and how easy they are you, uh, to get uh, to use them, etc.? Yes, so uh, these tools come from a department at BSC, which is the tools department. Uh, they have implemented uh, Extrai and Paraver and some other tools that work with the same ecosystem. Um, basically, Extrai is a tool that gathers uh, information, so intercepts different uh, API calls from different programming models, for example, intercepts MPI calls and registers uh, when each MPI call is happening. It also intercepts OpenMP uh, calls and then uses that to report a big, uh, a big uh, trace of the whole thing that happened, uh, time, like, like timestamps of what happened at what time. And then we have Paraver to visualize it. Um, so for the, ba for the basic stuff, it's relatively simple to use. You just preload the library and, and you get this trace and then you open it with Paraver and you can see the very basic things. You have some pre-made configurations where you can see the MPI calls and the useful durations like we saw. And if you have problems, I think you can contact uh, tools at bsc.s, uh, which they most certainly will help you. So it's completely open access and can be used in any platforms. Yes, yes. Sounds good. Um, it looks that your talk was very clear. <laughs> no, no questions. Uh, what are your next steps? Are you still working on this error too, or you consider now it's finished with these good results? So uh, we we have done this uh, whole analysis and the optimizations, and we tested with uh, the cases that I showed at the beginning, the JET case. Mm -hmm. And we are now testing with uh, a demo case. Mm. And we saw some problems with the uh, optimizations, we saw some instabilities and doing some strange, uh, strange things. So we are debugging it and mm -hmm. uh, trying to make it work. Do you know where those uh, problems might arise? Is it the size of the problem or? No, no, I think it's in the distribution. Uh, I think it has a different distribution of uh, particle durations. So I think I we have faster particles at the beginning of the execution and longer ones at the end. And it's okay. messing with this thing where we start killing particles. Okay. So we have to make something more robust. So we don't start killing uh, a lot okay. of particles. Okay. So the story continues. Very nice work, John. Thank you so yeah. much. Let's Thank let's you. move now to the next speaker. Um, it is uh, Lorenzo Sabino from University Hi. of Rome in Italy. Yeah. Are you there, Lorenzo? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, I will now present the screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, full screen. Can you see the full screen? No, yes. So yes. So you're ready, go ahead. Yeah. Hello everyone, I'm Lorenzo Savino, a PhD student from Rome La Sapienza in Rome, and today I will present my work about a GPU-based ray tracing algorithm for the 2D code. Well, I will try to be uh, as, um, uh, as clean as possible, sorry, but it's not working PowerPoint, sorry. So I will introduce, uh, I have a, a little introduction, then I will discuss the retracing code, the feature, the details, then the performance, and, and finally the conclusions. Well, now um, 
we are in the framework of uh, inertial confining fusion, uh, as uh, Paul Gibbon in the first day um, presented uh, um, very good review. So just to remember, inertial confining fusion means that we have spherical targets made of deuterium attrition, which are imploded using uh, laser beams. So there are four main stages, the irradiation, then the implosion by uh, driven by the ablation here, and then we end up with a, a very small spot in which the ignition can occur. And then after ignition, we have a burn wave, and then we have the production from the uh, from from fusion. Here uh, we can see uh, a plot of the radius versus time. We start with the um, radius, the initial radius of our targets, and then we can see that here we have the implosion. Then here we have the hotspot formation. And then here we have the vertical line means that there is a burn wave, so fusion. A great number of problems could degrade the performance of the ignition in inertial covalent fusion. The first one is non-uniform irradiation from the lasers because la uh, laser must be very symmetric so to, to have a, a good implosion. Then a large hot spot area, because if we have a um, lit, um, little hot spot, uh, the performance is uh, uh, better. And then also at the uh, final stage, uh, we can have irregular conversion of kinetic energy into interlearn energy. So we can end up uh, usually with the Rayleigh Taylor instabilities, which are like the enemy of inertial confinement fusion. The 2 d code, it's a 2D Lagrangian code uh, plus red zoning. So it's a, a standard code. Uh, it was made by a Professor Azzeni in 1986, and um, until now it's uh, on development. It is a two temporal fluid models and uh, has a real matter equation of state. Now we can move to the ray tracing code. Uh, the laser light can only penetrate the plasma as long as the electron density is smaller than the critical density. And the critical density is, is, is given by the, uh, these formulas. So it depends on the uh, laser wavelength. Um, we can use optical geometry to describe the ray equation, and we end up with this classical equation. This cl um, classical equation, if we want to discretize on a mesh, uh, we end up with a, a parabolic trajectory, uh, characteristic of a constant force field. So we have a parabola. The main program, uh, so the 2D codes, has a start physics module which prepares all the quantities on the mesh and starts the physics of the problem. Then we can move um, in details to the 3D ray tracing modules. First of all, we need to compute the critical density on the 2D main mesh or the hydro mesh. Then we can generate uh, uh, the shot points of the laser based on the, the geometry. And here now we are in a 3D uh, ray tracing grid. And then we can discretize each beam in thousand beamlets. After that, we can generate the intensities for each beamlet. And then we can uh, start the trace. We check initially if the rays enter the mesh, and then uh, we start the tracing. Each beamlet has his own, um, his own life. It's not uh, uh, related to another beamlet in the code. After the trace, we can activate diagnostics, and then we can remap the 3D absorbed power to, uh, to, the, to the 2D main mesh. The code structure uh, is, uh, uh, is serial in general. 2D is, is a serial code, but because we have a number, a um, big number of beamlets to trace, we need parallelization. We uh, have an um, old version, uh, which was preliminary, made in 2010, which is um, programmed in Fortran and then in uh, with MPI. So the parallelization was MPI but we need to rely on a cluster because we need um, 100 slash 1000 cores. So in 2023, we decided to rewrite all the retracing codes and add more 
um, uh, more uh, features. And now we are using GPUs. Uh, in, and uh, the Fortran code, uh, so the 2D code uh, is for the hydro and all the other physics. Uh, then there is a C++ wrapper to connect Fortran and uh, uh, OpenCL. And the OpenCL, um, it's uh, um, the part, the program, the part for the GPUs. Uh, first of all, each beam has a, a special intensity distribution uh, as a super Gaussian. Then we can we need a, a sampling of the beam. We have two options. The first is the static, and the second is dynamic. The static sampling is that each beam uh, is subdivided in a large number of beamlets organized in sectors, and the number of beamlets is determined by the number of sectors. Phi and theta are the azimuth angle and the zenith angle. So we can have, for example, uniform sampling along the radius uh, R, or, for example, using the CDF along the uh, R uh, axis. In this case, we use one ray per sector. So the number of beamlets is N phi for N theta. We have also uh, beam dynamic sampling because during compression and expansion of the target, uh, also the critical density, uh, which the, the laser is absorbed, uh, compress and absorb. So we need more uh, statistics uh, near the critical density and less in the other part. So we have a solution. We can increase the number of beamlets in each sector and with a proper function, this depends on the problem. In, in, for example, in this case, uh, the beam cross-section project, projected on the, um, on, the, on, on the sphere, on the target, we have a central part with lots of beamlets and the other part with less beamlets because we need more beamlets to uh, have a good statistics on the, uh, on, on the central part. We can have also full beam pointing. For example, we can use uh, uh, Omega Laser, uh, which is uh, uh, Omega Laser configuration. And Omega Laser is uh, one of the most powerful laser for direct drive uh, experiments in the world. And uh, it's located in the USA and has 60 beams. Here, there is a sketch of the Omega Laser and we see all the beam ports and the beam lines going in the target chambers. Um, we have here the sphere, which is the uh, um, simulated uh, omega chamber, and all the spots that you are seeing here are the beam ports uh, and also the beams entering uh, the uh, the chamber, so the uh, the replicated chamber. We have some advantages. The, the first one is we can have full geometries. We can apply power imbalances. For example, this one could carry um, minus 20% of the laser uh, of this one, and et cetera. Also, we can move these points in uh, in direction that we, we want, because in, in uh, experiments could have uh, like some problems of beam pointing. But we have some disadvantages. The, the first one is we have a complex input, because we need the input is given by the number of the uh, laser involved, in this case, 60. And also we have a big amount of, of beamlet traced because I remember the beamlet numbers are related to the number of sectors. But we can get rid of these problems packing multiple beams. In fact, if uh, um, what take place along the direction of the azimuth uh, of the ray tracing grid, which is the purple one, is hidden to the hydro mesh sorry, uh, the uh, ray tracing grid is the this, um, the, the sphere, so the, the gray one, and the other mesh is the, the um, purple one. So what is happening uh, during uh, in the azimuth, we cannot uh, see in, inside a, a 2D mesh. So we could think or reduce beams with the same zenith, so uh, beams on the same uh, uh, circles here, in on uh, a single beam on the uh, main meridian, which is the uh, ma main meridian which uh, lay the 2D mesh. For example, here, now we can uh, have new, um, uh, new beams, we, we call cones, and the total energy is preserved. Uh, what I mean, for example, here on this, we have one, two, three, four, five, five uh, beams entering. Uh, 
um, times two because this is a half sphere. So we have 10, 10, um, 10 beams carrying uh, the uh, average um, intensity. So this one carry 10 of the energy. So it's like a reduction. We pack 10 in one on the main mesh. The advantages is that, that we have an easy input data, but also we have a good statistic because we trace a less number of beamlets, but we cannot apply, uh, can, we cannot apply power imbalances in this case. All the simulations that I will show now are, um, are made from some simulation of an experiment made uh, at Omega Laser in Rochester. So if we want to check, there is this uh, uh, beautiful paper written in June. In, uh, we, in, from, we start from the illumination pattern. Here we have the zenith angle and the azimuth uh, um, angle. And we see that it's not uniform uh, because the, the laser has uh, a spatial distribution. And this is the reference illumination pattern. And this is the uh, sigma or the variation in each uh, respect to the mean of each cell uh, that we are uh, simulating. Here we have the simulation, the simulated uh, illumination pattern, and you see that it's noisy because it's uh, uh, it's simulated. But all the beams uh, and all the, the structure of the reference illumination pattern is reproduced. If we go to the 2D illumination non-uniformity, all the total sigma, uh, which is the the mean of depth. We can see that if we move uh, from 60 beams, uh, so we expect 0.5%, if we use a full description, we are here in uh, near 0.25%. 0, 0 but if we move to eight cones, uh, and uh, also we go higher uh, with uh, uh, the number of uh, sectors and also adding CFD sampling and also oversampling, we uh, will reach the same uh, expected to, uh, to the illumination uh, non-uniformity. You have three minutes, Lorenzo. Yes, thanks. Um, here we have uh, an image for a, a, um, a, ray um, pro a projection of the rays uh, onto the 2D main mesh. This is the hydro mesh boundaries. And we see that uh, all the beams are not symmetric because it depends on the, uh, on the beams and uh, his uh, orientation. Or here only uh, 100 rays uh, plotted. Here there is a comparison between 2D hydro and 3D ray tracing. Uh, so uh, the the past plot, and then here an, an ideal case with the one the hydro. So the, here it's replicated the hydrodynamic, and we see the two D ray tracing, which is ideal because we we see uh, perfect replicated uh, um, parabolas. Also, we can see absorbed power which is between 3D ray tracing and 2D ray tracing. And we see that there are some differences in the absorbed power because the 2D ray tracing is ideal and 3D ray tracing is taking account um, the, uh, the real effects. So the absorption is slightly less. Code performances. Um, for our case, we use a workstation with AMD Threadripper with the Zen 3 architecture and uh, a GPU, which is uh, it's a Radeon 7, and then a server with the two uh, Intel Xeon Cascade Lake architecture. We see that uh, uh, for CPUs, we, have, uh, we need uh, a cluster with more 100 CPU cores. For example, here we see two Intel Xeon um, speed up and here AMD um, Zen 3 uh, CPUs and then here we see that it's uh, slightly above the ideal case because these CPUs has a larger cache so we expect that uh, with uh, another CPU with the same architecture the, the performance goes like that so it's not suitable for daily simulation because the speed up is too low if we move to GPUs we have uh, with one Radeon GPUs we have uh, uh, two time, we are 200 times faster than the serial simulation. So if we use a, a common GPU or a more powerful GPU, uh, we can reach more, uh, in, uh, more, uh, more speed up. Also, we can uh, produce 
daily simulation because uh, uh, we have the right speed up for our simulation. And also because we are using OpenCL, we can use NVIDIA, AMD or Intel GPUs. Just to, to, to conclude, uh, the code has, uh, we can have a performance sketch. We have the code in the serial region and then in the parallel region. The hydrodynamic is always serial. Then if we made one dihydro with 2D ray tracing, we have a computational time of minutes or hours. So we like a lot this. If we move to 2D hydro and 1D or 2D ray tracing, we have hours or days of computation, and this is good. If we move to 3D ray tracing, if we use only one CPU, so on um, the serial code, we uh, have a computational time of several days. So this is not good. If we use lots of CPUs, we have several days, so it's good. But if we move to GPUs or with only one GPUs, we recover the hours or days computational time uh, of the uh, 1D or 2D ray tracing. Just to conclude, three key points. We can uh, perform faster simulation with 3D ray tracing. We can uh, also apply power imbalances and mispositioning. And also we have 2D, uh, more realistic 2D hydrodynamic simulation. The work in progress is that we want to use more GPUs to, tra to trace the full uh, pointing with uh, a good time. And also we are uh, simulating some experiments in Omega, uh, which laser imprints leads to strong instability. Here an image, and you see that here there are uh, red detail instability in the core. And this due to the non-uniformity um, irradiation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Um, we have already some questions in the chat. The first one is a um, question, uh, question about the implementation. It says, yes. I understand that the beamlets are distributed among GPUs. I would like to know if each GPU has a copy of the 3D spherical print or if this is distributed among the GPUs. So uh, the um, the spherical grid, uh, we have a GPU. The GPU has uh, all the data and uh, each uh, core units of the GPU trace uh, the beamlets. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, the next uh, comment and question is here. Thanks for the talk. Are you looking into using the ray tracing hardware cores that are available on modern GPUs? Well, it, uh, this is a good uh, uh, question. In, in, it's, uh, in practical, if we, uh, the problem is that the, uh, the code is written in Fortran 77. So we move to OpenCL just to have a wide range and also for the future, if you want to rewrite the code, for example, in C++, then we can also uh, think about of using hardware um, speed up. So also ray tracing uh, uh, course. Okay. Um, I have a question myself. Yes. The, uh, yeah, can you, can you, it's more like a physics question about the coupling of this ray tracing to your main code, this duet. Can you, can you describe it a little bit? What, what, how do you do this coupling? What are the coupled parameters? Ah, he, here you mean? Yeah, well, exactly. Um, the, well, uh, we can go here. For example, we need uh, the 2D main mesh. Mm -hmm. So all the, the, the position of the, the, the nodes. Then we need the critical density mm -hmm. computed on 2D main mesh. And then this, the, those are the the only um, quantities that we need to uh, port to the GPUs for the calculation. So from the main module of the code, the, um, the, so the position of the 2D main mesh, the 3D position of the, of the, so the 3D grid, and also the critical density is ported to the GPU, so it's copied, and then all the calculation and send back to, mm -hmm the uh, main program, uh, only the metrics of the absorption on the 2D mesh. Fantastic, thank you so, so much. It's a 2D, uh, 2D in one way, and it returns a 2D. So the 3D okay. part, it's only on the GPUs, on the calculation. Okay. 
that uh, clarifies the issue for me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, I think this session is closed now. I, I thank all the speakers and uh, participants and we have a small break now in the program and we all join the main room at 15.30 for the last session and closing. Thank you so much. And uh, we come to the, to the closing session. We are closing this event. Let me let me share the screen. And you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you. So we come to the closing session of this uh, Fusion High Performance Computing Workshop. Thank you all that uh, have been tuned until the end. And thank you all again for your lively participation in the workshop. We have seen many inform informative talks and very interesting questions and answers. I was glad to see many interesting questions in all the talks I have seen present. Now it's time to, to vote for the favorite talk. We will have two minutes for the voting that we will do using the full functionality implemented in Zoom. So in a second, you will see in your screen a new window that allows you to choose the among the, the invited and contributed talks, the one that you like most. Only one talk would be would be selected. Okay. Let me start the pool. Can you see the new window? Yes. Okay. So now we have two minutes. So now the pool is closed. In a while, you will see the, the results from your screen. I think we have a big time. You see the results? 
I think we have a lot of uh, similar results. So it's difficult. We have to, to say that there are very many good talks in this event. I think largest score are 9%. So we have we have Paul Gibbon, we have Taina Kurti and uh, Anti Sneaker, we have Federico Chipoleta, we have Fernando Roca, Edmen Coleman. So we have a lot of similar results. And I see. Gambino also. So, and uh, Vinyal, Gran Vinyal. I think these are all the the winners, let's say. We have a big time, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your participation. It's time to continue. And uh, Now we have um, the the early career uh, presenters are being evaluated and the results are being compiled. So we will know the top three outstanding presentations early next week, and we will announce the winners on the website in hpcfusion.bsc.es. The winners will be also contacted by email, and we have many, we have had many interesting and high quality presentations from early career participants. Some of them are in, in the selected as the best talks. And uh, we hope that the feedbacks that we will provide by the reviewers uh, are of help for the, the professional development of early career scientists. The prices and are, as we announced at the beginning of the event, uh, the popular fiction novel Origin from Dan Brown, and uh, that takes place in, in Barcelona in part and, and features the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in the story and a pair of uh, earbuds. We are happy to announce the, the, pro, the composition of the new program committee for the next edition of the Fusion High HPC workshop. You can see them here. We welcome this year to Maria Jose Caturlat as a new member of the PC. And we want to thank Julio Gutierrez for his participation on the program committee this year from the beginning of the event. It was a pleasure to count on this, his uh, collaboration. The recordings will soon be available on the workshop website and the BSC YouTube channel, and the link uh, will be mailed to, to the participants. We will also provi will provide copies of the presentations uh, on the workshop website. And regarding the paper submission to the special issue in the Plasma Physics and Control Fusion Journal, the program committee will contact the speakers who showed interest in submitting a paper. The deadline for submissions is the 30 April 2024. Next, we want to ask you for collaboration. Please help us improve by taking part in a two minute post event survey. You can find the link in the chat and we will also send it by email after the event. You can also get the link from the QR code in the, in the screen. And thanks in advance for, for your feedback. Now it's time to say goodbye. We hope that you enjoyed the workshop and find it productive and informative. And we thank all the collaborators for supporting this conference and all the speakers for sharing the, their work and, and their progress. Finally, we want to thank all of you on behalf of the program committee and the local organizers for, for participating in this, this workshop. We hope 
to see you next time. Thank you. The event is closed.